Chapter 41 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 41 The Byzantine and Sassanid Empires. The Greek speaking eastern half of the Roman Empire showed much more political tenacity than the western half. It weathered the disasters of the 5th century AD, which saw a complete and final breaking up of the original Latin Roman power. Attila bullied the Emperor Theodosius II, and sacked and raided almost to the walls of Constantinople, but that city remained intact. The Nubians came down the Nile and looted Upper Egypt, but Lower Egypt and Alexandria were left still fairly prosperous. Most of Asia Minor was held against the Sassanid Persians. The 6th century, which was an age of complete darkness for the West, saw indeed a considerable revival of the Greek power. Justinian I, 527-565, to 565, was a ruler of very great ambition and energy, and he was married to the Empress Theodora, a woman of quite equal capacity, who had begun life as an actress. Justinian reconquered North Africa from the Vandals and most of Italy from the Goths. He even regained the south of Spain, he did not limit his energies to naval and military enterprises. He founded a university, built the great church of St. Sophia in Constantinople, and codified the Roman law. But in order to destroy a rival to his university foundation, he closed the schools of philosophy in Athens, which had been going on in unbroken continuity from the days of Plato, that is to say, for nearly a thousand years. From the 3rd century onwards, the Persian Empire had been the steadfast rival of the Byzantine. The two empires kept Asia Minor, Syria and Egypt, in a state of perpetual unrest and waste. In the 1st century AD, these lands were still at a high level of civilization, wealthy and with an, an abundant population, but the continual coming and going of armies, massacres, looting and war taxation, wore them down steadily until only shattered and ruinous cities remained upon a countryside of scattered peasants. In this melancholy process of impoverishment and disorder, Lower Egypt fared perhaps less badly than the rest of the world. Alexandria, like Constantinople, continued a dwindling trade between the East and the West. Science and political philosophy seemed dead, now in both these warring and decaying empires. The last philosophers of Athens, until their suppression, preserved the texts of the great literature of the past with an infinite reverence and want of understanding. But there remained no class of men in the world, no free gentlemen with bold and independent habits of thought, to carry on the tradition of frank statement and inquiry embodied in these writings. The social and political chaos accounts largely for the disappearance of this class, but there was also another reason why the human intelligence was sterile and feverish during this age. In both Persia and Byzantium it was all age of intolerance. Both empires were religious empires in a new way, in a way that greatly hampered the free activities of the human mind. Of course, the oldest empires in the world were religious empires, centering upon the worship of a god or of a god-king. Alexander was treated as a divinity, and the Caesars were gods, in so much, as they had altars and temples devoted to them, and the offering of incense was made a test of loyalty to the Roman state. But these older religions were essentially religions of act and fact. They did not invade the mind. If a man offered his sacrifice and bowed to the god, he was left not only to think, but to say practically whatever he liked about the affair. But the new sort of religions that had come into the world, and particularly Christianity, turned inward. These new faiths demanded not simply conformity, but understanding belief. Naturally fierce controversy ensued upon the exact meaning of the things believed. These new religions were creed religions. The world was confronted with a new word, 
orthodoxy, and with a stern resolve to keep not only acts, but speech and private thought within the limits of a set teaching. For to hold a wrong opinion, much more to convey it to other people, was no longer regarded as an intellectual defect, but a moral fault that might condemn a soul to everlasting destruction. Both Ardashir I, who founded the Sassanid dynasty in the 3rd century AD, and Constantine the Great, who reconstructed the Roman Empire in the 4th, turned to religious organizations for help, because in these organizations they saw a new means of using and controlling the wills of men. And already before the end of the 4th century, both empires were persecuting free talk and religious innovation. In Persia, Ardashir found the ancient Persian religion of Zoroaster, or Zarathustra, with its priests and temples and a sacred fire that burnt upon its altars, ready for his purpose as a state religion. Before the end of the third century, Zoroastrianism was persecuting Christianity, and in 277 AD, Mani, the founder of a new faith, the Manichaeans, was crucified and his body flayed. Constantinople, on its side, was busy hunting out Christian heresies. Manichaean ideas infected Christianity and had to be fought with the fiercest methods. In return, ideas from Christianity affected the purity of the Zoroastrian doctrine. All ideas became suspect. Science, which demands before all things the free action of an untroubled mind, suffered a complete eclipse throughout this phase of intolerance. War, the bitterest theology, and the usual vices of mankind constituted Byzantine life of those days. It was picturesque, it was romantic, it had little sweetness or light. When Byzantium and Persia were not fighting the barbarians from the north, they wasted Asia Minor and Syria in dreary and destructive hostilities. Even in close alliance, these two empires would have found it a hard task to turn back the barbarians and recover their prosperity. The Turks, or Tartars, first come into history as the allies first of one power and then on of another. In the 6th century, the two chief antagonists were Justinian and Cosrys I. In the opening of the 7th, the emperor Heraclius was pitted against Cosrys II, 580. At first and until after Heraclius had become emperor, 610, Cosrys II carried all before him. He took Antioch, Damascus, and Jerusalem, and his armies reached Chalcedon, which is in Asia Minor, over against Constantinople. In 619 he conquered Egypt. Then Heraclius pressed the counterattack home, and routed a Persian army at Nineveh, 627, although at that time there were still Persian troops at Chalcedon. In 628, Khosrys II was deposed and murdered by his son, Kabach, and an inconclusive peace was made between the two exhausted empires. Byzantium and Persia had fought their last war, but few peoples as yet dreamt of the storm that was even then gathering in the deserts, to put an end forever to this aimless, chronic struggle. While Heraclius was restoring order in Syria, a message reached him. It had been brought in to the imperial outpost at Bostra, south of Damascus. It was in Arabic, an obscure Semitic desert language, and it was read to the emperor, if it reached him at all, by an interpreter. It was from someone who called himself Muhammad, the prophet of God, it called upon the emperor to acknowledge the one true God and to serve him. What the emperor said is not recorded. A similar message came to Kavat at Tsetsiphon. He was annoyed, tore up the letter, and bade the messenger be gone. This Muhammad, it appeared, was a Bedouin leader whose headquarters were in the mean little desert town of Medina. He was preaching a new religion of faith, in the one true God. Even so, O Lord, he said, rend thou his kingdom from Kavad. End of chapter 41
Chapter 42 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 42 The Dynasties of Sui and Tang in China. Throughout the 5th, 6th, and 7th and 8th centuries, there was a steady drift of Mongolian peoples westward. The Huns of Attila were merely precursors of this advance, which led at last to the establishment of Mongolian peoples in Finland, Estonia, Hungary, and Bulgaria, where their descendants, speaking languages akin to Turkish, survive to this day. The Mongolian nomads were, in fact, playing a role towards the Aryanized civilizations of Europe and Persia and India that the Aryans had played to the Aegean and Semitic civilizations ten or fifteen centuries before. In Central Asia, the Turkish peoples had taken root in what is now western Turkestan, and Persia already employed many Turkish officials and Turkish mercenaries. The Parthians had gone out of history, absorbed into the general population of Persia. There were no more Aryan nomads in the history of Central Asia. Mongolian people had replaced them. The Turks became masters of Asia from China to the Caspian. The same great pestilence at the end of the 2nd century A.D. that had shattered the Roman Empire had overthrown the Han dynasty in China. Then came a period of division and of Hunnish conquests, from which China arose refreshed, more rapidly and more completely than Europe was destined to do. Before the end of the 6th century, China was reunited under the Soi dynasty, and this, by the time of Heraclius, gave place to the Tang dynasty, whose reign marks another great period of prosperity for China. Throughout the 7th, 8th, and ninth centuries, China was the most secure and civilized country in the world. The Han dynasty had extended her boundaries in the north. The Sui and Tang dynasties now spread her civilization to the south, and China began to assume the proportions she has today. In Central Asia, indeed, she reached much further, extending at last, through tributary Turkish tribes, to Persia and the Caspian Sea. The new China that had arisen was a very different land from the old China of the Hans. A new and more vigorous literary school appeared. There was a great poetic revival. Buddhism had revolutionized philosophical and religious thought. There were great advances in artistic work in technical skill, and in all the amenities of life. Tea was first used, paper manufactured, and woodblock printing began. Millions of people indeed were leading orderly, graceful, and kindly lives in China during these centuries, when the attenuated populations of Europe and Western Asia were living either in hovels, small walled cities, or grim robber fortresses. While the mind of the West was black, with theological obsessions, the mind of China was open and tolerant and inquiring. One of the earliest monarchs of the Tang dynasty was Tai Tsung, who began to reign in 627, the year of the victory of Heraclius at Nineveh. He received an embassy from Heraclius, who was probably seeking an ally in the rear of Persia. From Persia itself came a party of Christian missionaries, 635. They were allowed to explain their creed to Tai Tsung, and he examined a Chinese translation of their scriptures. He pronounced this strange religion acceptable, and gave permission to the foundation of a church and monastery. To this monarch also, in 628, came messengers from Muhammad. They came to Canton on a trading ship. They had sailed the whole way from Arabia along the Indian coasts. Unlike Heraclius and Kavad, Tai Tsung gave these envoys a courteous hearing. He expressed his interest in their theological ideas and assisted them to build a mosque in Canton, a mosque which survives, it is said to this day, the oldest mosque in the world. End of chapter 42「Muhammad and Islam 
a prophetic amateur of history surveying the world in the opening of the seventh century might have concluded very reasonably that it was only a question of a few centuries before the whole of Europe and Asia fell under Mongolian domination. There were no signs of order or union in Western Europe, and the Byzantine and Persian empires were manifestly bent upon a mutual destruction. India was also divided and wasted. On the other hand, China was a steadily expanding empire, which probably at that time exceeded all Europe in population. And the Turkish people, who were growing to power in Central Asia, were disposed to work in accord with China. And such a prophecy would not have been an altogether vain one. A time was to come, in the 13th century, when a Mongolian overlord would rule from the Danube to the Pacific, and Turkish dynasties were destined to reign over the entire Byzantine and Persian empires, over Egypt and most of India, where our prophet would have been most likely to have erred, would have been in underestimating the recuperative power of the Latin end of Europe, and in ignoring the latent forces of the Arabian desert. Arabia would have seemed what it had been for times immemorial, the refuge of small and bickering nomadic tribes. No Semitic people had founded an empire now for more than a thousand years. Then suddenly the Bedouin flared out for a brief century of splendor. They spread their rule and language from Spain to the boundaries of China. They gave the world a new culture. They created a religion that is still to this day one of the most vital forces in the world. The man who fired this Arab flame appears first in history as the young husband of the widow of a rich merchant of the town of Mecca, named Muhammad. Until he was forty, he did very little to distinguish himself in the world. He seems to have taken considerable interest in religious discussion. Mecca was a pagan city at that time, worshipping in particular a black stone, the Kaaba, of great repute throughout all Arabia, and a center of pilgrimages. But there were great numbers of Jews in the country. Indeed, all the southern portion of Arabia professed the Jewish faith, and there were Christian churches in Syria. About forty, Muhammad began to develop prophetic characteristics like those of the Hebrew prophets twelve hundred years before him. He talked first to his wife of the one true God, and of the rewards and punishments of virtue and wickedness. There can be no doubt that his thoughts were very strongly influenced by Jewish and Christian ideas. He gathered about him a small circle of believers, and presently began to preach, in the town, against the prevalent idolatry. This made him extremely unpopular with his fellow townsmen, because the pilgrimages to the Kaaba were the chief source of such prosperity as Mecca enjoyed. He became bolder and more definite in his teaching, declaring himself to be the last chosen prophet of God, entrusted with a mission to perfect religion. Abraham, he declared, and Jesus Christ were his forerunners. He had been chosen to complete and perfect the revelation of God's will. He produced verses which he said had been communicated to him by an angel, and he had a strange vision in which he was taken up through the heavens to God and instructed in his mission. As his teaching increased in force, the hostility of his fellow townsmen increased also. At last a plot was made to kill him, but he escaped with his faithful friend and disciple, Abu Bakr, to the friendly town of Medina, which adopted his doctrine. Hostilities followed between Mecca and Medina, which ended at last in a treaty. Mecca was to adopt the worship of the one true God, and accept Muhammad as his prophet, but the adherents of the new faith were still to make the pilgrimage to Mecca, just as they had done when they were pagans. So Muhammad established the one true God in Mecca, without injuring its pilgrim traffic. In 629, Muhammad returned to Mecca as its master, a year after he had sent out these envoys of his to Heraclius, Taitsung, Kavad, and all the rulers of the earth. 
Then, for four years more, until his death in 632, Muhammad spread his power over the rest of Arabia. He married a number of wives in his declining years, and his life on the whole was by modern standards unedifying. He seems to have been a man compounded of very considerable vanity, greed, cunning, self-deception, and quite sincere religious passion. He dictated a book of injunctions and expositions, the Koran, which he declared was communicated to him from God. Regarded as literature of philosophy, the Koran is certainly unworthy of its alleged divine authorship. Yet when the manifest defects of Muhammad's life and writings have been allowed for, there remains in Islam, this faith he imposed upon the Arabs, much power and inspiration. One is its uncompromising monotheism, its simple enthusiastic faith in the rule and fatherhood of God, and its freedom from theological complications. Another is its complete detachment from the sacrificial priest and the temple. It is an entirely prophetic religion, proof against any possibility of relapse towards blood sacrifices. In the Koran, the limited and ceremonial nature of the pilgrimage to Mecca is stated beyond the possibility of dispute, and every precaution was taken by Muhammad to prevent the deification of himself after his death and a third element of strength lay in the insistence of Islam upon the perfect brotherhood and equality before God of all believers, whatever their color, origin, or status. These are the things that made Islam a power in human affairs. It has been said that the true founder of the empire of Islam was not so much Muhammad as his friend and helper, Abu Bakr, if Muhammad, with his shifty character, was the mind and imagination of primitive Islam, Abu Bakr was its conscience and its will. Whenever Muhammad wavered, Abu Bakr sustained him. And when Muhammad died, Abu Bakr became caliph, successor, and with that faith that moves mountains, he set himself simply and sanely to organize the subjugation of the whole world to Allah, with little armies of 3,000 or 4,000 Arabs, according to those letters the Prophet had written from Medina in 628 to all the monarchs of the world. End of chapter 43。Chapter 44 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells。The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 44. The Great Days of the Arabs There follows the most amazing story of conquest in the whole history of our race. The Byzantine army was smashed at the Battle of the Yarmouk, a tributary of the Jordan, in 634, and the Emperor Heraclius, his energy sapped by dropsy and his resources exhausted by the Persian War, saw his new conquests in Syria Damascus, Palmyra, Antioch, Jerusalem, and the rest, fall almost without resistance to the Muslim. Large elements in the population went over to Islam. Then the Muslim turned east. The Persians had found an able general in Rustam. They had a great host with a force of elephants, and for three days they fought the Arabs at Cadesia, 637, and broke at last in headlong route. The conquest of all Persia followed, and the Muslim Empire pushed far into western Turkestan and eastward until it met the Chinese. Egypt fell almost without resistance to the new conquerors, who, full of a fanatical belief in the sufficiency of the Koran, wiped out the vestiges of the book-copying industry of the Alexandria Library. The tide of conquest poured along the north coast of Africa, to the Straits of Gibraltar and Spain. Spain was invaded in 710, and the Pyrenees Mountains were reached in 720. In 732, the Arab advance had reached the center of France, but there it was stopped for good at the Battle of Poitiers and thrust back as far as the Pyrenees again. 
The conquest of Egypt had given the Moslem a fleet, and for a time it looked as though they would take Constantinople. They made repeated sea attacks between 672 and 780, but the great city held out against them. The Arabs had little political aptitude and no political experience, and this great empire, with its capital now at Damascus, which stretched from Spain to China, was destined to break up very speedily. From the very beginning, doctrinal differences undermined its unity. But our interest here lies not with the story of its political disintegration, but with its effect upon the human mind and upon the general destinies of our race. The Arab intelligence had been flung across the world even more swiftly and dramatically than had the Greek a thousand years before. The intellectual stimulation of the whole world west of China, the breakup of old ideas and development of new ones, was enormous. In Persia, this fresh, excited Arabic mind came into contact not only with Manichaean, Zoroastrian, and Christian doctrine, but with the scientific Greek literature, preserved not only in Greek, but in Syrian translations. It found Greek learning in Egypt also, everywhere, and particularly in Spain. It discovered an active Jewish tradition of speculation and discussion. In Central Asia it met Buddhism and the material achievements of Chinese civilization. It learned the manufacture of paper, which made printed books possible from the Chinese. And finally it came into touch with Indian mathematics and philosophy. Very speedily the intolerant self-sufficiency of the early days of faith, which made the Koran seem the only possible book, was dropped. Learning sprang up everywhere in the footsteps of the Arab conquerors. By the 8th century there was an educational organization throughout the whole Arabized world. In the ninth, learned men in the schools of Cordoba in Spain were corresponding with learned men in Cairo, Baghdad, Bokhara, and Samarkand. The Jewish mind assimilated very readily with the Arab, and for a time the two Semitic races worked together through the medium of Arabic. Long after the political breakup and enfeeblement of the Arabs, this intellectual community of the Arab-speaking world endured. It was still producing very considerable results in the 13th century. So it was that the systematic accumulation and criticism of facts, which was first begun by the Greeks, was resumed in this astonishing renaissance of the Semitic world. The seed of Aristotle and the Museum of Alexandria, that had lain so long inactive and neglected, now germinated and began to grow towards fruition. Very great advances were made in mathematical, medical, and physical science. The clumsy Roman numerals were ousted by the Arabic figures we use to this day, and the zero sign was first employed. The very name algebra is Arabic. So is the word chemistry. The names of such stars as Algol, Aldebaran, and Boötes preserve the traces of Arab conquests in the sky. Their philosophy was destined to reanimate the medieval philosophy of France and Italy and the whole Christian world. The Arab experimental chemists were called alchemists, and they were still sufficiently barbaric in spirit to keep their methods and results secret as far as possible. They realized from the very beginning what enormous advantages their possible discoveries might give them, and what far-reaching consequences they might have on human life. They came upon many metallurgical and technical devices of the utmost value, alloys and dyes, distilling, tinctures and essences, optical glass. But the two chief ends they sought, they sought in vain. One was the philosopher's stone, a means of changing the metallic elements one into another and so getting control of artificial gold, and the other was the elixir vitae, a stimulant that would revivify age and prolong life indefinitely. 
the crabbed patient experimenting of these Arab alchemists spread into the Christian world. The fascination of their inquiries spread. Very gradually, the activities of these alchemists became more social and cooperative. They found it profitable to exchange and compare ideas. By insensible gradations, the last of the alchemists became the first of the experimental philosophers. The old alchemists sought the philosopher's stone, which was to transmute base metals to gold, and an elixir of immortality. They found the methods of modern experimental science, which promise in the end to give man illimitable power over the world and over his own destiny. End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 45 The Development of Latin Christendom. It is worthwhile to note the extremely shrunken dimensions of the share of the world remaining under Arian control in the 7th and 8th centuries. A thousand years before, the Aryan-speaking races were triumphant over all the civilized world west of China. Now, the Mongol had thrust as far as Hungary. Nothing of Asia remained under Aryan rule except the Byzantine dominions in Asia Minor, and all Africa was lost, and nearly all Spain. The great Hellenic world had shrunken to a few possessions around the nucleus of the trading city of Constantinople, and the memory of the Roman world was kept alive by the Latin of the Western Christian priests. In vivid contrast to this tale of retrogression, the Semitic tradition had risen again from subjugation and obscurity after a thousand years of darkness. Yet the vitality of the Nordic peoples was not exhausted. Confined now to Central and Northwestern Europe, and terribly muddled in their social and political ideas, they were nevertheless building up gradually and steadily a new social order and preparing unconsciously for the recovery of a power even more extensive than they had previously enjoyed. We have told how, at the beginning of the sixth century, there remained no central government in Western Europe at all. That world was divided up among numbers of local rulers holding their own as they could, this was too insecure a state of affairs to last. A system of cooperation and association grew up in this disorder, the feudal system, which has left its traces upon European life up to the present time. The feudal system, which has left its traces upon European life up to the present time. This feudal system was a sort of crystallization of society about power. Everywhere the lone man felt insecure, and was prepared to barter a certain amount of his liberty to help and protection. He sought a stronger man as his lord and protector. He gave him military services and paid him dues, and in return he was confirmed in his possession of what was his. His lord again found safety in vassalage to a still greater lord. Cities also found it convenient to have feudal protectors, and monasteries and church estates bound themselves by similar ties. No doubt in many cases allegiance was claimed before it was offered. The system grew downward as well as upward. So a sort of pyramidal system grew up, varying widely in different localities, permitting at first a considerable play of violence and private warfare, but making steadily for order and a new reign of law. The pyramids grew up until some became recognizable as kingdoms. Already by the early 6th century a Frankish kingdom existed under its founder Clovis in what is now France and the Netherlands, and presently Visigothic and Lombard and Gothic kingdoms were in existence. The Moslem, when they crossed the Pyrenees in 720, found this Frankish kingdom under the practical rule of Charles Martel, the mayor of the palace of a degenerate descendant of Clovis, and experienced the decisive defeat at Poitiers, 732, at his hands. This Charles Martel, 
was practically overlord of Europe north of the Alps from the Pyrenees to Hungary. He ruled over a multitude of subordinate lords, speaking French, Latin, and high and low German languages. His son Pepin extinguished the last descendants of Clovis and took the kingly state and title. His grandson Charlemagne, who began to reign in 768, found himself lord of a realm so large that he could think of reviving the title of Latin Emperor. He conquered North Italy and made himself master of Rome. Approaching the story of Europe as we do from the wider horizons of world history, we can see much more distinctly than the mere nationalist historian how cramping and disastrous this tradition of the Latin Roman Empire was. A narrow, intense struggle for this phantom predominance was to consume European energy for more than a thousand years. Through all that period, it is possible to trace certain unquenchable antagonisms. They run through the wits of Europe like the obsessions of a demented mind. One driving force was this ambition of successful rulers, which Charlemagne, Charles the Great, embodied to become Caesar. The realm of Charlemagne consisted of a complex of feudal German states at various stages of barbarism. West of the Rhine, most of these German peoples had learned to speak various Latinized dialects, which fused at last to form French. East of the Rhine, the racially similar German peoples did not lose their German speech. On account of this, communication was difficult between these two groups of barbarian conquerors, and a split easily brought about. The split was made the more easy by the fact that the Frankish usage made it seem natural to divide the empire of Charlemagne among his sons at his death. So one aspect of the history of Europe from the days of Charlemagne onwards is a history of first this monarch and his family, and then that, struggling to a precarious headship of the kings, princes, dukes, bishops, and cities of Europe, while a steadily deepening antagonism between the French and German-speaking elements develops in the medley. There was a formality of election for each emperor, and the climax of his ambition was to struggle to the possession of that worn-out, misplaced capital, Rome, and to coronation there. The next factor in the European political disorder was the resolve of the Church at Rome, to make no temporal prince but the Pope of Rome himself, emperor in effect. He was already Pontifex Maximus, for all practical purposes he held a decaying city. If he had no armies, he had at least a vast propaganda organization in his priests, throughout the whole Latin world. If he had little power over men's bodies, he held the keys of heaven and hell in their imaginations, and could exercise much influence upon their souls. So throughout the Middle Ages, while one prince maneuvered against another first for equality, then for ascendancy, and at last for the supreme prize, the Pope of Rome, sometimes boldly, sometimes craftily, sometimes feebly, for the popes were a succession of oldish men, and the average reign of a pope was not more than two years, maneuvered for the submission of all the princes to himself, as the ultimate overlord of Christendom. But these antagonisms of prince against prince and of emperor against pope do not by any means exhaust the factors of the European confusion. There was still an emperor in Constantinople speaking Greek and claiming the allegiance of all Europe. When Charlemagne sought to revive the empire, it was merely the Latin end of the empire he revived. It was natural that the sense of rivalry between Latin empire and Greek empire should develop very rapidly. And still more readily did the rivalry of Greek-speaking Christianity and the newer Latin-speaking version developed. The Pope of Rome claimed to be the successor of St. Peter, the chief of the apostles of Christ, and the head of the Christian community everywhere. Neither the emperor nor the patriarch in Constantinople were disposed to acknowledge this claim. A dispute about a fine point in the doctrine of the Holy Trinity consummated a long series of dissensions in a final rupture in 10, 
54. The Latin Church and the Greek Church became and remained, thereafter, distinct and frankly antagonistic. This antagonism must be added to the others in our estimate of the conflicts that wasted Latin Christendom in the Middle Ages. Upon this divided world of Christendom reigned the blows of three sets of antagonists. About the Baltic and North Seas remained a series of Nordic tribes who were only very slowly and reluctantly Christianized. These were the Northmen. They had taken to the sea and piracy, and were raiding all the Christian coasts down to Spain. They had pushed up the Russian rivers to the desolate central lands, and brought their shipping over into the south-flowing rivers. They had come out upon the Caspian and Black Seas as pirates also. They set up principalities in Russia. They were the first people to be called Russians. These Norsemen, Russians, came near to taking Constantinople, England in the early ninth century was a Christianized, low German country under a king, Egbert, a protégé and pupil of Charlemagne. The Norsemen wrested half the kingdom from his successor Alfred the Great, 886, and finally under Canute, 1016, made themselves masters of the whole land. Under Rolf the Ganger, 912, another band of Norsemen conquered the north of France, which became Normandy. Canute ruled not only over England, but over Norway and Denmark, but his brief empire fell to pieces at his death through that political weakness of the barbaric peoples, division among a ruler's sons. It is interesting to speculate what might have happened if this temporary union of the Norsemen had endured. They were a race of astonishing boldness and energy. They sailed in their galleys even to Iceland and Greenland, they were the first Europeans to land on American soil. Latent on Norman adventurers were to recover Sicily from the Saracens and sack Rome. It is a fascinating thing to imagine what a great northern seafaring power might have grown out of Canute's kingdom, reaching from America to Russia. To the east of the Germans and Latinized Europeans was a medley of Slav tribes and Turkish peoples. Prominent among these were the Magyars or Hungarians, who were coming westward throughout the 8th and ninth centuries. Charlemagne held them for a time, but after his death they established themselves in what is now Hungary, and after the fashion of their kindred predecessors, the Huns, raided every summer into the settled parts of Europe. In 938 they went through Germany into France, crossed the Alps into North Italy, and so came home, burning, robbing, and destroying. Finally pounding away from the south the vestiges of the Roman Empire were the Saracens. They had made themselves largely masters of the sea. Their only formidable adversaries upon the water were the Norsemen, the Russian Norsemen out of the Black Sea, and the Norsemen of the West. Hemmed in by these more vigorous and aggressive peoples, amidst forces they did not understand, and dangers they could not estimate, Charlemagne and after him a series of other ambitious spirits took up the futile drama of restoring the Western Empire under the name of the Holy Roman Empire. From the time of Charlemagne onward, this idea obsessed the political life of Western Europe, while in the East the Greek half of the Roman power decayed and dwindled, until at last nothing remained of it at all but the corrupt trading city of Constantinople, and a few miles of territory about it. Politically the continent of Europe remained traditional and uncreative from the time of Charlemagne onward for a thousand years. The name of Charlemagne looms large in European history, but his personality is but indistinctly seen. He could not read nor write, but he had a considerable respect for learning, he liked to be read aloud to at meals, and he had a weakness for theological discussion. At his winter quarters at aix la capelle or Mayence, he gathered about him a number of learned men, and picked up much from their conversation. In the summer he made war against the Spanish Saracens, against the Slavs and Magyars, against the Saxons and other still heathen German tribes. 
It is doubtful whether the idea of becoming Caesar in succession to Romulus Augustulus occurred to him, before his acquisition of North Italy, or whether it was suggested to him by Pope Leo III, who was anxious to make the Latin Church independent of Constantinople. There were the most extraordinary manoeuvres at Rome between the Pope and the prospective Emperor, in order to make it appear, or not appear, as if the Pope gave him the imperial crown. The Pope succeeded in crowning his visitor and conqueror by surprise in St. Peter's on Christmas Day, 800 A.D. He produced a crown, put it on the head of Charlemagne, and hailed him Caesar and Augustus. There was a great applause among the people. Charlemagne was by no means pleased at the way in which the thing was done. It rankled in his mind as a defeat, and he left the most careful instructions to his son that he was not to let the Pope crown him emperor. He was to seize the crown into his own hands and put it on his own head himself. So at the very outset of this imperial revival we see beginning the age-long dispute of Pope and Emperor for priority. But Louis the Pious, the son of Charlemagne, disregarded his father's instructions and was entirely submissive to the Pope. The empire of Charlemagne fell apart at the death of Louis the Pious, and the split between the French-speaking Franks and the German-speaking Franks widened. The next emperor to arise was Otto, the son of a certain Henry the Fowler, a Saxon, who had been elected King of Germany by an assembly of German princes and prelates in 919. Otto descended upon Rome and was crowned emperor there in 962. This Saxon line came to an end early in the 11th century and gave place to other German rulers. The feudal princes and nobles to the west, who spoke various French dialects, did not fall under the sway of these German emperors after the Karlovinkian line, the line that is descended for Charlemagne, had come to an end, and no part of Britain ever came into the Holy Roman Empire. The Duke of Normandy, the King of France, and a number of lesser feudal rulers remained outside. In 987, the Kingdom of France passed out of the possession of the Carlovingian line into the hands of Hugh Capet, whose descendants were still reigning in the 18th century. At the time of Hugh Capet, the King of France ruled only a comparatively small territory around Paris. In 1066, England was attacked almost simultaneously by an invasion of the Norwegian Norsemen under King Harald Hardrada and by the Latinized Norsemen under the Duke of Normandy. Harald, King of England, defeated the former at the Battle of Stamford Bridge and was defeated by the latter at Hastings. England was conquered by the Normans, and so cut off from Scandinavian, Teutonic and Russian affairs, and brought into the most intimate relations and conflicts with the French. For the next four centuries the English were entangled in the conflicts of the French feudal princes, and wasted upon the fields of France. End of chapter 45《ポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャスト
the arts flourished, and the mind of man could move without fear or superstition. And even in Spain and North Africa, where the Saracenic dominions were falling into political confusion, there was a vigorous intellectual life. Aristotle was read and discussed by these Jews and Arabs during these centuries of European darkness. They guarded the neglected seeds of science and philosophy. Northeast of the Caliph's dominions was a number of Turkish tribes. They had been converted to Islam, and they held the faith much more simply and fiercely than the actively intellectual Arabs and Persians to the south. In the tenth century the Turks were growing strong and vigorous, while the Arab power was divided and decaying. The relations of the Turks to the empire of the Caliphate became very similar to the relations of the Medes to the last Babylonian empire fourteen centuries before. In the eleventh century a group of Turkish tribes, the Seljuk Turks, came down into Mesopotamia and made the Caliph their nominal ruler, but really their captive and tool. They conquered Armenia. Then they struck at the remnants of the Byzantine power in Asia Minor. In 1071, the Byzantine army was utterly smashed at the Battle of Melisgird, and the Turks swept forward until not a trace of Byzantine rule remained in Asia. They took the fortress of Nicaea over against Constantinople and prepared to attempt that city. The Byzantine emperor Michael the Seventh was overcome with terror. He was already heavily engaged in warfare with a band of Norman adventurers who had seized Durazzo and with a fierce Turkish people, the Pechenegs, who were raiding over the Danube. In his extremity he sought help where he could, and it is notable that he did not appeal to the Western Emperor, but to the Pope of Rome as the head of Latin Christendom. He wrote to Pope Gregory VII, and his successor Alexius Comenus wrote still more urgently to Urban II. This was not a quarter of a century from the rupture of Latin and Greek churches. That controversy was still vividly alive in men's minds, and this disaster to Byzantium must have presented itself to the Pope as a supreme opportunity for reasserting the supremacy of the Latin Church over the dissentient Greeks. Moreover, this occasion gave the Pope a chance to deal with two other matters that troubled Western Christendom very greatly. One was the custom of private war, which disordered social life, and the other was the superabundant fighting energy of the low Germans and Christianized Norsemen, and particularly of the Franks and Normans. A religious war, the Crusade, the War of the Cross, was preached against the Turkish captors of Jerusalem, and a truce to all warfare amongst Christians. 1095 the declared object of this war was the recovery of the Holy Sepulchre from the unbelievers. A man called Peter the Hermit carried on a popular propaganda throughout France and Germany on broadly democratic lines. He went clad in a coarse garment, barefooted on an ass. He carried a huge cross and harangued the crowd in street or marketplace or church. He denounced the cruelties practiced upon the Christian pilgrims by the Turks, and the shame of the holy sepulchre being in any but Christian hands. The fruits of centuries of Christian teaching became apparent in the response. A great wave of enthusiasm swept the Western world, and popular Christendom discovered itself. Such a widespread uprising of the common people in relation to a single idea as now occurred was a new thing in the history of our race. There is nothing to parallel it in the previous history of the Roman Empire or of India or China. On a smaller scale, however, there had been similar movements amongst the Jewish people after their liberation from the Babylonian captivity, and later on Islam was to display a parallel susceptibility to collective feeling. Such movements were certainly connected with the new spirit that had come into life, with the development of the missionary teaching religions. The Hebrew prophets, Jesus and his disciples, Mani, Muhammad, were all exhorters of men's individual souls. 
they brought the personal conscience face to face with God. Before that time, religion had been much more a business of fetish, of pseudoscience, than of conscience. The old kind of religion turned upon temple, initiated priest and mystical sacrifice, and ruled the common man like a slave by fear. The new kind of religion made a man of him. The preaching of the First Crusade was the first stirring of the common people in European history. It may be too much to call it the birth of modern democracy, but certainly at that time modern democracy stirred. Before very long we shall find it stirring again and raising the most disturbing social and religious questions. Certainly this first stirring of democracy ended very pitifully and lamentably. Considerable bodies of common people, crowds rather than armies, set out eastward from France and the Rhineland and Central Europe without waiting for leaders or proper equipment to rescue the Holy Sepulchre. This was the People's Crusade. Two great mobs blundered into Hungary, mistook the recently converted Magyars for pagans, committed atrocities and were massacred. A third multitude with a similarly confused mind, after a great pogrom of the Jews in the Rhineland, marched eastward and was also destroyed in Hungary. Two other huge crowds, under the leadership of Peter the Hermit himself, reached Constantinople, crossed the Bosphorus, and were massacred rather than defeated by the Seljuk Turks. So began and ended this first movement of the European people as people. Next year, 1097, the real fighting forces crossed the Bosphorus. Essentially, they were Norman in leadership and spirit. They stormed Nicaea, marched by much the same route as Alexander had followed fourteen centuries before to Antioch. The siege of Antioch kept them a year, and in June 1099 they invested Jerusalem. It was stormed after a month's siege. The slaughter was terrible. Men riding on horseback were splashed by the blood in the streets. At nightfall on July 15th, the crusaders had fought their way into the church of this holy sepulchre and overcome all opposition there. Blood-stained, weary, and sobbing from excess of joy, they knelt down in prayer. Immediately the hostility of Latin and Greek broke out again. The crusaders were the servants of the Latin church, and the Greek patriarch of Jerusalem found himself in a far worse case under the triumphant Latins than under the Turks. The crusaders discovered themselves between Byzantine and Turk and fighting both. Much of Asia Minor was recovered by the Byzantine Empire, and the Latin princes were left, a buffer between Turk and Greek, with Jerusalem and a few small principalities, of which Edessa was one of the chief in Syria. Their grip, even on the possessions, was precarious, and in 1144 Edessa fell to the Muslim, leading to an ineffective Second Crusade, which failed to recover Edessa, but saved Antioch from a similar fate. In 1169 the forces of Islam were rallied under a Kurdish adventurer named Saladin, who had made himself master of Egypt. He preached a holy war against the Christians, recaptured Jerusalem in 1187, and so provoked the Third Crusade. This failed to recover Jerusalem. In the Fourth Crusade, 1202-1204, to the Latin Church turned frankly upon the Greek Empire, and there was not even a pretense of fighting the Turks. It started from Venice, and in 1204 it stormed Constantinople. The great rising trading city of Venice was the leader in this adventure, and most of the coasts and islands of the Byzantine Empire were annexed by the Venetians. A Latin emperor, Baldwin of Flanders, was set up in Constantinople, and the Latin and Greek church were declared to be reunited. The Latin emperors ruled in Constantinople from 1204 to 1261, when the Greek world shook itself free again from Roman predominance. The 12th century then, and the opening of the 13th, was the age of papal ascendancy, just as the 11th was the age of the ascendancy of the Seljuk Turks, and the 10th, the 
the age of the Norsemen. A united Christendom, under the rule of the Pope, came nearer to being a working reality than it ever was before or after that time. In those centuries a simple Christian faith was real and widespread over great areas of Europe. Rome itself had passed through some dark and discreditable phases. Few writers can be found to excuse the lives of Popes John the Eleventh and John the Twelfth in the tenth century. They were abominable creatures. But the heart and body of Latin Christendom had remained earnest and simple. The generality of the common priests and monks and nuns had lived exemplary and faithful lives. Upon the wealth of confidence such lives created rested the power of the Church. Among the great popes of the past had been Gregory the Great, Gregory I, 590 to 604, and Leo III, 795 to 816, who invited Charlemagne to be Caesar and crowned him in spite of himself. Towards the close of the 11th century, there arose a great clerical statesman, Hildebrand, who ended his life as Pope Gregory the Seventh, ten seventy three to ten eighty five. Next but one after him came Urban the Second, ten eighty seven to ten ninety nine, the Pope of the First Crusade. These two were the founders of this period of papal greatness, during which the popes lorded it over the emperors. From Bulgaria to Ireland and from Norway to Sicily and Jerusalem, the Pope was supreme. Gregory the Second obliged the Emperor Henry the Fourth to come in penitence to him at Canossa, and to await forgiveness for three days and nights in the courtyard of the castle, clad in sackcloth and barefooted to the snow. In eleven seventy six at Venice, the Emperor Frederick Frederick Barbarossa knelt to Pope Alexander the Third and swore fealty to him. The great power of the Church in the beginning of the eleventh century lay in the wills and consciences of men. It failed to retain the moral prestige on which its power was based. In the opening decades of the fourteenth century it was discovered that the power of the Pope had evaporated. What was it that destroyed the naive confidence of the common people of Christendom in the Church so that they would no longer rally to its appeal and serve its purposes. The first trouble was certainly the accumulation of wealth by the Church. The Church never died, and there was a frequent disposition on the part of dying, childless people to leave lands to the Church. Penitent sinners were exhorted to do so. Accordingly, in many European countries, as much as a fourth of the land became Church property. The appetite for property grows with what it feeds upon. Already in the 13th century it was being said everywhere that the priests were not good men, that they were always hunting for money and legacies. The kings and princes disliked this alienation of property very greatly. In the place of feudal lords capable of military support, they found their land supporting abbeys and monks and nuns and these lands were really under foreign dominion. Even before the time of Pope Gregory the Seventh, there had been a struggle between the princes and the papacy over the question of investitures, the question, that is, of who should appoint the bishops. If that power rested with the pope and not the king, then the latter lost control, not only of the consciences of his subjects, but of a considerable part of his dominions for also the clergy claimed exemption from taxation. They paid their taxes to Rome. And not only that, but the Church also claimed the right to levy a tax of one-tenth upon the property of the layman, in addition to the taxes he paid his prince. The history of nearly every country in Latin Christendom tells of the same phase in the 11th century, a phase of struggle between monarch and pope, on the issue of investitures, and generally, it tells of a victory for the Pope. He claimed to be able to excommunicate the prince, to absolve his subjects from their allegiance to him, to recognize a successor. He claimed to be able to put a nation under an interdict, and then nearly all priestly functions ceased, 
except the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and penance. The priests could neither hold the ordinary services, marry people, nor bury the dead. With these two weapons it was possible for the twelfth-century popes to curb the most recalcitrant princes and over all the most restive peoples. These were enormous powers, and enormous powers are only to be used on extraordinary occasions. The popes used them at last with a frequency that staled their effect. Within thirty years at the end of the twelfth century, we find Scotland, France, and England in turn under an interdict, and also the popes could not resist the temptation to preach crusades against offending princes, until the crusading spirit was extinct. It is possible that if the Church of Rome had struggled simply against the princes, and had had a care to keep its hold upon the general mind, it might have achieved a permanent dominion over all Christendom. But the high claims of the Pope were reflected as arrogance in the conduct of the clergy. Before the eleventh century the Roman priests could marry, they had close ties with the people among whom they lived, they were indeed a part of the people. Gregory the Seventh made them celibates, he cut the priests off from too great an intimacy with the laymen, in order to bind them more closely to Rome, but indeed he opened a fissure between the church and the commonalty. The church had its own law courts, cases involving not merely priests but monks, students, crusaders, widows, orphans, and the helpless, were reserved for the clerical courts, and so were all matters relating to wills, marriages, and oaths, and all cases of sorcery, heresy, and blasphemy. Whenever the layman found himself in conflict with the priest, he had to go to a clerical court. The obligations of peace and war fell upon his shoulders alone, and left the priest free. It is no great wonder that jealousy and hatred of the priests grew up in the Christian world. Never did Rome seem to realize that its power was in the consciences of common men. It fought against religious enthusiasm, which should have been its ally, and it forced doctrinal orthodoxy upon honest doubt and aberrant opinion. When the Church interfered in matters of morality, it had the common man with it, but not when it interfered in matters of doctrine. When in the south of France Waldo taught a return to the simplicity of Jesus in faith and life, Innocent III preached a crusade against the Waldenses, Waldo's followers, and permitted them to be suppressed with fire, sword, rape, and the most abominable cruelties. When again, St. Francis of Assisi, 1181-1226, taught the imitation of Christ, and a life of poverty and service. His followers, the Franciscans, were persecuted, scourged, imprisoned, and dispersed. In 1318, four of them were burned alive at Marseilles. On the other hand, the fiercely orthodox order of the Dominicans, founded by St. Dominic, 1170-1221, was strongly supported by Innocent III, who, with its assistance, set up an organization, the Inquisition, for the hunting of heresy and the affliction of free thought. So it was that the Church, by excessive claims, by unrighteous privileges, and by an irrational intolerance, destroyed that free faith of the common man, which was the final source of all its power. The story of its decline tells of no adequate foeman from without, but continually of decay from within. End of chapter 46「ラジオの世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世界の世
and establish one rule and one peace throughout Christendom, then it was vitally necessary that it should have a strong, steady, and continuous direction. In those great days of its opportunity, it needed before all things that the popes, when they took office, should be able men in the prime of life, that each should have his successor designate, with whom he could discuss, the policy of the church, and that the forms and processes of election should be clear, definite, unalterable, and unassailable. Unhappily none of these things obtained. It was not even clear who could vote in the election of a pope, nor whether the Byzantine or Holy Roman Emperor had a voice in the matter. That very great papal statesman Hildebrand, Pope Gregory the Seventh, ten seventy three to ten eighty five, did much to regularize the election. He confined the votes to the Roman cardinals, and he reduced the emperor's share to a formula of assent conceded to him by the church. But he made no provision for a successor designate, and he left it possible for the disputes of the cardinals to keep the see vacant, as in some cases it was kept vacant, for a year or more. The consequences of this want of firm definition are to be seen in the whole history of the papacy up to the sixteenth century. From quite early times onward, there were disputed elections, and two or more men each claiming to be pope. The church would then be subjected to the indignity of going to the emperor or some other outside arbiter to settle the dispute, and the career of every one of the great popes ended in a note of interrogation. At his death the church might be left headless and as ineffective as a decapitated body, or he might be replaced by some old rival, eager only to discredit and undo his work, or some enfeebled old man, tottering on the brink of the grave, might succeed him. It was inevitable that this peculiar weakness of the papal organization should attract the interference of the various German princes, the French king, and the Norman and French kings who ruled in England, that they should all try to influence the elections, and have a pope in their own interest established in the Lateran palace at Rome. And the more powerful and important the pope became in European affairs, the more urgent did these interventions become. Under the circumstances it is no great wonder that many of the popes were weak and futile. The astonishing thing is that many of them were able and courageous men. One of the most vigorous and interesting of the popes of this great period was Innocent III, 1198 to 1216, who was so fortunate as to become pope before he was 38. He and his successors were pitted against an even more interesting personality, the Emperor Frederick II, Stupor Mundi he was called, the wonder of the world. The struggle of this monarch against Rome is a turning place in history. In the end, Rome defeated him and destroyed his dynasty, but he left the prestige of the church and pope so badly wounded that its wounds festered and led to its decay. Frederick was the son of the Emperor Henry VI, and his mother was the daughter of Roger I, the Norman king of Sicily. He inherited this kingdom in 1198, when he was a child of four years. Innocent III had been made his guardian. Sicily in those days had been but recently conquered by the Normans. The court was half oriental and full of highly educated Arabs, and some of these were associated in the education of the young king. No doubt they were at some pains to make their point of view clear to him. He got a Muslim view of Christianity, as well as a Christian view of Islam, and the unhappy result of this double system of instruction was a view, exceptional in the age of faith, that all religions were impostures. He talked freely on the subject. His heresies and blasphemies are on record. As the young man grew up, 
he found himself in conflict with his guardian. Innocent the Third wanted altogether too much from his ward. When the opportunity came for Frederick to succeed as emperor, the Pope intervened with conditions. Frederick must promise to put down heresy in Germany with a strong hand. Moreover, he must relinquish his crown in Sicily and South Italy, because otherwise he would be too strong for the Pope. And the German clergy were to be freed from all taxation. Frederick agreed, but with no intention of keeping his word. The Pope had already induced the French king to make war upon his own subjects in France. The cruel and bloody crusade against the Waldenses. He wanted Frederick to do the same thing in Germany. But Frederick being far more of a heretic than any of the simple pietists who had incurred the Pope's animosity, lacked the crusading impulse. And when Innocent urged him to crusade against the Moslem and recover Jerusalem, he was equally ready to promise, and equally slack in his performance. Having secured the imperial crown, Frederick II stayed in Sicily, which he greatly preferred to Germany as a residence, and did nothing to redeem any of his promises to Innocent III, who died baffled in 1216. Honorius III, who succeeded Innocent, could do no better with Frederick, and Gregory IX, 1227, came to the papal throne evidently resolved to settle accounts with this young man at any cost. He excommunicated him. Frederick II was denied all the comforts of religion. In the half-Arab court of Sicily, this produced singularly little discomfort. And also the Pope addressed a public letter to the Emperor, reciting his vices, which were indisputable, his heresies and his general misconduct. To this, Frederick replied in a document of diabolical ability. It was addressed to all the princes of Europe, and it made the first clear statement of the issue between the Pope and the princes. He made a shattering attack upon the manifest ambition of the Pope to become the absolute ruler of all Europe. He suggested a union of princes against this usurpation. He directed the attention of the princes specifically to the wealth of the Church. Having fired off this deadly missile, Frederick resolved to perform his twelve-year-old promise and go upon a crusade. This was the Sixth Crusade, 1228. It was as a crusade farcical. Frederick II went to Egypt and met and discussed affairs with the Sultan. These two gentlemen, both of skeptical opinions, exchanged congenial views, made a commercial convention to their mutual advantage, and agreed to transfer Jerusalem to Frederick. This indeed was a new sort of crusade, a crusade by private treaty. Here was no blood splashing the conqueror, no weeping with excess of joy. As this astonishing crusader was an excommunicated man, he had to be content with a purely secular coronation as king of Jerusalem, taking the crown from the altar with his own hand, for all the clergy were bound to shun him. He then returned to Italy, chased the papal armies which had invaded his dominions back to their own territories, and obliged the Pope to grant him absolution from his excommunication. So a prince might treat the Pope in the thirteenth century, and there was now no storm of popular indignation to avenge him. Those days were past. In 1239, Gregory the Ninth resumed his struggle with Frederick, excommunicated him for a second time, and renewed that warfare of public abuse in which the papacy had already suffered severely. The controversy was revived after Gregory the Ninth was dead, when Innocent the Fourth was Pope, and again a devastating letter, which men were bound to remember, was written by Frederick against the Church. He denounced the pride and irreligion of the clergy, and ascribed all the corruptions of the time to their pride and wealth. 
he proposed to his fellow princes a general confiscation of church property for the good of the church. It was a suggestion that never afterwards left the imagination of the European princes. We will not go on to tell of his last years. The particular events of his life are far less significant than its general atmosphere. It is possible to piece together something of his court life in Sicily. He was luxurious in his way of living, and fond of beautiful things. He is described as licentious, but it is clear that he was a man of very effectual curiosity and inquiry. He gathered Jewish and Moslem as well as Christian philosophers at his court, and he did much to irrigate the Italian mind with Saracenic influences. Through him, the Arabic numerals and algebra were introduced to Christian students, and among other philosophers at his court was Michael Scott, who translated portions of Aristotle and the commentaries thereon of the great Arab philosopher Averroes of Cordoba. In 1224, Frederick founded the University of Naples, and he enlarged and enriched the great medical school at Salerno University. He also founded a zoological garden. He left a book on hawking, which shows him to have been an acute observer of the habits of birds, and he was one of the first Italians to write Italian verse. Italian poetry was indeed born at his court. He has been called, by an able writer, the first of the moderns, and the phrase expresses aptly the unprejudiced detachment of his intellectual side. A still more striking intimation of the decay of the living and sustaining forces of the papacy appeared when presently the popes came into conflict with the growing power of the French king. During the lifetime of the Emperor Frederick II, Germany fell into disunion, and the French king began to play the role of guard, supporter, and rival to the Pope, that had hitherto fallen to the Hohenstaufen emperors. A series of Popes pursued the policy of supporting the French monarchs. French princes were established in the kingdoms of Sicily and Naples, with the support and approval of Rome, and the French kings saw before them the possibility of restoring and ruling the empire of Charlemagne. When, however, the German interregnum after the death of Frederick II, the last of the Hohenstaufens, came to all end, and Rudolf of Habsburg was elected first Habsburg Emperor, 1273, the policy of Rome began to fluctuate between France and Germany, wearing about with the sympathies of each successive pope. In the East, in 1261, the Greeks recaptured Constantinople from the Latin emperors, and the founder of the new Greek dynasty, Michael Paleologus, Michael VIII, after some unreal tentatives of reconciliation with the Pope, broke away from the Roman communion altogether, and with that, and the fall of the Latin kingdoms in Asia, the eastward ascendancy of the Popes came to an end. In 1294, Boniface the Eighth became Pope. He was an Italian, hostile to the French, and full of a sense of the great traditions and missions of Rome. For a time he carried things with a high hand. In 1300 he held a jubilee, and a vast multitude of pilgrims assembled in Rome. So great was the influx of money into the papal treasury, that two assistants were kept busy with the rakes collecting the offerings that were deposited at the tomb of St. Peter. But this festival was a delusive triumph. Boniface came into conflict with the French king in 1302, and in 1303, as he was about to pronounce sentence of excommunication against that monarch, he was surprised and arrested in his own ancestral palace at Anagni, by Guillemy de Nogaret. This agent from the French king, forced an entrance into the palace, made his way into the bedroom of the frightened pope. He was lying in bed with a cross in his hands, and heaped threats and insults upon him. 
The Pope was liberated a day or so later by the townspeople, and returned to Rome, but there he was seized upon and again made prisoner by the Orsini family, and in a few weeks' time the shocked and disillusioned old man died a prisoner in their hands. The people of Anagni did resent the first outrage, and rose against Nogaret to liberate Boniface, but then Anagni was the Pope's native town. The important point to note is that the French king, in this rough treatment of the head of Christendom, was acting with the full approval of his people. He had summoned a council of the three estates of France, lords, church, and commons, and gained their consent before proceeding to extremities. Neither in Italy, Germany, nor England was there the slightest general manifestation of disapproval at this free handling of the sovereign pontiff. The idea of Christendom had decayed until its power over the minds of men had gone. Throughout the 14th century, the papacy did nothing to recover its moral sway. The next pope elected Clement V, but a Frenchman, the choice of King Philip of France. He never came to Rome. He set up his court in the town of Avignon, which then belonged not to France but to the papal see though embedded in French territory, and there his successors remained until 1377, when Pope Gregory XI returned to the Vatican Palace in Rome. But Gregory XI did not take the sympathies of the whole Church with him. Many of the cardinals were of French origin, and their habits and associations were rooted deep at Avignon. When in 1378 Gregory XI died, and an Italian, Urban VI, was elected, these dissentient cardinals declared the election invalid, and elected another pope, the antipope Clement VIII. This split is called the Great Schism. The popes remained in Rome, and all the anti-French powers, the emperor, the King of England, Hungary, Poland, and the North of Europe were loyal to them. The anti-popes, on the other hand, continued in Avignon and were supported by the King of France, his ally, the King of Scotland, Spain, Portugal, and various German princes. Each pope excommunicated and cursed the adherents of his rival, 1378 to 1417. Is it any wonder that presently all over Europe people began to think for themselves in matters of religion. The beginnings of the Franciscans and Dominicans, which we have noted in the preceding chapters, were but two among many of the new forces that were arising in Christendom, either to hold or shatter the Church, as its own wisdom might decide. Those two orders the Church did assimilate and use, though with a little violence in the case of the former. But other forces were more frankly disobedient and critical. A century and a half later came Wycliffe, 1320-1384. He was a learned doctor at Oxford. Quite late in his life he began a series of outspoken criticisms of the corruption of the clergy and the unwisdom of the church. He organized a number of poor priests, the Wycliffeites, to spread his ideas throughout England, and in order that people should judge between the Church and himself, he translated the Bible into English. He was a more learned and far abler man than either St. Francis or St. Dominic. He had supporters in high places and a great following among the people. And though Rome raged against him and ordered his imprisonment, he died a free man. But the black and ancient spirit that was leading the Catholic Church to its destruction would not let his bones rest in the grave. By a decree of the Council of Constance in 1415, his remains were ordered to be dug up and burned, an order which was carried out by the command of Pope Martin V by Bishop Fleming in 1428. This desecration was not the act of some isolated fanatic, 
it was the official act of the church. End of chapter 47「Chapter 48 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 48 – The Mongol Conquests But in the 13th century, while this strange and finally ineffectual struggle to unify Christendom under the rule of the Pope was going on in Europe, far more momentous events were afoot upon the larger stage of Asia. A Turkish people from the country to the north of China rose suddenly to prominence in the world's affairs, and achieved such a series of conquests as has no parallel in history. These were the Mongols. At the opening of the 13th century, they were a horde of nomadic horsemen, living very much as their predecessors, the Huns, had done, subsisting chiefly upon meat and mare's milk, and living in tents of skin. They had shaken themselves free from Chinese dominion, and brought a number of other Turkish tribes into a military confederacy. Their central camp was at Karakorum in Mongolia. At this time China was in a state of division. The great dynasty of Tang had passed into decay by the 10th century, and after a phase of division into warring states, three main empires, that of Qin in the north, with Pekin as its capital, and that of Sung in the south, with the capital at Nankin, and Xia in the center remain. In 1214, Genghis Khan, the leader of the Mongol confederates, made war on the Qin Empire and captured Pekin, 1214. He then turned westward and conquered western Turkestan, Persia, Armenia, India down to Lahore, and South Russia as far as Kiev. He died master of a vast empire that reached from the Pacific to the Dnieper. His successor, Ogdai Khan, continued this astonishing career of conquest. His armies were organized to a very high level of efficiency, and they had with them a new Chinese invention, gunpowder, which they used in small field guns. He completed the conquest of the Qin Empire, and then swept his hosts right across Asia to Russia, 1235, an altogether amazing march. Kiev was destroyed in 1240, and nearly all Russia became tributary to the Mongols. Poland was ravaged, and a mixed army of Poles and Germans was annihilated at the Battle of Lignitz in Lower Silesia in 1241. The Emperor Frederick II does not seem to have made any great efforts to stay the advancing tide. It is only recently, says Bury, in his notes to Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, that European history has begun to understand that the successes of the Mongol army, which overran Poland and occupied Hungary in the spring of A.D. 1241, were won by consummate strategy and were not due to a mere overwhelming superiority of numbers. But this fact has not yet become a matter of common knowledge. The vulgar opinion, which represents the Tartars as a wild horde carrying all before them, solely by their multitude, and galloping through Eastern Europe without a strategic plan, rushing at all obstacles and overcoming them by mere weight, still prevails. It is wonderful how punctually and effectually the arrangements were carried out in operations extending from the lower Vistula to Transylvania. Such a campaign was quite beyond the power of any European army of the time, and it was beyond the vision of any European commander. There was no general in Europe, from Frederick II downward, who was not a tyro in strategy compared to Subutai. It should also be noticed that the Mongols embarked upon the enterprise with full knowledge of the political situation of Hungary and the condition of Poland. They had taken care to inform themselves by a well-organized system of spies. On the other hand, the Hungarians and the Christian powers, like childish barbarians, 
knew hardly anything about their enemies. But though the Mongols were victorious at Lignitz, they did not continue their drive westward. They were getting into woodlands and hilly country, which did not suit their tactics, and so they turned southward and prepared to settle in Hungary, massacring or assimilating the kindred Magyar, even as these had previously massacred and assimilated the mixed Scythians and Avars and Huns before them. From the Hungarian plain they would probably have made raids west and south, as the Hungarians had done in the ninth century, the Avars in the seventh, and eighth and the Huns in the fifth. But Ogdai died suddenly, and in 1242 there was trouble about the succession, and recalled by this, the undefeated hosts of Mongols began to pour back across Hungary and Romania towards the east. Thereafter the Mongols concentrated their attention upon their Asiatic conquests. By the middle of the 13th century they had conquered the Sung Empire. Mangu Khan succeeded Ogdai Khan as Great Khan in 1251, and made his brother Kublai Khan governor of China. In 1280, Kublai Khan had been formally recognized emperor of China, and so founded the Yuan dynasty, which lasted until 1368. While the last ruins of the Sung rule were going down in China, another brother of Mangu, Hulagu, was conquering Persia and Syria. The Mongols displayed a bitter animosity to Islam at this time, and not only massacred the population of Baghdad when they captured that city, but set to work to destroy the immemorial irrigation system which had kept Mesopotamia incessantly prosperous and populous from the early days of Sumeria. From that time until our own, Mesopotamia has been a desert in ruins, sustaining only a scanty population. Into Egypt the Mongols never penetrated. The Sultan of Egypt completely defeated an army of Hulagus in Palestine in 1260. After that disaster, the tide of Mongol victory ebbed. The dominions of the Great Khan fell into a number of separate states. The Eastern Mongols became Buddhists, like the Chinese. The Western became Muslim. The Chinese threw off the rule of the Yuan Dynasty in 1368 and set up the native Ming Dynasty, which flourished from 1368 to 1644. The Russians remained tributary to the Tartar hordes upon the southeast steppes until 1480, when the Grand Duke of Moscow repudiated his allegiance and laid the foundation of modern Russia. In the 14th century, there was a brief revival of Mongol vigor under Timurlane, a descendant of Genghis Khan. He established himself in western Turkestan, assumed the title of Grand Khan in 1369, and conquered from Syria to Delhi. He was the most savage and destructive of all the Mongol conquerors. He established an empire of desolation that did not survive his death. In 1505, however, a descendant of this Timur, an adventurer named Babur, got together an army with guns and swept down upon the plains of India. His grandson Akbar, 1556-1605, completed his conquests, and this Mongol, or Mogul as the Arabs called it, dynasty ruled in Delhi over the greater part of India until the 18th century. One of the consequences of the first great sweep of Mongol conquest in the 13th century was to drive a certain tribe of Turks, the Ottoman Turks, out of Turkestan into Asia Minor. They extended and consolidated their power in Asia Minor, crossed the Dardanelles and conquered Macedonia, Serbia and Bulgaria, until at last Constantinople remained, like an island, amongst the Ottoman dominions. In 1453, the Ottoman Sultan, Mohammed II, took Constantinople, attacking it from the European side with a great number of guns. This event caused intense excitement in Europe, and there was talk of a crusade, 
but the day of the Crusades was past. In the course of the 16th century, the Ottoman sultans conquered Baghdad, Hungary, Egypt, and most of North Africa, and their fleet made them masters of the Mediterranean. They very nearly took Vienna, and they exacted its tribute from the emperor. There were but two items to offset the general ebb of Christian dominion in the 15th century. One was the restoration of the independence of Moscow, 1480. The other was the gradual reconquest of Spain by the Christians. In 1492, Granada, the last Muslim state in the peninsula, fell to King Ferdinand of Aragon and his Queen Isabella of Castile. But it was not until as late as 1571 that the naval battle of Lepanto broke the prick of the Ottomans and restored the Mediterranean waters to Christian ascendancy. End of chapter 48Chapter 49 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 49 The Intellectual Revival of the Europeans. Throughout the twelfth century, there were many signs that the European intelligence was recovering courage and leisure and preparing to take up again the intellectual enterprises of the first. Greek scientific inquiries, and such speculations as those of the Italian Lucretius. The causes of this revival were many and complex. The suppression of private war, the higher standards of comfort and security that followed the Crusades, and the stimulation of men's minds by the experiences of these expeditions were no doubt necessary preliminary conditions. Trade was reviving. Cities were recovering ease and safety. The standard of education was arising in the church and spreading among laymen. The 13th and 14th centuries was a period of growing, independent or quasi-independent cities. Venice, Florence, Genoa, Lisbon, Paris, Bruges, London, Antwerp, Hamburg, Nuremberg, Novgorod, Visby and Bergen, for example. They were all trading cities with many travellers, and where men trade and travel, they talk and think. The polemics of the popes and princes, the conspicuous savagery and wickedness of the persecution of heretics, were exciting men to doubt the authority of the church and question and discuss fundamental things. We have seen how the Arabs were the means of restoring Aristotle to Europe, and how such a prince as Frederick the Second acted as a channel through which Arabic philosophy and science played upon the Renaissance European mind. Still more influential in the stirring up of men's ideas were the Jews. Their vast existence was a note of interrogation to the claims of the Church. And finally, the secret, fascinating inquiries of the alchemists were spreading far and wide, and setting men to the petty, furtive, and yet fruitful resumption of experimental science. And the stir in men's minds was by no means confined now to the independent and well-educated. The mind of the common man was awake in the world as it had never been before in all the experience of mankind. In spite of priest and persecution, Christianity does seem to have carried a mental ferment wherever its teaching reached. It established a direct relation between the conscience of the individual man and the God of righteousness, so that now, if need arose, he had the courage to form his own judgment upon prince or prelate or creed. As early as the 11th century, philosophical discussion had begun again in Europe, and there were great and growing universities at Paris, Oxford, Bologna, and other centers. There, medieval schoolmen took up again and thrashed out a series of questions upon the value and meaning of words that were a necessary preliminary to clear thinking and scientific age that was to follow. And standing by himself, because of his distinctive genius, was Roger Bacon, 
circa 1210 to circa 1293. A Franciscan of Oxford, the father of modern experimental science. His name deserves a prominence in our history second only to that of Aristotle. His writings are one long tirade against ignorance. He told his age it was ignorant, an incredibly bold thing to do. Nowadays a man may tell the world it is as silly as it is solemn, that all its methods are still infantile and clumsy, and its dogmas childish assumptions, without much physical danger. But these peoples of the Middle Ages, when they were not actually being massacred, or starving, or dying of pestilence, were passionately convinced of the wisdom, the completeness and finality of their beliefs, and disposed to resent any reflections upon them very bitterly. Roger Bacon's writings were like a flash of light in a profound darkness. He combined his attack upon the ignorance of his times, with a wealth of suggestion for the increase of knowledge. In his passionate insistence upon the need of experiment and of collecting knowledge, the spirit of Aristotle lives again in him. Experiment, experiment, that is the burthen of Roger Bacon. Yet of Aristotle himself Roger Bacon fell foul. He fell foul of him because men, instead of facing facts boldly, sat in rooms and pored over the bad Latin translations, which were then all that was available of the master. If I had my way, he wrote in his intemperate fashion, I should burn all the books of Aristotle, for the study of them can only lead to a loss of time, produce error, and increase ignorance. A sentiment that Aristotle would probably have echoed, could he have returned to a world, in which his works were not so much read as worshipped, and that, as Roger Bacon showed, in these most abominable translations. Throughout his books, a little disguised by the necessity of seeming to square it all with orthodoxy for fear of the prison and worse, Roger Bacon shouted to mankind, Cease to be ruled by dogmas and authorities. Look at the world. Four chief sources of ignorance he denounced, respect of authority, custom, the sense of the ignorant crowd, and the vain, proud unteachableness of our dispositions. Overcome but these, and the world of power would open to men. Machines for navigating are possible without rovers, so that great ships suited to river or ocean, guided by one man, may be borne with greater speed than if they were full of men. Likewise cars may be made, so that without a draught animal they may be moved, cum impetu incestimable, as we deem the skyst chariots to have been from which antiquity fought. And flying machines are possible, so that a man may sit in the middle turning some device, by which artificial wings may beat the air in the manner of a flying bird. So Roger Bacon wrote, but three more centuries were to elapse before man began any systematic attempts to explore the hidden stores of power and interest he realized so clearly existed beneath the dull surface of human affairs. But the Saracenic world not only gave Christendom the stimulus of its philosophers and alchemists, it also gave it paper. It is scarcely too much to say that paper made the intellectual revival of Europe possible. Paper originated in China, where its use probably goes back to the 2nd century BC. In 751, the Chinese made an attack upon the Arab Muslims in Samarkand. They were repulsed, and among the prisoners taken from them were some skilled paper makers, from whom the art was learned. Arabic paper manuscripts from the 9th century onward still exist. The manufacture entered Christendom either through Greece or by the capture of Moorish paper mills during the Christian reconquest of Spain. But under the Christian Spanish, the product deteriorated sadly. Good paper was not made in Christian Europe until the end of the 13th century, and then it was Italy which led the world. Only by the 14th century did the manufacture reach Germany, 
and not until the end of that century was it abundant and cheap enough for the printing of books to be a practicable business proposition. Thereupon, printing followed naturally and necessarily, for printing is the most obvious of inventions, and the intellectual life of the world entered upon a new and far more vigorous phase. It ceased to be a little trickle from mind to mind, it became a broad flood, in which thousands and presently scores and hundreds of thousands of minds participated. One immediate result of this achievement of printing was the appearance of an abundance of Bibles in the world. Another was a cheapening of school books. The knowledge of reading spread swiftly. There was not only a great increase of books in the world, but the books that were now made were plainer to read and so easier to understand. Instead of toiling at a crabbed text, arid then thinking over its significance, readers now could think, unimpeded as they read. With this increase in the facility of reading, the reading public grew. The book ceased to be a highly decorated toy or a scholar's mystery. People began to write books to be read as well as looked at by ordinary people. They wrote in the ordinary language, and not in Latin. With the 14th century, the real history of the European literature begins. So far we have been dealing only with the Saracenic share in the European revival. Let us turn now to the influence of the Mongol conquests. They stimulated the geographical imagination of Europe enormously. For a time under the great Khan, all Asia and Western Europe enjoyed an open intercourse. All the roads were temporarily open, and representatives of every nation appeared at the court of Karakorum. The barriers between Europe and Asia, set up by the religious void of Christianity and Islam, were lowered. Great hopes were entertained by the papacy for the conversion of the Mongols to Christianity. Their only religion so far had been Schumanism, a primitive paganism. Envoys of the Pope, Buddhist priests from India, Parisian and Italian and Chinese artificers, Byzantine and Armenian merchants, mingled with Arab officials and Persian and Indian astronomers and mathematicians at the Mongol court. We hear too much in history of the campaigns and massacres of the Mongols, and not enough of their curiosity and desire for learning. Not perhaps as an originative people, but as transmitters of knowledge and method, their influence upon the world's history has been very great. And everything one can learn of the vague and romantic personalities of Genghis or Kublai tends to confirm the impression that these men were at least as understanding and creative monarchs as either that flamboyant but egoistical figure Alexander the Great, or that raiser of political ghosts, the energetic but illiterate theologian Charlemagne. One of the most interesting of these visitors to the Mongol court was a certain Venetian, Marco Polo, who afterwards set down his story in a book. He went to China about 1272, with his father and uncle, who had already once made the journey. The great Khan had been deeply impressed by the elder Polos. They were the first men of the Latin peoples he had seen, and he sent them back with inquiries for teachers and learned men who could explain Christianity to him, and for various other European things that had aroused his curiosity. Their visit with Marco was their second visit. The three Polos started by the way of Palestine, and not by the Crimea, as in their previous expedition. They had with them a gold tablet and other indications from the Gate Khan that must have greatly facilitated their journey. The Great Khan had asked for some oil from the lamp that burns in the Holy Sepulchre at Jerusalem, and so thither they first went and then by way of Kilikia into Armenia. They went thus far north because the Sultan of Egypt was raiding the Mongol domains at this time. Thence they came by way of Mesopotamia to Ormuz on the Persian Gulf, 
as if they contemplated a sea voyage. At Ormuz they met merchants from India. For some reason they did not take ship, but instead turned northward through the Persian deserts, and so, by way of Balkh, over the Pamir to Kashgar, and by way of Khotan and the Lobnor into the Huanghu Valley and on to Pekin. At Pekin was the great Khan, and they were hospitably entertained. Marco particularly pleased Kublai. He was young and clever, and it is clear he had mastered the Tartar language very thoroughly. He was given an official position and sent on several missions, chiefly in southwest China. The tale he had to tell of vast stretches of smiling and prosperous country, all the way excellent hostelries for travelers, and fine vineyards, fields, and gardens, of many abbeys of Buddhist monks, of manufactures of clothes of silk and gold, and many fine taffetas, a constant succession of cities and boroughs, and so on, first roused the incredulity, and then fired the imagination of all Europe. He told of Burma, and of its great armies with hundreds of elephants, and how these animals were defeated by the Mongol bowmen, and also of the Mongol conquest of Pegu. He told of Japan, and greatly exaggerated the amount of gold in that country. For three years Marco ruled the city of Yang Chou as governor, and he probably impressed the Chinese inhabitants as being little more of a foreigner than any Tartar would have been. He may also have been sent on a mission to India. Chinese records mention a certain polo attached to the Imperial Council in 1277, a very valuable confirmation of the general truth of the polo story. The publication of Marco Polo's travels produced a profound effect upon the European imagination. The European literature, and especially the European romance of the 15th century, echoes with the names in Marco Polo's story, with Cathay, North China, and Cambulac, Pekin, and the like. Two centuries later, among the readers of the travels of Marco Polo, was a certain Genoese mariner, Christopher Columbus, who conceived the brilliant idea of sailing westward round the world to China. In Seville, there is a copy of the travels with marginal notes by Columbus. There were many reasons why the thought of a Genoese should be turned in this direction. Until its capture by the Turks in 1453, Constantinople had been an impartial trading mart between the Western world and the East, and the Genoese had traded there freely. But the Latin Venetians, the bitter rivals of the Genoese, had been the allies and helpers of the Turks against the Greeks, and with the coming of the Turks, Constantinople turned an unfriendly face upon Genoese trade. The long-forgotten discovery that the world was round had gradually resumed its sway over men's minds. The idea of going westward to China was therefore a fairly obvious one. It was encouraged by two things. The mariner's compass had now been invented, and men were no longer left to the mercy of a fine night and the stars to determine the direction in which they were sailing, and the Normans, Catalonians, and Genoese and Portuguese had already pushed out into the Atlantic as far as the Canary Isles, Madeira, and the Azores. Yet Columbus found many difficulties before he could get ships to put his idea to the test. He went from one European court to another. Finally at Granada, just won from the Moors, he secured the patronage of Ferdinand and Isabella, and was able to set out across the unknown ocean in three small ships. After a voyage of two months and nine days, he came to a land which he believed to be India, but which was really a new continent, whose distinct existence the old world had never hitherto suspected. He returned to Spain with gold, cotton, strange beasts and birds, and two wild-eyed painted Indians to be baptized. They were called Indians because, to the end of his days, he believed that this land he found was India. Only in the course of several years did men begin to realize 
that the whole new continent of America was added to the world's resources. The success of Columbus stimulated overseas enterprise enormously. In 1497, the Portuguese sailed round Africa to India, and in 1515, there were Portuguese ships in Java. In 1519, Magellan, a Portuguese sailor in Spanish employment, sailed out of Seville westward with five ships, of which one, the Vitoria, came back up the river to Seville in 1522, the first ship that had ever circumnavigated the world. Thirty-one men were aboard her, survivors of 280 who had started. Magellan himself had been killed in the Philippine Isles. Printed paper books, a new realization of the round world as a thing altogether attainable, a new vision of strange lands, strange animals and plants, strange manners and customs, discoveries overseas and in the skies, and in the ways and materials of life, burst upon the European mind. The Greek classics, buried and forgotten for so long, were speedily being printed and studied and were coloring men's thoughts with the dreams of Plato, and the traditions of an age of republican freedom and dignity. The Roman dominion had first brought law and order to Western Europe, and the Latin church had restored it. But under both pagan and Catholic Rome, curiosity and innovation were subordinate to, and restrained by, organization. The reign of the Latin mind was now drawing to an end. Between the 13th and the 16th century, the European Aryans, thanks to the stimulating influence of Semite and Mongol, and the rediscovery of the Greek classics, broke away from the Latin tradition and rose again to the intellectual and material leadership of mankind. End of chapter 49「Chapter 50 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 50. The Reformation of the Latin Church. The Latin Church itself was enormously affected by this mental rebirth. It was dismembered, and even the portion that survived was extensively renewed. We have told how nearly the Church came to the autocratic leadership of all Christendom in the 11th and 12th centuries, and how in the 14th and 15th its power over men's minds and affairs declined. We have described how popular religious enthusiasm, which had, in earlier ages, been its support and power, was turned against it by its pride, persecutions, and centralization, and how the insidious skepticism of Frederick II bore fruit in a growing insubordination of the princes. The great schism had reduced its religious and political prestige to negligible proportions. The forces of insurrection struck it now from both sides. The teachings of the Englishman Wycliffe spread widely throughout Europe. In 1398, a learned Czech, John Haas, delivered a series of lectures upon Wycliffe's teachings in the University of Prague. This teaching spread rapidly beyond the educated class and aroused great popular enthusiasm. In 1414-1418, a council of the whole church was held at Constance to settle the great schism. Huss was invited to this council under promise of a safe conduct from the emperor, seized, put on trial for heresy, and burned alive, 1415. So far from tranquilizing the Bohemian people, this led to an insurrection of the Hussites in that country, the first of a series of religious wars that inaugurated the breakup of Latin Christendom. Against this insurrection, Pope Martin V, the Pope specially elected at Constance as the head of a reunited Christendom, preached a crusade. Five crusades in all were launched upon this sturdy little people, and all of them failed. All the unemployed ruffianism of Europe was turned upon Bohemia in the 15th century, just as in the 13th it had been turned upon the Waldenses. But the Bohemian Czechs, unlike the Waldenses, believed in armed resistance. 
the Bohemian Crusade dissolved and streamed away from the battlefield at the sound of the Hussites' wagons and the distant chanting of their troops. It did not even wait to fight. Battle of Domaslitz, 1431. In 1436, an agreement was patched up with the Hussites by the new council of the church at Basel, in which many of the special objections to Latin practice were conceded. In the 15th century, a great pestilence had produced much social disorganization throughout Europe. There had been extreme misery and discontent among the common people, and peasant risings against the landlords and the wealthy in England and France. After the Hussite Wars, these peasant insurrections increased in gravity in Germany and took on a religious character. Printing came in as an influence upon this development. By the middle of the 15th century, there were printers at work with movable type in Holland and the Rhineland. The art spread to Italy and England, where Caxton was printing in Westminster in 1477. The immediate consequence was a great increase and in distribution of Bibles, and greatly increased facilities for widespread popular controversies. The European world became a world of readers, to an extent that had never happened to any community in the past, and this sudden irrigation of the general mind with clearer ideas and more accessible information occurred just at a time when the church was confused and divided and not in a position to defend itself effectively, and when many princes were looking for means to weaken its hold upon the vast wealth it claimed in their dominions. In Germany the attack upon the church gathered round the personality of an ex-monk Martin Luther, 1483-1546, to who appeared in Wittenberg in 1517, offering disputations against various orthodox doctrines and practices. At first, he disputed in Latin in the fashion of the schoolman. Then he took up the new weapon of the printed word and scattered his views far and wide in German, addressed to the ordinary people. An attempt was made to suppress him, as Husk had been suppressed, but the printing press had changed conditions, and he had too many open and secret friends among the German princes for this fate to overtake him. For now, in this age of multiplying ideas and weakened faith, there were many rulers who saw their advantage in breaking the religious ties between their people and Rome. They sought to make themselves in person the heads of a more nationalized religion. England, Scotland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, North Germany and Bohemia, one after another, separated themselves from the Roman communion. They have remained separated ever since. The various princes concerned cared very little for the moral and intellectual freedom of their subjects. They used the religious doubts and insurgents of the peoples to strengthen them against Rome, but they tried to keep a grip upon the popular movement as soon as that rupture was achieved and a national church set up under the control of the crown. But there has always been a curious vitality in the teaching of Jesus, a direct appeal to righteousness and a man's self-respect over every loyalty and every subordination lay or ecclesiastical. None of these princely churches broke off without also breaking off a number of fragmentary sects that would admit the intervention of neither prince nor pope between a man and his god. In England and Scotland, for example, there was a number of sects who now held firmly to the Bible as their one guide in life and belief. They refused the disciplines of a state church, in England, these dissentients were the nonconformists, who played a very large part in the polities of that country in the 17th and 18th centuries. In England, they carried their objection to a princely head to the church so far as to decapitate King Charles I, 1649, and for eleven prosperous years England was a republic under nonconformist rule. The breaking away of this large section of Northern Europe from Latin Christendom is what is generally spoken of as the Reformation. 
but the shock and stress of these losses produced changes, perhaps as profound in the Roman Church itself. The Church was reorganized, and a new spirit came into its life. One of the dominant figures in this revival was a young Spanish soldier, Inigo López de Recalde, better known to the world as St. Ignatius of Loyola. After some romantic beginnings, he became a priest, 1538, and was permitted to found the Society of Jesus, a direct attempt to bring the generous and chivalrous traditions of military discipline into the service of religion. The Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, became one of the greatest teaching and missionary societies the world has ever seen. It carried Christianity to India, China, and America. It arrested the rapid disintegration of the Roman Church. It raised the standard of education throughout the whole Catholic world. It raised the level of Catholic intelligence and quickened the Catholic conscience everywhere. It stimulated Protestant Europe to competitive educational efforts. The vigorous and aggressive Roman Catholic Church we know today is largely the product of this Jesuit revival. End of chapter 50「Rome Revived The Holy Roman Empire came to a sort of climax in the reign of the Emperor Charles V. He was one of the most extraordinary monarchs that Europe has ever seen. For a time he had the air of being the greatest monarch since Charlemagne. His greatness was not of his own making. It was largely the creation of his grandfather, the Emperor Maximilian I, 1459-1519. Some families have fought, others have intrigued their way to world power. The Habsburgs married their way. Maximilian began his career with Austria, Styria, part of Alsac, and other districts, the original Habsburg patrimony. He married, the lady's name scarcely matters to us, the Netherlands and Burgundy. Most of Burgundy slipped from him after his first wife's death, but the Netherlands he held. Then he tried unsuccessfully to marry Brittany. He became emperor in succession to his father, Frederick III, in 1493, and married the Duchy of Milan. Finally, he married his son to the weak-minded daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, the Ferdinand and Isabella of Columbus, who not only reigned over a freshly united Spain and over Sardinia and the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, but over all America west of Brazil. So it was that this Charles V, his grandson, inherited most of the American continent, and between a third and a half of what the Turks had left of Europe. He succeeded to the Netherlands in 1506. When his grandfather Ferdinand died in 1516, he became practically king of the Spanish dominions, his mother being imbecile, and his grandfather Maximilian dying in 1519, he was in 1520 elected emperor, at the still comparatively tender age of twenty. He was a fair young man with a not very intelligent face, a thick upper lip and a long clumsy chin. He found himself in a world of young and vigorous personalities. It was an age of brilliant young monarchs. Francis I had succeeded to the French throne in 1515 at the age of twenty-one. Henry VIII had become King of England in 1509 at 18. It was the age of Babur in India, 1526 to 1530, and Suleiman the Magnificent in Turkey, 1520. Both exceptionally capable monarchs, and the Pope Leo X, 1513, was also a very distinguished Pope. The Pope and Francis I attempted to prevent the election of Charles as Emperor, because they dreaded the concentration of so much power in the hands of one man. Both Francis I and Henry VIII offered themselves to the imperial electors. 
but there was now a long-established tradition of Habsburg emperors since 1273, and some energetic bribery secured the election for Charles. At first the young man was very much a magnificent puppet in the hands of his ministers. Then slowly he began to assert himself and take control. He began to realize something of the threatening complexities of his exalted position. It was a position as unsound as it was splendid. From the very outset of his reign he was faced by the situation created by Luther's agitations in Germany. The emperor had one reason for siding with the reformers in the opposition of the pope to his election. But he had been brought up in Spain, that most Catholic of countries, and he decided against Luther. So he came into conflict with the Protestant princes, and particularly the elector of Saxony. He found himself in the presence of an opening rift that was to split the outworn fabric of Christendom into two contending camps. His attempts to close that rift were strenuous and honest, and ineffective. There was an extensive peasant revolt in Germany, which interwove with the general political and religious disturbance, and these internal troubles were complicated by attacks upon the empire from east and west alike. On the west of Charles was his spirited rival Francis I, to the east was the ever-advancing Turk, who was now in Hungary, in alliance with Francis, and clamoring for certain arrears of tribute from the Austrian dominions. Charles had the money and army of Spain at his disposal, but it was extremely difficult to get any effective support in money from Germany. His social and political troubles were complicated by financial distresses. He was forced to ruinous borrowing. On the whole, Charles, in alliance with Henry VIII, was successful against Francis I and the Turk. Their chief battlefield was North Italy. The generalship was dull on both sides. Their advances and retreats depended mainly on the arrival of reinforcements. The German army invaded France, failed to take Marseilles, fell back into Italy, lost Milan, and was besieged in Pavia. Francis I made a long and unsuccessful siege of Pavia, was caught by fresh German forces, defeated, wounded, and taken prisoner. But thereupon the Pope and Henry VIII, still haunted by the fear of his attaining excessive power, turned against Charles. The German troops in Milan, under the constable of Bourbon, being unpaid, forced rather than followed their commander into a raid upon Rome. They stormed the city and pillaged it, 1527. The Pope took refuge in the castle of St. Angelo, while the looting and slaughter went on. He bought off the German troops at last by the payment of 400,000 ducats. Ten years of such confused fighting impoverished all Europe. At last the Emperor found himself triumphant in Italy. In 1530, he was crowned by the Pope. He was the last German emperor to be so crowned, at Bologna. Meanwhile, the Turks were making great headway in Hungary. They had defeated and killed the King of Hungary in 1526. They held Budapest, and in 1529, Suleiman the Magnificent very nearly took Vienna. The emperor was greatly concerned by these advances, and did his utmost to drive back the Turks, but he found the greatest difficulty in getting the German princes to unite, even with this formidable enemy, upon their very borders. Francis I remained implacable for a time, and there was a new French war, but in 1538 Charles won his rival over to a more friendly attitude after ravaging the south of France. Francis and Charles then formed an alliance against the Turk. But the Protestant princes, the German princes who were resolved to break away from Rome, had formed a league, the Schmalkaldic League, against the Emperor, and in the place of a great campaign to recover Hungary for Christendom, Charles had to turn his mind to the gathering internal struggle in Germany. Of that struggle he saw only the opening war. 
It was a struggle, a sanguinary irritational bickering of princes, for ascendancy, now flaming into war and destruction, now sinking back to intrigues and diplomacies. It was a snake's sack of princely policies that was to go on writhing incurably right into the nineteenth century, and to waste and desolate Central Europe again and again. The Emperor never seems to have grasped the true forces at work in these gathering troubles. He was for his time and station an exceptionally worthy man, and he seems to have taken the religious dissensions that were tearing Europe into warring fragments as genuine theological differences. He gathered diets and councils in futile attempts at reconciliation. Formula and confessions were tried over. The student of German history must struggle with the details of the religious peace of Nuremberg, the settlement at the Diet of Ratisbon, the interim of Augsburg, and the like. Here we do but mention them as details in the worried life of this culminating emperor. As a matter of fact, Hardly one of the multifarious princes and rulers in Europe seems to have been acting in good faith. The widespread religious trouble of the world, the desire of the common people for truth and social righteousness, the spreading knowledge of the time, all those things were merely counters in the imaginations of princely diplomacy. Henry the Eighth of England, who had begun his career with a book against heresy, and who had been rewarded by the Pope with the title of Defender of the Faith, being anxious to divorce his first wife in favor of a young lady named Anne Boleyn, and wishing also to loot the vast wealth of the Church in England, joined the company of Protestant princes in 1530. Sweden, Denmark, and Norway had already gone over to the Protestant side. The German religious war began in 1546, a few months after the death of Martin Luther. We need not trouble about the incidents of the campaign. The Protestant Saxon army was badly beaten at Lokau. By something very like a breach of faith, Philip of Hesse, the emperor's chief remaining antagonist, was caught and imprisoned, and the Turks were bought off by the promise of an annual tribute. In 1547, to the great relief of the emperor, Francis I died. So, by 1547, Charles got to a kind of settlement and made his last efforts to effect peace, where there was no peace. In 1552, all Germany was at war again. Only a precipitate flight from Innsbruck saved Charles from capture. And in 1552, with the Treaty of Passau, came another unstable equilibrium. Such is the brief outline of the politics of the empire for 32 years. It is interesting to note how entirely the European mind was concentrated upon the struggle for European ascendancy. Neither Turks, French, English, nor Germans had yet discovered any political interest in the great continent of America, nor any significance in the new sea routes to Asia. Great things were happening in America, Cortés, with a mere handful of men, had conquered the great Neolithic empire of Mexico for Spain. Pizarro had crossed the Isthmus of Panama, 1530, and subjugated another wonderland, Peru. But as yet these events meant no more to Europe than a useful and stimulating influx of silver to the Spanish treasury. It was after the Treaty of Passau, that Charles began to display his distinctive originality of mind. He was now entirely bored and disillusioned by his imperial greatness. A sense of the intolerable futility of these European rivalries came upon him. He had never been of a very sound constitution. He was naturally indolent, and he was suffering greatly from gout. He abdicated. He made over all his sovereign rights in Germany to his brother Ferdinand, and Spain and the Netherlands he resigned to his son Philip. Then, in a sort of magnificent dungeon, he retired to a monastery at Eusti, among the oak and chestnut forests in the hills, to the north of the Tagus Valley. There he died in 1558. 
Much has been written in a sentimental vein of this retirement, this renunciation of the world by this tired majestic titan, world-weary, seeking in an austere solitude his peace with God. But his retreat was neither solitary nor austere. He had with him nearly a hundred and fifty attendants. His establishment had all the splendor and indulgences without the fatigues or a court. And Philip the Second was a dutiful son to whom his father's advice was a command. And if Charles had lost his living interest in the administration of European affairs, there were other motives of a more immediate sort to stir him, says Prescott, in the almost daily correspondence between Xixada or Gastelu and the Secretary of State at Valladolid, there is scarcely a letter that does not turn more or less on the Emperor's eating or his illness. The one seems naturally to follow, like a running commentary on the other. It is rare that such topics have formed the burden of communications with the Department of State. It must have been no easy matter for the Secretary to preserve his gravity in the perusal of dispatches in which politics and gastronomy were so strangely mixed together. The courier from Valladolid to Lisbon was ordered to make a detour so as to take Jarendilla in his route and bring supplies to the royal table. On Thursdays he was to bring fish to serve for the jor mayor that was to follow. The trout in the neighborhood Charles thought too small, so others of a larger size were to be sent from Valladolid. Fish of every kind was to his taste, as indeed was anything that in its nature or habits at all approached to fish. Eels, frogs, oysters occupied an important place in the royal bill of fare. Potted fish, especially anchovies, found great favor with him, and he regretted that he had not brought a better supply of these from the low countries. On an eel pasty he particularly doted. In 1554, Charles had obtained a bull from Pope Julius III, granting him a dispensation from fasting, and allowing him to break his fast early in the morning, even when he was to take the sacrament. Eating and doctoring. It was a return to elemental things. He had never acquired the habit of reading, but he would be read aloud to at meals, after the fashion of Charlemagne and would make what one narrator describes as a sweet and heavenly commentary. He also amused himself with mechanical toys, by listening to music or sermons, and by attending to the imperial business that still came drifting into him. The death of the empress, to whom he was greatly attached, had turned his mind towards religion, which in his case took a punctilious and ceremonial form, Every Friday in Lent, he scorched himself with the rest of the monks with such good will as to draw blood. These exercises and the gout released a bigotry in Charles that had hitherto been restrained by considerations of policy. The appearance of Protestant teaching close at hand in Valladolid roused him to fury. Tell the Grand Inquisitor and his council from me to be at their posts and to lay the axe at the root of the evil before it spreads further. He expressed a doubt whether it would not be well, in so black an affair, to dispense with an ordinary court of justice, and to show no mercy, lest the criminal, if pardoned, should have the opportunity of repeating his crime. He recommended as an example his own mode or proceeding in the Netherlands, where all who remained obstinate in their errors were burned alive, and those who were admitted to penitence were beheaded. And almost symbolical of his place and role in history was his preoccupation with funerals. He seems to have had an intuition that something great was dead in Europe, and sorely needed burial, and there was a need to write finis overdue. He not only attended every actual funeral that was celebrated at Eusti, but he had services conducted for the absent dead. He held a funeral service in memory of his wife on the anniversary of her death, and finally he celebrated his own obsequies. The chapel was hung with black, 
and the blaze of hundreds of wax lights was scarcely sufficient to dispel the darkness. The brethren, in their conventual dress, and all the emperor's household clad in deep mourning, gathered round a huge catafalque, shrouded also in black, which had been raised in the centre of the chapel. The service for the burial of the dead was then performed, and amidst the dismal wail of the monks, the prayers ascended for the departed spirit, that it might be received into the mansions of the blessed. The sorrowful attendants were melted to tears, as the image of their master's death was presented to their minds, or they were touched, it may be, with compassion, by this pitiable display of weakness. Charles, muffled in a dark mantle, and bearing a lighted candle in his hand, mingled with his household, the spectator of his own obsequies, and the doleful ceremony was concluded by his placing the taper in the hands of the priest, in sign of his surrendering up his soul to the Almighty. Within two months of this masquerade he was dead, and the brief greatness of the Holy Roman Empire died with him. His realm was already divided between his brother and his son. The Holy Roman Empire struggled on, indeed, to the days of Napoleon I, but as an invalid and dying thing. To this day, its unburied tradition still poisons the political air. End of chapter 51「Chapter fifty two of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty two The Age of Political Experiments of Grand Monarchy and Parliaments and Republicanism in Europe. The Latin Church was broken, the Holy Roman Empire was in extreme decay, the history of Europe from the opening of the 16th century onward, is a story of peoples feeling their way, darkly, to some new method of government, better adapted to the new conditions that were arising. In the ancient world, over long periods of time, there had been changes of dynasty, and even changes of ruling race and language, but the form of government, through monarch and temple, remained fairly stable, and still more stable was the ordinary way of living. In this modern Europe, since the 16th century, the dynastic changes are unimportant, and the interest of history lies in the wide and increasing variety of experiments in political and social organization. The political history of the world from the 16th century onward was, as we have said, an effort a largely unconscious effort of mankind to adapt its political and social methods to certain new conditions that had now arisen. The effort to adapt was complicated by the fad that the conditions themselves were changing with a steadily increasing rapidity. The adaptation, mainly unconscious and almost always unwilling, for man in general hates voluntary change, has lagged more and more behind the alterations in conditions. From the 16th century onward, the history of mankind is a story of political and social institutions becoming more and more plainly mischiefs, less comfortable and more vexatious, and of the slow reluctant realization of the need of a conscious and deliberate reconstruction of the whole scheme of human societies, in the face of needs and possibilities, new to all the former experiences of life. What are these changes in the conditions of human life that have disorganized that balance of empire, priest, peasant, and trader, with periodic refreshment by barbaric conquest, that held human affairs in the old world in a sort of working written for more than a hundred centuries? They are manifold and various, for human affairs are multitudinously complex, but the main changes seem all to turn upon one cause, namely, the growth and extension of a knowledge of the nature of things, beginning first of all in small groups of intelligent people, and spreading at first slowly, and in the last five hundred years very rapidly, to larger and larger proportions of the general population. 
but there has also been a great change in human conditions due to a change in the spirit of human life. This change has gone on side by side with the increase and extension of knowledge, and is subtly connected with it. There has been an increasing disposition to treat a life based on the common and more elementary desires and gratifications as unsatisfactory, and to seek relationship with and service and participation in a larger life. This is the common characteristic of all the great religions that have spread throughout the world in the last twenty-odd centuries, Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam alike. They have had to do with the spirit of man in a way that the older religions did not have to do. They are forces quite different in their nature and effect from the old fetishistic blood-sacrifice religions of priest and temple, that they have in part modified and in part replaced. They have gradually evolved a self-respect in the individual and a sense of participation and responsibility in the common concerns of mankind that did not exist among the populations of the earlier civilizations. The first considerable change in the conditions of political and social life was the simplification and extended use of writing in the ancient civilizations, which made larger empires and wider political understandings practicable and inevitable. The next movement forward came with the introduction of the horse, and later on of the camel as a means of transport, the use of wheeled vehicles, the extension of roads, and the increased military efficiency due to the discovery of terrestrial iron. Then followed the profound economic disturbances due to the device of coined money and the change in the nature of debt, proprietorship and trade due to this convenient but dangerous convention. The empires grew in size and range, and man's ideas grew likewise to correspond with these things. Came the disappearance of local gods, the age of Theocratia, and the teaching of the great world religions. Came also the beginnings of reasoned and recorded history and geography, the first realization by man of his profound ignorance, and the first systematic search for knowledge. For a time, the scientific process which began so brilliantly in Greece and Alexandria was interrupted. The raids of the Titanic barbarians, the westward drive of the Mongolian peoples, convulsive religious reconstruction, and great pestilences put enormous strains upon political and social order. When civilization emerged again from this phase of conflict and confusion, slavery was no longer the basis of economic life, and the first paper mills were preparing a new medium for collective information and cooperation in printed matter. Gradually at this point and that, the search for knowledge, the systematic scientific process was resumed. And now, from the 16th century onward, as an inevitable by-product of systematic thought, appeared a steadily increasing series of inventions and devices affecting the intercommunication and interaction of men with one another. They all tended towards wider range of action, greater mutual benefits or injuries, and increased cooperation, and they came faster and faster. Men's minds had not been prepared for anything of the sort, and until the great catastrophes at the beginning of the twentieth century quickened men's minds, the historian has very little to tell of any intelligently planned attempts to meet the new conditions this increasing flow of inventions was creating. The history of mankind for the last four centuries is rather like that of an imprisoned sleeper, stirring clumsily and uneasily while the prison that restrains and shelters him catches fire, not waking, but incorporating the crackling and warmth of the fire with ancient and incongruous dreams, than like that of a man consciously awake to danger and opportunity. Since history is the story not of individual lives but of communities, it is inevitable 
that the inventions that figure most in the historical record are inventions affecting communications. In the 16th century, the chief new things that we have to note are the appearance of printed paper and the seaworthy, ocean-going sailing ship, using the new device of the mariner's compass. The former cheapened, spread, and revolutionized teaching, public information and discussion, and the fundamental operations of political activity. The latter made the round world one. But almost equally important was the increased utilization in improvement of guns and gunpowder, which the Mongols had first brought westward in the 13th century. This destroyed the practical immunity of barons in their castles and of walled cities. Guns swept away feudalism. Constantinople fell to guns. Mexico and Peru fell before the terror of the Spanish guns. The 17th century saw the development of systematic scientific publication, a less conspicuous but ultimately far more pregnant innovation. Conspicuous among the leaders in this great forward step was Sir Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, to afterwards Lord Verulam, Lord Chancellor of England. He was the pupil and perhaps the mouthpiece of another Englishman, Dr. Gilbert, the experimental philosopher of Colchester, 1540-1603. to This second Bacon, like the first, preached observation and experiment, and he used the inspiring and fruitful form of a utopian story, the New Atlantis, to express his dream of a great service of scientific research. Presently arose the Royal Society of London, the Florentine Society, and later other national bodies for the encouragement of research and the publication and exchange of knowledge. These European scientific societies became fountains, not only of countless inventions, but also of a destructive criticism of the grotesque theological history of the world that had dominated and crippled human thought for many centuries. Neither the 17th nor the 18th century witnessed any innovations so immediately revolutionary in human conditions as printed paper and the ocean-going ship but there was a steady accumulation of knowledge and scientific energy that was to bear its full fruits in the 19th century. The exploration and mapping of the world went on. Tasmania, Australia, New Zealand appeared on the map. In Great Britain in the 18th century, coal coke began to be used for metallurgical purposes, leading to a considerable cheapening of iron and to the possibility of casting and using it in larger pieces than had been possible before, when it had been smelted with wood charcoal. Modern machinery dawned. Like the trees of the celestial city, science bears bud and flower and fruit at the same time and continuously. With the onset of the nineteenth century, the real fruition of science, which indeed henceforth may never cease, began. First came steam and steel, the railway, the great liner, vast bridges and buildings, machinery of almost limitless power, the possibility of a bountiful satisfaction of every material human need, and then, still more wonderful, the hidden treasures of electrical science were open to men. We have compared the political and social life of man from the 16th century onward, to that of a sleeping prisoner who lies and dreams while his prison burns about him. In the 16th century, the European mind was still going on with its Latin imperial dream, its dream of a holy Roman Empire, united under a Catholic Church. But just as some uncontrollable element in our composition will insist at times upon introducing into our dreams the most absurd and destructive comments, so thrust into this dream we find the sleeping face and craving stomach of the Emperor Charles V, while Henry VIII of England and Luther tear the unity of Catholicism to threads. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the dream turned to personal monarchy. 
The history of nearly all Europe during this period tells with variations the story of an attempt to consolidate a monarchy, to make it absolute, and to extend its power over weaker adjacent regions, and of the steady resistance, first of the landowners and then, with the increase of foreign trade and home industry, of the growing trading and moneyed class, to the exaction and interference of the crown. There is no universal victory of either side. Here it is the king who gets the upper hand, while there it is the man of private property who beats the king. In one case we find a king becoming the sun and center of his national world, while just over his borders a sturdy mercantile class maintains a republic. So wide a range of variation shows how entirely experimental what local accidents were all the various governments of this period. A very common figure in these national dramas is the king's minister, often in the still Catholic countries a prelate, who stands behind the king, serves him, and dominates him by his indispensable services. Here, in the limits set to us, it is impossible to tell these various national dramas in detail. The trading folk of Holland went Protestant and Republican, and cast off the rule of Philip II of Spain, the son of the Emperor Charles V. In England, Henry VIII and his minister Wolsey, Queen Elizabeth, and her minister Burley prepared the foundations of an absolutism that was wrecked by the folly of James I and Charles I. Charles I was beheaded for treason to his people, 1649, a new turn in the political thought of Europe. For a dozen years, until 1660, Britain was a republic, and the crown was an unstable power, much overshadowed by Parliament, until George the Third, 1760-1820, made a strenuous and partly successful effort to restore its predominance. The King of France, on the other hand, was the most successful of all the European kings in perfecting monarchy. Two great ministers, Richelieu, 1585-1642, and Mazarin, 1602-1661, built up the power of the crown in that country, and the process was aided by the long reign and very considerable abilities of King Louis XIV, the Grand Monarch, 1643-1715. Louis XIV, was indeed the pattern king of Europe. He was, within his limitations, an exceptionally capable king. His ambition was stronger than his baser passions, and he guided his country towards bankruptcy, through all the complication of a spirited foreign policy, with an elaborate dignity that still extorts our admiration. His immediate desire was to consolidate and extend France to the Rhine and Pyrenees, and to absorb the Spanish Netherlands. His remoter view saw the French kings as the possible successors of Charlemagne in a recast Holy Roman Empire. He made bribery a state method almost more important than warfare. Charles II of England was in his pay, and so were most of the Polish nobility, presently to be described. His money or rather the money of the tax-paying classes in France, went everywhere. But his prevailing occupation was splendor. His great palace at Versailles, with its saloons, its corridors, its mirrors, its terraces and fountains and parks and prospects, was the envy and admiration of the world. He provoked a universal imitation. Every king and princelet in Europe was building his own Versailles, as much beyond his means as his subjects and credits would permit. Everywhere the nobility rebuilt or extended their chateau to the new pattern. A great industry of beautiful and elaborate fabrics and furnishings developed. The luxurious arts flourished everywhere, sculpture in alabaster, faience, gilt woodwork, metalwork, stamped leather, much music, magnificent painting, beautiful printing and bindings, fine crockery, fine vintages. 
amidst the mirrors and fine furniture, went a strange race of gentlemen, in tall powdered wigs, silks and laces, poised upon high red heels, supported by amazing canes, and still more wonderful ladies, under towers of powdered hair, and wearing vast expansions of silk and satin sustained on wire. Through it all postured the great Louis, the son of his world, unaware of the meagre and sulky and bitter faces that watched him from those lower darknesses to which his sunshine did not penetrate. The German people remained politically divided throughout this period of the monarchies and experimental governments, and a considerable number of ducal and princely courts appeared the splendors of Versailles on varying scales. The Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, a devastating scramble among the Germans, Swedes, and Bohemians for fluctuating political advantages, sapped the energies of Germany for a century. A map must show the crazy patchwork in which this struggle ended, a map of Europe according to the Peace of Westphalia, 1648. One sees a tangle of principalities, dukedoms, free states and the like, some partly in and partly out of the empire. Sweden's arm, the reader will note, reached far into Germany, and except for a few islands of territory within the imperial boundaries, France was still far from the Rhine. Amidst this patchwork, the kingdom of Prussia, it became a kingdom in 1701, arose steadily to prominence, and sustained a series of successful wars. Frederick the Great of Prussia, 1740-86, to had his Versailles at Potsdam, where his court spoke French, read French literature, and rivaled the culture of the French king. In 1714, the Elector of Hanover became King of England, adding one more to the list of monarchies, half in and half out of the empire. The Austrian branch of the descendants of Charles V retained the title of emperor, the Spanish branch retained Spain. But now there was also an emperor of the East again. After the fall of Constantinople, 1453, the Grand Duke of Moscow, Ivan the Great, 1462-1505, to claimed to be heir to the Byzantine throne and adopted the Byzantine double-headed eagle upon his arms. His grandson, Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible, 1533-1584, assumed the imperial title of Caesar, Tsar. But only in the latter half of the 17th century did Russia cease to seem remote and Asiatic to the European mind. The Tsar Peter the Great, 1682-1725, brought Russia into the arena of Western affairs. He built a new capital for his empire, Petersburg, upon the Neva, that played the part of a window between Russia and Europe, and he set up his Versailles at Peterhof, eighteen miles away, employing a French architect, who gave him a terrace, fountains, cascades, picture gallery, park, and all the recognized appointments of grand monarchy. In Russia, as in Prussia, French became the language of the court. Unhappily placed between Austria, Prussia, and Russia was the Polish kingdom, an ill-organized state of great landed proprietors, too jealous of their own individual grandeur to permit more than a nominal kingship to the monarch they elected. Her fate was division among these three neighbors, in spite of the efforts of France to retain her as an independent ally. Switzerland at this time was a group of republican cantons, Venice was a republic, Italy like so much of Germany was divided among minor dukes and princes. The Pope ruled like a prince in the papal states, too fearful now of losing the allegiance of the remaining Catholic princes to interfere between them and their subjects, or to remind the world of the common view of Christendom. There remained indeed no common political idea in Europe at all. Europe was given over altogether to division and diversity. 
All these sovereign princes and republics carried on schemes of aggrandizement against each other. Each one of them pursued a foreign policy of aggression against its neighbors and of aggressive alliances. We Europeans still live today in the last phase of this age of the multifarious sovereign states, and still suffer from the hatreds, hostilities, and suspicions it engendered. The history of this time becomes more and more manifestly gossip, more and more unmeaning and wearisome to a modern intelligence. You are told of how this war was caused by this king's mistress, and how the jealousy of one minister for another caused that. A tittle tattle of bribes and rivalries disgusts the intelligent student. The more permanently significant fact is that, in spite of the obstruction of a score of frontiers, reading and thought still spread and increased, and inventions multiplied. The eighteenth century saw the appearance of a literature profoundly skeptical and critical of the courts and policies of the time. In such a book as Voltaire's Candid, we have the expression of an infinite weariness with the planless confusion of the European world. End of chapter 52「53 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 53 the new empires of the Europeans in Asia and overseas. While Central Europe thus remained divided and confused, the Western Europeans, and particularly the Dutch, the Scandinavians, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, and the British, were extending the area of their struggles across the seas of all the world. The printing press had dissolved the political ideas of Europe into a vast, and at first, indeterminate fermentation, but that other great innovation, the ocean-going sailing ship, was inexorably extending the range of European experience to the furthermost limits of salt water. The first overseas settlements of the Dutch and Northern Atlantic Europeans were not for colonization, but for trade and mining. The Spaniards were first in the field, they claimed dominion over the whole of this new world of America. Very soon, however, the Portuguese asked for a share. The Pope, it was one of the last acts of Rome as mistress of the world, divided the new continent between these two first-comers, giving Portugal, Brazil, and everything else east of a line 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands, and all the rest to Spain, 1494. The Portuguese at this time were also pushing overseas enterprise southward and eastward. In 1497, Vasco da Gama had sailed from Lisbon round the Cape to Zanzibar, and then to Calicut in India. In 1515, there were Portuguese ships in Java and the Moluccas, and the Portuguese were setting up and fortifying trading stations round and about the coasts of the Indian Ocean. Mozambique, Goa, and two smaller possessions in India, Macao in China, and a part of Timor are to this day Portuguese possessions. The nations excluded from America by the papal settlement paid little heed to the rights of Spain and Portugal. The English, the Danes and Swedes, and presently the Dutch, were soon staking out claims in North America and the West Indies, and His Most Catholic Majesty of France, heeded the papal settlement as little as any Protestant. The wars of Europe extended themselves to these claims and possessions. In the long run, the English were the most successful in this scramble for overseas possessions. The Danes and Swedes were too deeply entangled in the complicated affairs of Germany to sustain effective expeditions abroad, Sweden was wasted upon the German battlefields by a picturesque king, Gustavus Adolphus, the Protestant Lion of the North. The Dutch were the heirs of such small settlements as Sweden made in America, and the Dutch were too near French aggressions to hold their own against the British. In the Far East, 
The chief rivals for empire were the British, Dutch, and French, and in America the British, French, and Spanish. The British had the supreme advantage of a water frontier, the silver streak of the English Channel against Europe. The tradition of the Latin Empire entangled them least. France had always thought too much in terms of Europe. Throughout the 18th century, she was wasting her opportunities of expansion in West and East alike, in order to dominate Spain, Italy, and the German confusion. The religious and political dissensions of Britain in the 17th century had driven many of the English to seek a permanent home in America. They struck root and increased and multiplied, giving the British a great advantage in the American struggle. In 1756 and 1760, the French lost Canada to the British and their American colonists, and a few years later the British Trading Company found itself completely dominant over French, Dutch, and Portuguese in the peninsula of India. The great Mongol Empire of Babur, Akbar, and their successors had now far gone into decay, and the story of its practical capture by a London trading company, the British East India Company, is one of the most extraordinary episodes in the whole history of conquest. This East India Company had been originally at the time of its incorporation under Queen Elizabeth no more than a company of sea adventurers. Step by step they had been forced to raise troops and arm their ships, and now this trading company, with its tradition of gain, found itself dealing not merely in spices and dyes and tea and jewels, but in the revenues and territories of princes and the destinies of India. It had come to buy and sell, and it found itself achieving a tremendous piracy. There was no one to challenge its proceedings. Is it any wonder that its captains and commanders and officials, nay, even its clerks and common soldiers, came back to England loaded with spoils? Men under such circumstances, with a great and wealthy land at their mercy, could not determine what they might or might not do. It was a strange land to them, with a strange sunlight. Its brown people seemed a different race, outside their range of sympathy. Its mysterious temples sustained fantastic standards of behavior. Englishmen at home were perplexed when presently these generals and officials came back to make dark accusations against each other of extortions and cruelties. Upon Clive Parliament passed a vote of censure, he committed suicide in 1774. In 1788, Warren Hastings, a second great Indian administrator, was impeached and acquitted, 1792. It was a strange and unprecedented situation in the world's history. The English Parliament found itself ruling over a London trading company, which in its turn was dominating an empire far greater and more populous than all the domains of the British crown. To the bulk of the English people India was a remote, fantastic, almost inaccessible land, to which adventurous poor young men went out, to return, after many years, very rich and very choleric old gentlemen. It was difficult for the English to conceive what the life of these countless brown millions in the eastern sunshine could be. Their imaginations declined the task. India remained romantically unreal. It was impossible for the English, therefore, to exert any effective supervision and control over the company's proceedings. And while the Western European powers were thus fighting for these fantastic overseas empires upon every ocean in the world, two great land conquests were in progress in Asia. China had thrown off the Mongol yoke in 1360 and flourished under the great native dynasty of the Mings until 1644. Then the Manchus, another Mongol people, reconquered China and remained masters of China until 1912. Meanwhile, Russia was pushing east and growing to greatness in the world's affairs. The rise of this great central power of the old world which is neither altogether of the East nor altogether of the West, 
is one of the utmost importance to our human destiny. Its expansion is very largely due to the appearance of a Christian steppe people, the Cossacks, who formed a barrier between the feudal agriculture of Poland and Hungary to the west, and the Tartar to the east. The Cossacks were the wild east of Europe, and in many ways not unlike the wild west of the United States in the middle 19th century. All who had made Russia too hot to hold them, criminals as well as the persecuted innocent, rebellious serfs, religious secretaries, thieves, vagabonds, murderers, sought asylum in the southern steppes, and there made a fresh start, and fought for life and freedom against Pole, Russian, and Tartar alike. Doubtless, fugitives from the Tartars to the east also contributed to the Cossack mixture, Slowly these border folk were incorporated in the Russian imperial service, much as the highland clans of Scotland were converted into regiments by the British government. New lands were offered them in Asia. They became a weapon against the dwindling power of the Mongolian nomads, first in Turkestan and then across Siberia, as far as the Amur. The decay of Mongol energy in the 17th and 18th centuries is very difficult to explain. Within two or three centuries from the days of Genghis and Timurlain, Central Asia had relapsed from a period of world ascendancy to extreme political impotence. Changes of climate, unrecorded pestilences, infections of a malarial type may have played their part in this recession which may be only a temporary recession, measured by the scale of universal history, of the Central Asian peoples. Some authorities think that the spread of Buddhist teaching from China also had a pacifying influence upon them. At any rate, by the 16th century, the Mongol, Tartar and Turkish peoples were no longer pressing outward, but were being invaded, subjugated and pushed back, both by Christian Russia in the West and by China in the East. All through the 17th century, the Cossacks were spreading eastward from European Russia and settling wherever they found agricultural conditions. Cordons of forts and stations formed a moving frontier to these settlements to the south, where the Turkomans were still strong and active. To the northeast, however, Russia had no frontier, until she reached right to the Pacific. End of chapter 53thus saw the remarkable and unstable spectacle of a Europe divided against itself, and no longer with any unifying political or religious idea, yet through the immense stimulation of men's imaginations by the printed book, the printed map, and the opportunity of the new ocean-going shipping, able in a disorganized and contentious manner to dominate all the coasts of the world. It was a planless, incoherent abolition of enterprise due to temporary and almost accidental advantages over the rest of mankind. By virtue of these advantages, this new and still largely empty continent of America was peopled mainly from Western European sources, and South Africa and Australia and New Zealand marked down as prospective homes for a European population. The motive that had sent Columbus to America and Vasco da Gama to India was the perennial first motive of all sailors since the beginning of things, trade. But while in the already populous and productive East, the trade motive remained dominant, and the European settlements remained trading settlements, from which the European inhabitants hoped to return home to spend their money, the Europeans in America dealing with communities at a very much lower level of productive activity, found a new inducement for persistence in the search for gold and silver. 
particularly did the mines of Spanish America yield silver. The Europeans had to go to America not simply as armed merchants, but as prospectors, miners, searchers after natural products, and presently as planters. In the north they sought furs. Mines and plantations necessitated settlements. They obliged people to set up permanent overseas homes. Finally, in some cases, as when the English Puritans went to New England in the early 17th century to escape religious persecution, when in the 18th, Oglethorpe sent people from the English debtors' prisons to Georgia, and when in the end of the 18th, the Dutch sent orphans to the Cape of Good Hope, the Europeans frankly crossed the seas to find new homes for good. In the 19th century, and especially after the coming of the steamship, the stream of European immigration to the new empty lands of America and Australia rose from some decades to the scale of a great migration. So there grew up permanent overseas populations of Europeans, and the European culture was transplanted to much larger areas than those in which it had been developed. These new communities bringing a ready-made civilization with them to these new lands grew up, as it were, unplanned and unperceived. The statecraft of Europe did not foresee them, and was unprepared with any ideas about their treatment. The politicians and ministers of Europe continued to regard them as essentially expeditionary establishments, sources of revenue, possessions and dependencies, long after their peoples had developed a keen sense of their separate social life. And also they continued to treat them as helplessly subject to the mother country, long after the population had spread inland, out of reach of any effectual punitive operations from the sea. Because until right into the 19th century, it must be remembered, the link of all these overseas empires was the ocean-going sailing ship. On land, the swiftest thing was still the horse, and the cohesion and unity of political systems on land was still limited by the limitations of horse communications. Now, at the end of the third quarter of the 18th century, the northern two-thirds of North America was under the British crown. France had abandoned America. Except from Brazil, which was Portuguese, and one or two small islands and areas in French, British, Danish, and Dutch hands, Florida, Louisiana, California, and all America to the south was Spanish. It was the British colonies south of Maine and Lake Ontario that first demonstrated the inadequacy of the sailing ship to hold overseas populations together in one political system. These British colonies were very miscellaneous in their origin and character. There were French, Swedish, and Dutch settlements as well as British. There were British Catholics in Maryland and British ultra-Protestants in New England. And while the New Englanders farmed their own land and denounced slavery, the British in Virginia and the South were planters, employing a swelling multitude of imported Negro slaves. There was no natural common unity in such states. To get from one to the other might mean a coasting voyage hardly less tedious than the transatlantic crossing. But the union that diverse origin and natural conditions denied the British Americans was forced upon them by the selfishness and stupidity of the British government in London. They were taxed without any voice in the spending of the taxes. Their trade was sacrificed to British interests. The highly profitable slave trade was maintained by the British government in spite of the opposition of the Virginians, who, though quite willing to hold and use slaves, feared to be swamped by an ever-growing barbaric black population. Britain at that time was lapsing towards an intenser form of monarchy, and the obstinate personality of George III, 1760 to 1820, did much to force on a struggle between the home and the colonial governments. The conflict was precipitated by legislation which favored the London East India Company at the expense of the American shipper. 
three cargoes of tea, which were imported under the new conditions, were thrown overboard in Boston Harbor by a band of men disguised as Indians, 1773. Fighting only began in 1775, when the British government attempted to arrest two of the American leaders at Lexington near Boston. The first shots were fired in Lexington by the British. The first fighting occurred at Concord. So the American War of Independence began, though for more than a year the colonists showed themselves extremely unwilling to sever their links with the motherland. It was not until the middle of 1776 that the Congress of the Insurgent States issued the Declaration of Independence. George Washington, who like many of the leading colonists of the time, had had a military training in the wars against the French, was made commander-in-chief. In 1777, a British general, General Burgoyne, in an attempt to reach New York from Canada, was defeated at Freeman's Farm and obliged to surrender at Saratoga. In the same year, the French and Spanish declared war upon Great Britain, greatly hampering her sea communications. A second British army under General Cornwallis was caught in the Yorktown Peninsula in Virginia and obliged to capitulate in 1781. In 1783, peace was made in Paris, and the thirteen colonies, from Maine to Georgia, became a union of independent sovereign states. So, the United States of America came into existence. Canada remained royal to the British flag. For four years, these states had only a very feeble central government under certain Articles of Confederation, and they seemed destined to break up into separate independent communities. Their immediate separation was delayed by the hostility of the British and a certain aggressiveness on the part of the French, which brought home to them the immediate dangers of division. A constitution was drawn up and ratified in 1788, establishing a more efficient federal government, with a president holding very considerable powers, and the weak sense of national unity was invigorated by a second war with Britain in 1812. Nevertheless, the area covered by the states was so wide and their interests so diverse at that time that, given only the means of communication then available, a disintegration of the Union into separate states on the European scale of size was merely a question of time. Attendance at Washington meant a long, tedious, and insecure journey for the senators and congressmen of the remoter districts, and the mechanical impediments to the diffusion of a common education and a common literature and intelligence were practically insurmountable. Forces were at work in the world, however, that were to arrest the process of differentiation altogether. Presently came the river steamboat, and then the railway and the telegraph to save the United States from fragmentation and weave its dispersed people together again into the first of great modern nations. Twenty-two years later, the Spanish colonies in America were to follow the example of the Thirteen and break their connection with Europe. But being more dispersed over the continent and separated by great mountainous chains and deserts and forests, and by the Portuguese Empire of Brazil, they did not achieve a union among themselves. They became a constellation of republican states, very prone at first to wars among themselves and to revolutions. Brazil followed a rather different line towards the inevitable separation. In 1807, the French armies under Napoleon had occupied the mother country of Portugal, and the monarchy had fled to Brazil. From that time on, until they separated, Portugal was rather a dependency of Brazil than Brazil of Portugal. In 1822, Brazil declared itself a separate empire under Pedro I, a son of the Portuguese king. But the New World has never been very favorable to monarchy. In 1889, the emperor of Brazil was shipped off quietly to Europe, and the United States of Brazil 
fell into line with the rest of Republican America. End of chapter 54「Chapter 55 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 55. The French Revolution and the Restoration of Monarchy in France. Britain had hardly lost the thirteen colonies in America before a profound social and political convulsion at the very heart of Grand Monarchy was to remind Europe, still more vividly, of the essentially temporary nature of the political arrangements of the world. We have said that the French monarchy was the most successful of the personal monarchies in Europe. It was the envy and model of a multitude of competing and minor courts. But it flourished on a basis of injustice that led to its dramatic collapse. It was brilliant and aggressive, but it was wasteful of the life and substance of its common people. The clergy and nobility were protected from taxation by a system of exemption that threw the whole burden of the state upon the middle and lower classes. The peasants were ground down by taxation. The middle classes were dominated and humiliated by the nobility. In 1787, this French monarchy found itself bankrupt and obliged to call representatives of the different classes of the realm into consultation upon the perplexities of defective income and excessive expenditure. In 1789, the States General, a gathering of the nobles, clergy, and commons, roughly equivalent to the earlier form of the British Parliament, was called together at Versailles. It had not assembled since 1610. For all that time, France had been an absolute monarchy. Now the people found a means of expressing their long-fermenting discontent. Disputes immediately broke out between the three estates, due to the resolve of the third estate, the commons, to control the assembly. The commons got the better of these disputes, and the states general became a national assembly, clearly resolved to keep the crown in order, as the British Parliament kept the British crown in order. The king... Louis the Sixteenth, prepared for a struggle and brought up troops from the provinces, whereupon Paris and France revolted. The collapse of the absolute monarchy was very swift. The grim-looking prison of the Bastille was stormed by the people of Paris, and the insurrection spread rapidly throughout France. In the east and northwest provinces, many chateaux belonging to the nobility were burned by the peasants their title deeds carefully destroyed, and the owners murdered or driven away. In a month, the ancient and decayed system of the aristocratic order had collapsed. Many of the leading princes and courtiers of the Queen's party fled abroad. A provisional city government was set up in Paris and in most of the other large cities, and a new armed force, the National Guard, a force designed primarily and plainly, to resist the forces of the crown, was brought into existence by these municipal bodies. The National Assembly found itself called upon to create a new political and social system for a new age. It was a task that tried the powers of that gathering to the utmost. It made a great sweep of the chief injustices of the absolutist regime, it abolished tax exemptions, serfdom, aristocratic titles and privileges, and sought to establish a constitutional monarchy in Paris. The king abandoned Versailles and its splendors, and kept a diminished state in the palace of the Tuileries in Paris. For two years it seemed that the National Assembly might struggle through to an effective, modernized government. Much of its work was sound and still endures if much was experimental and had to be undone. Much was ineffective. There was a clearing up of the penal code. Torture, arbitrary imprisonment and persecutions for heresy were abolished. The ancient provinces of France, Normandy, Burgundy and the like, gave place to eighty departments. 
promotion to the highest ranks in the army was laid open to men of every class. An excellent and simple system of law courts was set up, but its value was much vitiated by having the judges appointed by popular election for short periods of time. This made the crowd a sort of final court of appeal, and the judges, like the members of the assembly, were forced to play to the gallery. And the whole vast property of the church was seized and administered by the state. Religious establishments not engaged in education or works of charity were broken up, and the salaries of the clergy made a charge upon the nation. This in itself was not a bad thing, for the lower clergy in France, who were often scandalously underpaid in comparison with the richer dignitaries. But in addition, the choice of priests and bishops was made elective, which struck at the very root idea of the Roman Church, which centered everything upon the Pope, and in which all authority is from above downward. Practically, the National Assembly wanted at one blow to make the Church in France Protestant, in organization if not in doctrine. Everywhere there were disputes and conflicts between the state priests, created by the National Assembly, and the recalcitrant, non-juring priests who were loyal to Rome. In 1791, the experiment of constitutional monarchy in France was brought to an abrupt end by the action of the king and queen, working in concert with their aristocratic and monarchist friends abroad. Foreign armies gathered on the eastern frontier, and one night in June, the king and queen and their children slipped away from the Tuileries and fled to join the foreigners and the aristocratic exiles. They were caught at Varennes and brought back to Paris, and in France flamed up into a passion of patriotic republicanism. A republic was proclaimed, open war with Austria and Prussia ensued, and the king was tried and executed, January 1793, on the model already set by England for treason to his people. And now followed a strange phase in the history of the French people. There arose a great flame of enthusiasm for France and the Republic. There was to be an end to compromise at home and abroad. At home, royalists and every form of disloyalty were to be stamped out. Abroad, France was to be the protector and helper of all revolutionaries. All Europe, all the world, was to become republican. The youth of France poured into the republican armies. A new and wonderful song spread through the land. A song that still warms the blood like wine, the Marseillaise. Before that chant and the leaping columns of French bayonets and their enthusiastically served guns, the foreign armies rolled back. Before the end of 1792, the French armies had gone far beyond the utmost achievements of Louis XIV. Everywhere they stood on foreign soil. They were in Brussels. They had overrun Savoy. They had raided to Mayence. They had seized the Scheldt from Holland. Then the French government did an unwise thing. It had been exasperated by the expulsion of its representative from England upon the execution of Louis, and it declared war against England. It was an unwise thing to do, because the revolution which had given France a new enthusiastic infantry and a brilliant artillery, released from its aristocratic officers and many cramping conditions, had destroyed the discipline of the navy, and the English were supreme upon the sea. And this provocation united all England against France, whereas there had been at first a very considerable liberal movement in Great Britain in sympathy with the revolution. Of the fight that France made in the next few years against the European coalition, we cannot tell in any detail. She drew the Austrians forever out of Belgium and made Holland a republic. The Dutch fleet, frozen in a Texel, surrendered to a handful of cavalry without firing its guns. For some time the French thrust towards Italy was hung up, and it was only in 1796 that a new general, Napoleon Bonaparte, led the ragged and hungry republican armies 
in triumph across Piedmont to Mantua and Verona, says C. F. Atkinson. What astonished the Allies most of all was the number and the velocity of the Republicans. These improvised armies had in fact nothing to delay them. Tents were unprocurable for want of money, and transportable for want of the enormous number of wagons that would have been required, and also unnecessary for the discomfort that would have caused wholesale desertion in professional armies, was cheerfully borne by the men of 1793-94. Supplies for armies of then unheard of size could not be carried in convoys, and the French soon became familiar with living on the country. Thus, 1793 saw the birth of the modern system of war, rapidity of movement, full development of national strength, bivouacs, requisitions, and force, as against cautious maneuvering, small professional armies, tents and full rations, and chickeny. The first represented the decision-compelling spirit, the second, the spirit of risking little to gain a little. And while these ragged hosts of enthusiasts were chanting the Marseillaise and fighting for La France, manifestly never quite clear in their minds whether they were looting or liberating the countries into which they poured, the republican enthusiasm in Paris was spending itself in a far less glorious fashion. The revolution was now under the sway of a fanatical leader, Robespierre. This man is difficult to judge. He was a man of poor physique, naturally timid, and a prig but he had that most necessary gift for power, faith. He set himself to save the Republic as he conceived it, and he imagined it could be saved by no other man than he, so that to keep in power was to save the Republic. The living spirit of the Republic, it seemed, had sprung from the slaughter of royalists and the execution of the king. There were insurrections, one in the west, in the district of Lavendi, where the people rose against the conscription and against the dispossession of the orthodox clergy, and were led by noblemen and priests, one in the south, where Lyons and Marcellus had risen, and the royalists of Toulon had admitted an English and Spanish garrison, to which there seemed no more effectual reply than to go on killing royalists. The revolutionary tribunal went to work, and a steady slaughtering began. The invention of the guillotine was opportune to this mood. The queen was guillotined, most of Robespierre's antagonists were guillotined. Atheists who argued that there was no supreme being were guillotined. Day by day, week by week, this infernal new machine chopped off heads and more heads and more. The reign of Robespierre lived, it seemed, on blood, and needed more and more as an opium-taker needs more and more opium. Finally, in the summer of 1794, Robespierre himself was overthrown and guillotined. He was succeeded by a directory of five men which carried on the war of defense abroad and held France together at home for five years. Their reign formed a curious interlude in this history of violent changes. They took things as they found them, the propagandist zeal of the revolution carried the French armies into Holland, Belgium, Switzerland, South Germany and North Italy. Everywhere kings were expelled and republics set up. But such propagandist zeal as animated the directorate did not prevent the looting of the treasures of the liberated peoples to relieve the financial embarrassment of the French government. Their wars became less and less the holy wars of freedom, and more and more like the aggressive wars of the ancient regime. The last feature of grand monarchy that France was disposed to discard was her tradition of foreign policy. One discovers it still as vigorous under the directorate as if there had been no revolution. Unhappily for France and the world, a man arose who embodied in its intensest form this national egotism of the French. He gave that country ten years of glory, 
and the humiliation of a final defeat. This was that same Napoleon Bonaparte who had led the armies of the Directory to victory in Italy. Throughout the five years of the Directorate, he had been scheming and working for self-advancement. Gradually he clambered to supreme power. He was a man of severely limited understanding, but of ruthless directness and great energy. He had begun life as an extremist of the school of Robespierre. He owed his first promotion to that side. But he had no real grasp of the new forces that were working in Europe. His utmost political imagination carried him to a belated, untoldry attempt to restore the Western Empire. He tried to destroy the remains of the old, Holy Roman Empire, intending to replace it by a new one centering upon Paris. The emperor in Vienna ceased to be the Holy Roman Emperor and became simply Emperor of Austria. Napoleon divorced his French wife in order to marry an Austrian princess. He became practically monarch of France as first consul in 1799, and he made himself emperor of France in 1804, in direct imitation of Charlemagne. He was crowned by the Pope in Paris, taking the crown from the Pope and putting it upon his own head, himself, as Charlemagne had directed. His son was crowned King of Rome. For some years Napoleon's reign was a career of victory. He conquered most of Italy and Spain, defeated Prussia and Austria, and dominated all Europe west of Russia. But he never won the command of the sea from the British, and his fleet sustained a conclusive defeat inflicted by the British Admiral Nelson at Trafalgar, 1805. Spain rose against him in 1808, and a British army under Wellington thrust the French army slowly northward out of the peninsula. In 1811, Napoleon came into conflict with the Tsar Alexander I, and in 1812 he invaded Russia with a great conglomerate army of 1,600,000 men that was defeated and largely destroyed by the Russians and the Russian winter. Germany rose against him. Sweden turned against him. The French armies were beaten back, and at Fontainebleau, Napoleon abdicated, 1814. He was exiled to Elba, returned to France for one last effort in 1815, and was defeated by the Allied British, Belgians and Prussians at Waterloo. He died a British prisoner at St. Helena in 1821. The forces released by the French Revolution were wasted and finished. A great congress of the victorious allies met at Vienna to restore, as far as possible, the state of affairs that the great storm had run to pieces. For nearly forty years a sort of peace, a peace of exhausted effort, was maintained in Europe. End of chapter 55「Chapter 56 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 56 The Uneasy Peace in Europe that Followed the Fall of Napoleon Two main causes prevented that period from being a complete social and international peace, and prepared the way for the cycle of wars between 1854 and 1871. The first of these was the tendency of the royal courts concerned towards the restoration of unfair privilege and interference with freedom of thought and writing and teaching. The second was the impossible system of boundaries drawn up by the diplomatists of Vienna. The inherent disposition of monarchy to march back towards past conditions was first and most particularly manifest in Spain. Here, even the Inquisition was restored. Across the Atlantic, the Spanish colonies had followed the example of the United States and revolted against the European great power system, when Napoleon set his brother Joseph on the Spanish throne in 1810. 
the George Washington of South America was General Bolivar. Spain was unable to suppress this revolt. It dragged on much as the United States War of Independence had dragged on, and at last the suggestion was made by Austria, in accordance with the spirit of the Holy Alliance, that the European monarch should assist Spain in this struggle. This was opposed by Britain in Europe, but it was the prompt action of President Monroe of the United States in 1823 which conclusively warned off this projected monarchist restoration. He announced that the United States would regard any extension of the European system in the Western Hemisphere as a hostile act. Thus arose the Monroe Doctrine, the doctrine that there must be no extension of extra-American government in America, which has kept the great power system out of America for nearly a hundred years, and permitted the new states of Spanish America to work out their destinies along their own lines. But if Spanish monarchism lost its colonies, it could at least, under the protection of the consort of Europe, do what it chose in Europe. A popular insurrection in Spain was crushed by French army in 1823, with a mandate from a European Congress, and simultaneously Austria suppressed a revolution in Naples. In 1824, Louis XVIII died, and was succeeded by Charles X. Charles set himself to destroy the liberty of the press and universities, and to restore absolute government. The sum of billion francs was voted to compensate the nobles for the chateau burnings and sequestrations of 1789. In 1830, Paris rose against this embodiment of the ancient regime and replaced him by Louis Philippe, the son of that Philippe, Duke of Orleans, who was executed during the Terror. The other continental monarchies, in face of the open approval of the revolution by Great Britain and a strong liberal ferment in Germany and Austria, did not interfere in this affair. After all, France was still a monarchy. This man, Louis Philippe, 1830-1848, remained the constitutional king of France for eighteen years. Such were the uneasy swayings of the peace of the Congress of Vienna, which were provoked by the reactionary proceedings of the monarchists. The stresses that arose from the unscientific boundaries planned by the diplomatists of Vienna gathered forth more deliberately, but... They were even more dangerous to the peace of mankind. It is extraordinarily inconvenient to administer together the affairs of peoples, speaking different languages, and so reading different literatures and having different general ideas, especially if those differences are exacerbated by religious disputes. Only some strong mutual interest such as the common defensive needs of the Swiss mountaineers, can justify a close linking of peoples, of dissimilar languages and faith. And even in Switzerland there is the utmost local autonomy. When, as in Macedonia, populations are mixed in a patchwork of villages and districts, the cantonal system is imperatively needed. But if the reader will look at the map of Europe as the Congress of Vienna drew it, he will see that this gathering seems almost as if it had planned the maximum of local exasperation. It destroyed the Dutch Republic. Quite needlessly, it lumped together the Protestant Dutch with the French-speaking Catholics of the old Spanish-Austrian Netherlands and set up a kingdom of the Netherlands. It handed over not merely the old Republic of Venice, but all of North Italy as far as Milan, to the German-speaking Austrians. French-speaking Savoy, it combined with pieces of Italy to restore the kingdom of Sardinia. Austria and Hungary, already a sufficiently explosive mixture of discordant nationalities, Germans, Hungarians, Czechoslovaks, Yugoslavs, Romanians and now Italians, was made still more impossible by confirming Austria's Polish acquisitions of 1772 and 1795. The Catholic and Republican-spirited Polish people were chiefly given over 
to the less civilized rule of the Greek Orthodox Tsar, but important districts went to Protestant Prussia. The Tsar was also confirmed in his acquisition of the entirely alien Finns. The very dissimilar Norwegian and Swedish peoples were bound together under one king. Germany, the reader will see, was left in a particularly dangerous state of muddle. Prussia and Austria were both partly in and partly out of a German confederation, which included a multitude of minor states. The king of Denmark came into the German confederation by virtue of certain German-speaking possessions in Holstein. Luxembourg was included in the German confederation, though its ruler was also king of the Netherlands, and though many of its peoples talked French. Here was a complete disregard of the fact that the people who talk German and base their ideas on German literature, the people who talk Italian and base their ideas on Italian literature, and the people who talk Polish and base their ideas on Polish literature, will all be far better off and most helpful and least obnoxious to the rest of mankind if they conduct their own affairs, in their own idiom, within the ring fence of their own speech. Is it any wonder that one of the most popular songs in Germany during this period declared that wherever the German tongue was spoken, there was the German fatherland? In 1830, French-speaking Belgium, stirred up by the current revolution in France, revolted against its Dutch association in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The powers, terrified at the possibilities of a republic or of annexation to France, hurried in to pacify this situation and gave the Belgians a monarch, Leopold I of saxe coburg gotha There were also ineffectual revolts in Italy and Germany in 1830, and a much more serious one in Russian Poland. A Republican government held out in Warsaw for a year against Nicholas I, who succeeded Alexander in 1825, and was then stamped out of existence with great violence and cruelty. The Polish language was banned, and the Greek Orthodox Church was substituted for the Roman Catholic as the state religion. In 1821, there was an insurrection of the Greeks against the Turks, for six years they fought a desperate war, while the governments of Europe looked on. Liberal opinion protested against this inactivity. Volunteers from every European country joined the insurgents, and at last Britain, France, and Russia took joint action. The Turkish fleet was destroyed by the French and English at the Battle of Navarino, 1827, and the Tsar invaded Turkey. By the Treaty of Adrianople, 1829, Greece was declared free, but she was not permitted to resume her ancient republican traditions. A German king was found for Greece, one Prince Otto of Bavaria, and Christian governors were set up in the Danubian provinces, which are now Romania and Serbia, a part of the Jugoslav region. Much blood had still to run, however, before the Turk was altogether expelled from these lands. End of chapter 56chapter 57 of a short history of the world by h g wells this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 57 the development of material knowledge throughout the 17th and 18th centuries and the opening years of the 19th century while these conflicts of the powers and princes were going on in europe and the patchwork of the treaty of westphalia 1648 was changing kaleidoscopically into the patchwork of the Treaty of Vienna, 1815, and while the sailing ship was spreading European influence throughout the world, a steady growth of knowledge and the general clearing up of men's ideas about the world in which they lived was in progress in the European and Europeanized world. It went on disconnected from political life, and producing throughout the 17th and 18th centuries no striking immediate results in political life. 
nor was it affecting popular thought very profoundly during this period. These reactions were to come later, and only in their full force in the latter half of the 19th century. It was a process that went on chiefly in a small world of prosperous and independent-spirited people. Without what the English call the private gentleman, the scientific process could not have begun in Greece and could not have been renewed in Europe. The universities played a part, but not a leading part, in the philosophical and scientific thought of this period. Endowed learning is apt to be timid and conservative learning, lacking in initiative and resistant to innovation, unless it has the spur of contact with independent minds. We have already noted the formation of the Royal Society in 1662 and its work in realizing the dream of Bacon's New Atlantis. Throughout the 18th century, there was much clearing up of general ideas about matter and motion, much mathematical advance, a systematic development of the use of optical glass in microscope and telescope, a renewed energy in classificatory natural history, a great revival of anatomical science. The science of geology, foreshadowed by Aristotle and anticipated by Leonardo da Vinci, 1452-1519, began its great task of interpreting the record of the rocks. The progress of physical science reacted upon metallurgy, improved metallurgy, affording the possibility of a larger and bolder handling of masses of metal and other materials, reacted upon practical inventions. Machinery on a new scale and in a new abundance appeared to revolutionize industry. In 1804, Trevichek adapted the Watt engine to transport and made the first locomotive. In 1825, the first railway between Stockton and Darlington was opened, and Stephenson's rocket, with a 13-ton train, got up to a speed of 44 miles per hour. From 1830 onward, railways multiplied. By the middle of the century, a network of railways had spread all over Europe. Here was a sudden change in what had been long a fixed condition of human life, the maximum rate of land transport. After the Russian disaster, Napoleon traveled from near Vilna to Paris in 312 hours. This was a journey of about 1,400 miles. He was traveling with every conceivable advantage, and he averaged under 5 miles an hour. An ordinary traveler could not have done this distance in twice the time. These were about the same maximum rates of travel as held good between Rome and Gaul in the first century A.D. Then, suddenly, came this tremendous change. The railway reduced this journey for an any ordinary traveler to less than 48 hours. That is to say, they reduced the chief European distances to about a tenth of what they had been. They made it possible to carry out administrative work in areas ten times as great as any that had hitherto been workable under one administration. The full significance of that possibility in Europe still remains to be realized. Europe is still netted in boundaries drawn in the horse and road era. In America, the effects were immediate. To the United States of America, sprawling westward, it meant the possibility of a continuous access to Washington, however far the frontier traveled across the continent. It meant unity, sustained on a scale that would otherwise have been impossible. The steamboat was, if anything, a little ahead of the steam engine in its earlier phases. There was a steamboat, the Charlotte Dundas, on the Firth of Clyde Canal in 1802, and in 1807, an American named Fulton had a steamer, the Clermont, with British-built engines upon the Hudson River above New York. The first steamship to put to sea was also an American, the Phoenix, which went from New York, Hoboken, to Philadelphia. So, too, was the first ship using steam. She also had sails to cross the Atlantic, the Savannah, 1819. 
All these were paddle-wheel boats, and paddle-wheel boats are not adapted to work in heavy seas. The paddles smash too easily, and the boat is then disabled. The screw steamship followed rather slowly. Many difficulties had to be surmounted before the screw was a practical thing. Not until the middle of the century did the tonnage of steamships upon the sea begin to overhaul that of sailing ships. After that, the evolution in sea transport was rapid. For the first time, men began to cross the seas and oceans with some certainty as to the date of their arrival. The transatlantic crossing, which had been an uncertain adventure of several weeks, which might stretch to months, was accelerated, until in 1910 it was brought down, in the case of the fastest boats, to under five days, with a practically notifiable hour of arrival. Concurrently with the development of steam transport upon land and sea, a new and striking addition to the facilities of human intercourse arose out of the investigations of Volta, Galvani, and Faraday into various electrical phenomena. The electric telegraph came into existence in 1835. The first underseas cable was laid in 1851 between France and England. In a few years, the telegraph system had spread over the civilized world, and news, which had hitherto traveled slowly from point to point, became practically simultaneous throughout the earth. These things, the steam railway and the electric telegraph, were to the popular imagination of the middle 19th century the most striking and revolutionary of inventions. But they were only the most conspicuous and clumsy first fruits of a far more extensive process. Technical knowledge and skill were developing with an extraordinary rapidity and to an extraordinary extent measured by the progress of any previous age. Far less conspicuous at first in everyday life, but finally far more important, was the extension of man's power over various structural materials. Before the middle of the 18th century, iron was reduced from its ores by means of wood charcoal, was handled in small pieces and hammered and wrought into shape. It was material for a craftsman. Quality and treatment were enormously dependent upon the experience and sagacity of the individual iron worker. The largest masses of iron that could be dealt with under those conditions amounted at most, in the 16th century, to two or three tons. There was a very definite upward limit, therefore, to the size of cannon. The blast furnace rose in the 18th century and developed with the use of coke. Not before the 18th century do we find rolled sheet iron, 1728, unrolled rods and bars, 1783. Nasmus steam hammer came as late as 1838. The ancient world, because of its metallurgical inferiority, could not use steam. The steam engine, even the primitive pumping engine, could not be developed before sheet iron was available. The early engines seemed to the modern eye very pitiful and clumsy bits of ironmongery, but they were the utmost that the metallurgical science of the time could do. As light as 1856 came the Bessemer process, and presently, 1864, the open hearth process, in which steel and every sort of iron could be melted, purified and cast, in a manner and upon a scale hitherto unheard of. Today, in the electric furnace, one may see tons of incandescent steel swirling about like boiling milk in a saucepan. Nothing in the previous practical advances of mankind is comparable in its consequences to the complete mastery over enormous masses of steel and iron, and over their texture and quality, which man has now achieved. The railways and early engines of all sorts were the mere first triumphs of the new metallurgical methods. Presently came ships of iron and steel, vast bridges, and a new way of building with steel upon a gigantic scale. Men realized too late that they had planned their railways with far too timid a gorge, 
that they could have organized their traveling with far more steadiness and comfort upon a much bigger scale. Before the 19th century, there were no ships in the world much over 2,000 tons burden. Now there is nothing wonderful about a 50,000-ton liner. There are people who sneer at this kind of progress as being a progress in mere size, but that sort of sneering merely marks the intellectual limitations of those who indulge in it. The great ship or the steel frame building is not, as they imagine, a magnified version of the small ship or building of the past. It is a thing different in kind, more lightly and strongly built, of finer and stronger materials. Instead of being a thing of precedent and rule of thumb, it is a thing of subtle and intricate calculation. In the old house or ship, matter was dominant, the material and its needs had to be slavishly obeyed. In the new, matter had been captured, changed, coerced. Think of the coal and iron and sand, dragged out of the banks and pits, wrenched, wrought, molten and cast, to be flung at last, a slender, glittering pinnacle of steel and glass, six hundred feet above the crowded city. We have given these particulars of the advance in man's knowledge of the metallurgy of steel and its results by way of illustration. A parallel story could be told of the metallurgy of copper and tin, and of a multitude of metals, nickel and aluminium to name but two, unknown before the nineteenth century dawned. It is in this great and growing mastery over substances, over different sorts of glass, over rocks and plasters and the like, over colors and textures, that the main triumphs of the mechanical revolution have thus far been achieved. Yet we are still in the stage of the first fruits in the matter. We have the power, but we have still to learn how to use our power. Many of the first employments of these gifts of science have been vulgar, tawdry, stupid or horrible. The artist and the adapter have still hardly begun to work, with the endless variety of substances now at their disposal. Parallel with this extension of mechanical possibilities, the new science of electricity grew up. It was only in the 80s of the 19th century that this body of inquiry began to yield results to impress the vulgar mind. Then suddenly came electrical light and electric traction and the transmutation of forces the possibility of sending power that could be changed into mechanical motion or light or heat, as one choose, along a copper wire, as water is sent along a pipe, began to come through to the ideas of ordinary people. The British and French were at first the leading peoples in this great proliferation of knowledge, but presently the Germans, who had learned humility under Napoleon, showed such zeal and pertinacity in scientific inquiry as to overhaul these leaders. British science was largely the creation of Englishmen and Scotchmen working outside the ordinary centers of erudition. The universities of Britain were at this time in a state of educational retrogression, largely given over to a pedantic conning of the Latin and Greek classics. French education, too, was dominated by the classical tradition of the Jesuit schools, and consequently it was not difficult for the Germans to organize a body of investigators, small indeed in relation to the possibilities of the case, but large in proportion to the little band of British and French inventors and experimentalists. And though this work of research and experiment was making Britain and France the most rich and powerful countries in the world, it was not making scientific and inventive men rich and powerful. There is a necessary onwardliness about a sincere scientific man. He is too preoccupied with his research to plan and scheme how to make money out of it. The economic exploitation of his discoveries falls very easily and naturally, therefore, into the hands of a more acquisitive type. And so we find that the crops of rich men which every fresh phase of scientific and technical progress has produced in Great Britain, though they have not displayed quite the same passionate desire to insult and kill the goose 
that laid the national golden eggs, as the scholastic and clerical professions, have been quite content to let that profitable creature starve. Inventors and discoverers come by nature, they thought, for cleverer people to profit by. In this matter the Germans were a little wiser. The German learned did not display the same vehement hatred of the new learning. They permitted its development. The German businessman and manufacturer, again, had not quite the same contempt of the man of science as had his British competitor. Knowledge, these Germans believed, might be a cultivated crop, responsive to fertilizers. They did concede, therefore, a certain amount of opportunity to the scientific mind. Their public expenditure on scientific work was relatively greater, and this expenditure was abundantly rewarded. By the latter half of the 19th century, the German scientific worker had made German a necessary language for every science student who wished to keep abreast with the latest work in his department, and in certain branches, and particularly in chemistry, Germany acquired a very great superiority over her western neighbors. The scientific effort of the 60s and 70s in Germany began to tell after the 80s, and the German gained steadily upon Britain and France in technical and industrial prosperity. A fresh phase in the history of invention opened when in the 80s a new type of engine came into use, an engine in which the expansive force of an explosive mixture replaced the expansive force of steam. The light, highly efficient engines that were thus made possible were applied to the automobile and developed at last to reach such a pitch of lightness and efficiency as to render flight long known to be possible, a practical achievement. A successful flying machine, but not a machine large enough to take up a human body, was made by Professor Langley of the Smithsonian Institute of Washington as early as 1897. By 1909, the aeroplane was available for human locomotion. There had seemed to be a pause in the increase of human speed with the perfection of railways and automobile road traction, but with the flying machine came fresh reductions in the effective distance between one point of the Earth's surface and another. In the 18th century, the distance from London to Edinburgh was an eight days journey. In 1918, the British Civil Air Transport Commission reported that the journey from London to Melbourne, halfway round the Earth, would probably in a few years' time be accomplished in that same period of eight days. Too much stress must not be laid upon these striking reductions in the time distances of one place from another. They are merely one aspect of a much profounder and more momentous enlargement of human possibility. The science of agriculture, and agricultural chemistry, for instance, made quite parallel advances during the 19th century. Men learned so to fertilize the soil as to produce quadruple and quintuple of crops got from the same area in the 17th century. There was a still more extraordinary advance in medical science. The average duration of life rose, the daily efficiency increased, the waste of life through ill health diminished. Now here altogether we have such a change in human life as to constitute a fresh phase of history. In a little more than a century, this mechanical revolution has been brought about. In that time, man made a stride in the material conditions of his life vaster than he had done during the whole long interval between the Paleolithic stage and the age of cultivation, or between the days of Pepe in Egypt and those of George the Third, A new gigantic material framework for human affairs has come into existence. Clearly, it demands great readjustments of our social, economical, and political methods, but these readjustments have necessarily waited upon the development of the mechanical revolution, and they are still only in their opening stage today. End of chapter 57
Chapter Fifty Eight of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifty Eight: The Industrial Revolution. There is a tendency in many histories to confuse together what we have here called the mechanical revolution, which was an entirely new thing in human experience, arising out of the development of organized science. A new step, like the invention of agriculture or the discovery of metals, was something else, quite different in its origins, something for which there was already on historical precedent the social and financial development, which is called the Industrial Revolution. The two processes were going on together. They were constantly reacting upon each other, but they were in root and essence different. There would have been an industrial revolution of sorts if there had been no coal, no steam, no machinery, but in that case it would probably have followed far more closely upon the lines of the social and financial developments of the later years of the Roman Republic. It would have repeated the story of dispossessed free cultivators, gang labor, great estates, great financial fortunes. And a socially destructive financial process. Even the factory method came before power and machinery. Factories were the product not of machinery, but of the division of labor. Drilled and sweated workers were making such things as millinery cardboard boxes and furniture, and coloring maps and book illustrations and so forth, before even water wheels had been used for industrial purposes. There were factories in Rome in the days of Augustus. New books, for instance, were dictated to rows of copyists in the factories of the booksellers. The attentive student of Defoe and of the political pamphlets of Fielding will realize that the idea of herding poor people into establishments to work collectively for their living was already current in Britain before the close of the seventeenth century. There are intimations of it even as early as Moore's Utopia, 1516. It was a social and not a mechanical development. Up to past the middle of the 18th century, the social and economic history of Western Europe was in fact retreading the path along which the Roman state had gone in the last three centuries B.C. But the political disunions of Europe the political convulsions against monarchy, the recalcitrance of the common folk, and perhaps also the greater accessibility of the Western European intelligence to mechanical ideas and inventions, turned the process into quite novel directions. Ideas of human solidarity, thanks to Christianity, were far more widely diffused in the newer European world. Political power was not so concentrated, and the man of energy, anxious to get rich, turned his mind, therefore, very willingly, from the ideas of the slave and of gang labor, to the idea of mechanical power and the machine. The mechanical revolution, the process of mechanical invention and discovery, was a new thing in human experience, and it went on, regardless of the social, political, economic and industrial consequences it might produce. The Industrial Revolution, on the other hand, like most other human affairs, was and is more and more profoundly changed, and deflected by the constant variation in human conditions caused by the mechanical revolution. And the essential difference between the amassing of riches, the extinction of small farmers and small businessmen, and the phase of big finance in the latter centuries of the Roman Republic on the one hand, and the very similar concentration of capital in the 18th and 19th centuries on the other, lies in the profound difference in the character of labor that the mechanical revolution was bringing about. The power of the old world was human power. Everything depended ultimately upon the driving power of human muscle, the muscle of ignorant and subjugated men. A little animal muscle supplied by draught oxen, horse traction and the like contributed. When a weight had to be lifted, 
men lifted it. When a rock had to be quarried, men chipped it out. Where a field had to be ploughed, men and oxen ploughed it. The Roman equivalent of the steamship was the galley, with its bank of sweating rowers. A vast proportion of mankind in the early civilizations were employed in purely mechanical drudgery. At its onset, power-driven machinery did not seem to promise any release from such unintelligent toil. Great gangs of men were employed in excavating canals, in making railway cuttings and embankments and the like. The number of miners increased enormously, but the extension of facilities and the output of commodities increased much more, and as the nineteenth century went on, the plain logic of the new situation asserted itself more clearly. Human beings were no longer wanted as a source of mere indiscriminate power. What could be done mechanically by a human being could be done faster and better by a machine. The human being was needed now only where choice and intelligence had to be exercised. Human beings were wanted only as human beings. The drudge, on whom all the previous civilizations had rested, the creature of mere obedience, the man whose brains were superfluous, had become unnecessary to the welfare of mankind. This was as true of such ancient industries as agriculture and mining, as it was of the newest metallurgical processes. For ploughing, sowing and harvesting, swift machines came forward to do the work of scores of men. The Roman civilization was built upon cheap and degraded human beings. Modern civilization is being rebuilt upon cheap mechanical power. For a hundred years power has been getting cheaper and labor dearer. If, for a generation or so, Machinery has had to wait its turn in the mine. It is simply because, for a time, men were cheaper than machinery. Now here was a changeover of quite primary importance in human affairs. The chief solicitude of the rich and of the ruler in the old civilization had been to keep up a supply of drudges. As the nineteenth century went on, it became more and more plain to the intelligent, directive people that the common man had now to be something better than a drudge. He had to be educated, if only to secure industrial efficiency. He had to understand what he was about. From the days of the first Christian propaganda, popular education had been smoldering in Europe, just as it had smoldered in Asia, wherever Islam had set its foot, because of the necessity of making the believer understand a little of the belief by which he is saved, and of enabling him to read a little in the sacred books by which his belief is conveyed. Christian controversies, with their competition for adherence, ploughed the ground for the harvest of popular education. In England, for instance, by the thirties and forties of the nineteenth century, the disputes of the sects and the necessity of catching adherents young had produced a series of competing educational organizations for children, the church national schools, the dissenting British schools, and even Roman Catholic elementary schools. The second half of the 19th century was a period of rapid advance in popular education throughout all the westernized world. There was no parallel advance in the education of the upper classes, some advance, no doubt, but nothing to correspond. And so, the great gulf that had divided that world hitherto into the readers and the non-reading mass became little more than a slightly perceptible difference in educational level. At the back of this process was the mechanical revolution, apparently regardless of social conditions, but really insisting inexorably upon the complete abolition of a totally illiterate class throughout the world. The economic revolution of the Roman Republic had never been clearly apprehended by the common people of Rome. The ordinary Roman citizen never saw the changes through which he lived, clearly and comprehensively as we see them. But the Industrial Revolution, as it went on towards the end of the nineteenth century, 
was more and more distinctly seen as one whole process by the common people it was affecting, because presently they could read and discuss and communicate, and because they went about and saw things as no commonalty had ever done before. End of chapter 58「Chapter 59 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 59 The Development of Modern Political and Social Ideas. The institutions and customs and political ideas of the ancient civilizations grew up slowly, age by age, no man designing and no man foreseeing. It was only in that great century of human adolescence, the 6th century B.C., that men began to think clearly about their relations to one another, and first to question and first propose to alter and rearrange the established beliefs and laws and methods of human government. We have told of the glorious intellectual dawn of Greece and Alexandria, and how presently the collapse of the slaveholding civilizations and the clouds of religious intolerance and absolutist government darkened the promise of that beginning. The light of fearless thinking did not break through the European obscurity again effectually until the 15th and 16th centuries. We have tried to show something of the share of the great winds of Arab curiosity and Mongol conquest in this gradual clearing of the mental skies of Europe. And at first it was chiefly material knowledge that increased. The first fruits of the recovered manhood of the race were material achievements and material power. The science of human relationship, of individual and social psychology, of education and of economics are not only more subtle and intricate in themselves, but also bound up inextricably with much emotional matter. The advances made in them have been slower and made against greater opposition. Men will listen dispassionately to the most diverse suggestions about stars or molecules, but ideas about our ways of life touch and reflect upon everyone about us. And just as in Greece the bold speculations of Plato came before Aristotle's hard search for fact, so in Europe the first political inquiries of the new phase were put in the form of utopian stories, directly imitated from Plato's Republic and his laws. Sir Thomas More's Utopia is a curious imitation of Plato that bore fruit in a new English poor law. The Neapolitan Campanella's City of the Sun was more fantastic and less fruitful. By the end of the 17th century, we find a considerable and growing literature of political and social science was being produced. Among the pioneers in this discussion was John Locke, the son of an English Republican, an Oxford scholar who first directed his attention to chemistry and medicine. His treatises on government, toleration and education show a mind fully awake to the possibilities of social reconstruction. Parallel with, and a little later than John Locke in England, Montesquieu, 1689 to 1755, in France, subjected social, political, and religious institutions to a searching and fundamental analysis. He stripped the magical prestige from the absolutist monarchy in France. He shares with Locke the credit for clearing away many of the false ideas that had hitherto prevented deliberate and conscious attempts to reconstruct human society. The generation that followed him in the middle and later decades of the 18th century was boldly speculative upon the moral and intellectual clearings he had made. A group of brilliant writers, the encyclopedists, mostly rebel spirits from the excellent schools of the Jesuits, set themselves to scheme out a new world. 1766. Side by side with the encyclopedists were the economists or physiocrats, 
were making bold and crude inquiries into the production and distribution of food and goods. Morally, the author of the Code de la Nature denounced the institution of private property and proposed a communistic organization of society. He was the precursor of that large and various school of collectivist thinkers in the 19th century who are lumped together as socialists. What is socialism? There are a hundred definitions of socialism and a thousand sects of socialists. Essentially, socialism is no more and no less than a criticism of the idea of property in the light of the public good. We may review the history of that idea through the ages very briefly. That and the idea of internationalism are the two cardinal ideas upon which most of our political life is turning. The idea of property arises out of the combative instincts of the species. Long before men were men, the ancestral ape was a proprietor. Primitive property is what a beast will fight for. The dog and his bone, the tigress and her lair, the roaring stag and his herd, these are proprietorship blazing. No more nonsensical expression is conceivable in sociology than the term primitive communism. The old man of the family tribe of early Paleolithic times insisted upon his proprietorship in his wives and daughters, in his tools, in his visible universe. If any other man wandered into his visible universe, he fought him, and if he could, he slew him. The tribe grew in the course of ages, as Atkinson showed convincingly in his primal law, by the gradual toleration by the old man of the existence of the younger men and of their proprietorship in the wives they captured from outside the tribe, and in the tools and ornaments they made, and the game they slew. Human society grew by a compromise between this one's property and that. It was a compromise with instinct which was forced upon men by the necessity of driving some other tribe out of its visible universe. If the hills and forests and streams were not your land or my land, it was because they had to be our land. Each of us would have preferred to have it my land, but that would not work. In that case, the other fellows would have destroyed us. Society, therefore, is from its beginning a mitigation of ownership, Ownership in the beast and in the primitive savage was far more intense a thing than it is in the civilized world today. It is rooted more strongly in our instincts than in our reason. In the natural savage and in the untutored man today, there is no limitation to the sphere of ownership. Whatever you can fight for, you can own. Woman folk, spared captive, captured beast, forest glade, stone pit, or what not. As the community grew, a sort of law came to restrain internecine fighting. Men developed rough and ready methods of settling proprietorship. Men could own what they were the first to make or capture or claim. It seemed natural that a debtor who could not pay should become the property of his creditor. Equally natural was it that after claiming a patch of land, a man should exact payments from anyone who wanted to use it. It was only slowly, as the possibilities of organized life dawned on men, that this unlimited property in anything, whatever, began to be recognized as a nuisance. Men found themselves born into a universe all owned and claimed. Nay, they found themselves born owned and claimed. The social struggles of the earlier civilization are difficult to trace now, but the history we have told of the Roman Republic shows a community waking up to the idea that debts may become a public inconvenience and should then be repudiated, and that the unlimited ownership of land is also an inconvenience. We find that later Babylonia severely limited the rights of property in slaves, Finally, we find in the teaching of that great revolutionist, Jesus of Nazareth, such an attack upon property as had never been before. Easier it was, he said, for
for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the owner of great possessions to enter the kingdom of heaven. A steady, continuous criticism of the permissible scope of property seems to have been going on in the world for the last twenty-five or thirty centuries. Nineteen hundred years after Jesus of Nazareth, we find all the world that has come under the Christian teaching persuaded that there could be no property in human beings, and also the idea that a man may do what he likes with his own was very much shaken in relation to other sorts of property. But this world of the closing 18th century was still only in the interrogative stage in this matter. It had got nothing clear enough, much less settled enough, to act upon. One of its primary impulses was to protect property against the greed and waste of kings and the exploitation of noble adventurers. It was largely to protect private property from taxation that the French Revolution began. But the equalitarian formula of the revolution carried it into a criticism of the very property it had risen to protect. How can men be free and equal when numbers of them have no ground to stand upon and nothing to eat, and the owners will neither feed nor lodge them unless they toil? Excessively, the poor complained. To which riddle the reply of one important political group was to set about dividing up they wanted to intensify and universalize property. Aiming at the same end by another route, there were the primitive socialists, or to be more exact, communists, who wanted to abolish private property altogether. The state, a democratic state was of course understood, was to own all property. It is paradoxical that different men seeking the same ends of liberty and happiness should propose on the one hand to make property as absolute as possible, and on the other to put an end to it altogether. But so it was. And the clue to this paradox is to be found in the fact that ownership is not one thing, but a multitude of different things. It was only as the nineteenth century developed that men began to realize that property was not one simple thing, but a great complex of ownerships of different values and consequences, that many things, such as one's body, the implements of an artist's clothing toothbrushes, are very profoundly and incurably one's personal property, and that there is a very great range of things, railways, machinery of various sorts, homes, cultivated gardens, pleasure boats, for example, which need each to be considered very particularly to determine how far and under what limitations it may come under private ownership, and how far it falls into the public domain, and may be administered and let out by the state in the collective interest. On the practical side, these questions pass into politics, and the problem of making and sustaining efficient state administration. They open up issues in social psychology and interact with the inquiries of educational science. The criticism of property is still a vast and passionate ferment rather than a science. On the one hand are the individualists, who would protect and enlarge our present freedoms with what we possess, and on the other the socialists, who would in many directions pool our ownerships and restrain our proprietary acts. In practice, one will find every gradation between the extreme individualist, who will scarcely tolerate a tax of any sort to support a government, and the communist, who would deny any possessions at all. The ordinary socialist of today is what is called a collectivist. He would allow a considerable amount of private property, but put such affairs as education, transport, mines, landowning, most mass productions of staple articles and the like, into the hands of a highly organized state. Nowadays there does seem to be a gradual convergence of reasonable men towards a moderate socialism, scientifically studied and planned. It is realized more and more clearly 
that the untutored man does not cooperate easily and successfully in large undertakings, and that every step towards a more complex state and every function that the state takes over from private enterprise necessitates a corresponding educational advance and the organization of a proper criticism and control. Both the press and the political methods of the contemporary state are far too crude for any large extension of collective activities. But for a time, the stresses between employer and employed, and particularly between selfish employers and reluctant workers, led to a worldwide dissemination of the very harsh and elementary form of communism which is associated with the name of Marx. Marx based his theories on a belief that men's minds are limited by their economic necessities, and that there is a necessary conflict of interests in our present civilization between the prosperous and employing classes of people and the employed mass. With the advance in education necessitated by the mechanical revolution, this great employed majority will become more and more class-conscious and more and more solid in antagonism to the class-conscious ruling minority. In some way, the class-conscious workers would seize power, he prophesied, and inaugurate a new social state. The antagonism, the insurrection, the possible revolution are understandable enough, but it does not follow that a new social state or anything but a socially destructive process will ensue. Put to the test in Russia, Marxism, as we shall note later, has proved singularly uncreative. Marx sought to replace national antagonism by class antagonisms. Marxism has produced in succession a first, a second, and a third workers' international. But from the starting point of modern individualistic thought, it is also possible to reach international ideas. From the days of that great English economist Adam Smith onward, there has been an increasing realization that for worldwide prosperity free and unencumbered trade about the earth is needed. The individualist with his hostility to the state is hostile also to tariffs and boundaries and all the restraints upon free act and movement that national boundaries seem to justify. It is interesting to see two lines of thought, so diverse in spirit, so different in substance, as this class war socialism of the Marxists and the individualistic free trading philosophy of the British businessmen of the Victorian age, heading at last, in spite of these primary differences, towards the same intimations of a new worldwide treatment of human affairs outside the boundaries and limitations of any existing state. The logic of reality triumphs over the logic of theory. We begin to perceive that from widely divergent starting points, individualist theory and socialist theory are part of a common search a search for more spacious social and political ideas and interpretations upon which men may contrive to work together, a search that began again in Europe and has intensified as man's confidence in the ideas of the Holy Roman Empire and in Christendom decayed, and as the age of discovery broadened their horizons from the world of the Mediterranean to the whole wide world. To bring this description of the elaboration and development of social, economic, and political ideas right down to the discussions of the present day would be to introduce issues altogether too controversial for the scope and intentions of this book. But regarding these things as we do here, from the vast perspectives of the student of world history, we are bound to recognize that this reconstruction of these directive ideas in the human mind is still an unfinished task. We cannot even estimate yet how unfinished the task may be. Certain common beliefs do seem to be emerging, and their influence is very perceptible 
upon the political events and public acts of today, but at present they are not clear enough, nor convincing enough to compel men, definitely and systematically, towards their realization. Men's acts waver between tradition and the new, and on the whole they rather gravitate towards the traditional. Yet, compared with the thought of even a brief lifetime ago, there does seem to be an outline shaping itself of a new order in human affairs. It is a sketchy outline, vanishing into vagueness at this point and that, and fluctuating in detail and formula, yet it grows steadfastly clearer, and its main lines change less and less. It is becoming plainer and plainer each year, that in many respects and in an increasing range of affairs, mankind is becoming one community, and that it is more and more necessary that in such matters there should be a common, worldwide control. For example, it is steadily truer that the whole planet is now one economic community, that the proper exploitation of its natural resources demands one comprehensive direction, and that the greater power and range that discovery has given human effort, makes the present fragmentary and contentious administration of such affairs more and more wasteful and dangerous. Financial and monetary expedients also become worldwide interests to be dealt with successfully only on worldwide lines. Infectious diseases and the increase and migrations of population are also now plainly seen to be worldwide concerns. The greater power and range of human activities has also made war disproportionately destructive and disorganizing, and even as a clumsy way of settling issues between government and government and people and people, ineffective. All these things clamor for controls and authorities of a greater range and greater comprehensiveness than any government that has hitherto existed. But it does not follow that the solution of these problems lies in some super-government of all the world, arising by conquest or by the coalescence of existing governments. By analogy with existing institutions, men have thought of the parliament of mankind, of a world congress, of a president or emperor of the earth. Our first natural reaction is towards some such conclusion, but the discussion and experiences of half a century of suggestions and attempts has, on the whole, discouraged belief in that first obvious idea. Along that line to world unity, the resistances are too great. The drift of thought seems now to be in a direction of a number of special committees or organizations, with worldwide power delegated to them by existing governments in this group of matters or that, bodies concerned with the waste or development of natural wealth, with the equalization of labor conditions, with world peace, with currency, population and health, and so forth. The world may discover that all its common interests are being managed as one concern, while it still fails to realize that a world government exists. But before even so much human unity is attained, before such international arrangements can be put above patriotic suspicions and jealousies, it is necessary that the common mind of the race should be possessed of that idea of human unity, and that the idea of mankind as one family should be a matter of universal instruction and understanding. For a score of centuries or more, the spirit of the great universal religions has been struggling to maintain and extend that idea of a universal human brotherhood, but to this day, the spites, angers, and distrusts of tribal, national, and racial friction abstract, and successfully abstract, the broader views and more generous impulses which would make every man the servant of all mankind. The idea of human brotherhood struggles now to possess the human soul just as the idea of Christendom struggled to possess the soul of Europe in the confusion and disorder of the 6th and 7th centuries of the Christian era. The dissemination and triumph of such ideas 
must be the work of a multitude of devoted and undistinguished missionaries, and no contemporary writer can presume to guess how far such work has gone or what harvest it may be preparing. Social and economic questions seem to be inseparably mingled with international ones. The solution in each case lies in an appeal to that same spirit of service which can enter and inspire the human heart. The distrust, intractability, and egoism of nations reflects and is reflected by the distrust, intractability, and egoism of the individual owner and worker in the face of the common good. Exaggerations of possessiveness in the individual are parallel and of a piece with the clutching greed of nations and emperors. They are products of the same instinctive tendencies and the same ignorances and traditions. Internationalism is the socialism of nations. No one who has wrestled with these problems can feel that there yet exists a sufficient depth and strength of psychological science and a sufficiently planned out educational method and organization for any real and final solution of these riddles of human intercourse and cooperation. We are as incapable of planning a really effective peace organization of the world today as were men in 1820 to plan an electric railway system. But for all we know, the thing is equally practicable and may be as nearly at hand. No man can go beyond his own knowledge, no thought can reach beyond contemporary thought, and it is impossible for us to guess or foretell how many generations of humanity may have to live in war and waste and insecurity and misery before the dawn of the great peace, to which all history seems to be pointing, peace in the heart and peace in the world, ends our night of wasteful and aimless living. Our proposed solutions are still vague and crude. Passion and suspicion surround them. A great task of intellectual reconstruction is going on. It is still incomplete, and our conceptions grow clearer and more exact. Slowly, rapidly, it is hard to tell which. But as they grow clearer, they will gather power over the minds and imaginations of men. Their present lack of grip is due to their lack of assurance and exact rightness. They are misunderstood because they are variously and confusingly presented. But with precision and certainty, the new vision of the world will gain compelling power. It may presently gain power very rapidly, and a great work of educational reconstruction will follow logically and necessarily upon that clearer understanding. End of chapter 59「A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 60 The Expansion of the United States The region of the world that displayed the most immediate and striking results from the new inventions in transport was North America. Politically, the United States embodied, and its constitution crystallized, the liberal ideas of the middle 18th century. It dispensed with state church or crown. It would have no titles. It protected property very jealously as a method of freedom, and, the exact practice varied at first in the different states, it gave nearly every adult male citizen a vote. Its method of voting was barbarically crude, and as a consequence its political life fell very soon under the control of highly organized party machines. But that did not prevent the newly emancipated population developing an energy, enterprise, and public spirit far beyond that of any other contemporary population. Then came that acceleration of locomotion, to which we have already called attention. It is a curious thing that America, which owes most to this acceleration in locomotion, has felt it least. The United States have taken the railway, 
the river steamboat, the telegraph, and so forth, as though they were a natural part of their growth. They were not. These things happened to come along just in time to save American unity. The United States of today were made first by the river steamboat and then by the railway. Without these things, the present United States, this vast continental nation, would have been altogether impossible. The westward flow of population would have been far more sluggish. It might never have crossed the great central plains. It took nearly two hundred years for effective settlement to reach from the coast to Missouri, much less than halfway across the continent. The first state established beyond the river was the steamboat state of Missouri in 1821, but the rest of the distance to the Pacific was done in a few decades. If we had the resources of the cinema, it would be interesting to show a map of North America year by year from 1600 onward, with little dots to represent hundreds of people, each dot a hundred, and stars to represent cities of a hundred thousand people. For two hundred years, the reader would see that stippling, creeping slowly along the coastal districts and navigable waters, spreading still more gradually into Indiana, Kentucky, and so forth. Then somewhere about 1810 would come a change. Things would get more lively along the river courses. The dots would be multiplying and spreading. That would be the steamboat. The pioneer dots would be spreading soon over Kansas and Nebraska from a number of jumping-off places along the great rivers. Then, from about 1850 onward, would come the black lines of the railways, and after that the little black dots would not simply creep but run. They would appear now so rapidly it would be almost as though they were being put on by some sort of spraying machine and suddenly here and then there would appear the first stars to indicate the first great cities of a hundred thousand people, first one or two, and then a multitude of cities, each like a knot in the growing net of the railways. The growth of the United States is a process that has no precedent in the world's history. It is a new kind of occurrence. Such a community could not have come into existence before, and if it had, without railways it would certainly have dropped to pieces long before now. Without railways or telegraph, it would be far easier to administer California from Pekin than from Washington. But this great population of the United States of America has not only grown outrageously, it has kept uniform. Nay, it has become more uniform. The man of San Francisco is more like the man of New York today than the man of Virginia was like the man of New England a century ago. And the process of assimilation goes on unimpeded. The United States is being woven by railway, by telegraph, more and more into one vast unity, speaking, thinking, and acting harmoniously with itself. Soon aviation will be helping in the work. This great community of the United States is an altogether new thing in history. There have been great empires before, with populations exceeding hundred millions, but these were associations of divergent peoples. There has never been one single people on this scale before. We want a new term for this new thing. We call the United States a country, just as we call France or Holland a country. But the two things are as different as an automobile and a one-horse shay. They are the creations of different periods and different conditions. They are going to work at a different pace and in an entirely different way. The United States in scale and possibility is halfway between a European state and a United States of all the world. But on the way to this present greatness and security, the American people passed through one phase of dire conflict. The river steamboats, the railways, the telegraph, and their associate facilities did not come soon enough to avert a deepening conflict of interests and ideas between the southern and northern states of the Union. The former were slaveholding states, the latter states in which all men were free. 
The railways and steamboats at first did but bring into sharper conflict an already established difference between the two sections of the United States. The increasing unification, due to the new means of transport, made the question whether the southern spirit or the northern should prevail an ever more urgent one. There was little possibility of compromise. The northern spirit was free and individualistic, the southern maid for great estates and conscious gentility ruling over a dusky subject multitude. Every new territory that was organized into a state, as the tide of population swept westward, every new incorporation into the fast-growing American system, became a field of conflict between the two ideas. Whether it should become a state of free citizens, or whether the estate and slavery system should prevail. From 1833, an American anti-slavery society was not merely resisting the extension of the institution, but agitating the whole country for its complete abolition. The issue flamed up into open conflict over the admission of Texas to the Union. Texas had originally been a part of the Republic of Mexico, but it was largely colonized by Americans from the slave-holding states, and it succeeded from Mexico, established its independence in 1835, and was annexed to the United States in 1844. Under the Mexican law, slavery had been forbidden in Texas, but now the South claimed Texas for slavery and got it. Meanwhile, the development of ocean navigation was bringing a growing swarm of immigrants from Europe to swell the spreading population of the northern states, and the raising of Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Oregon, all northern farmlands, to state level, gave the anti-slavery North the possibility of predominance, both in the Senate and the House of Representatives. The cotton-growing South, irritated by the growing threat of the abolitionist movement, and fearing this predominance in Congress, began to talk of secession from the Union. Southerners began to dream of annexations to the south of them in Mexico and the West Indies, and of a great slave state detached from the north and reaching to Panama. The return of Abraham Lincoln as an anti-extension president in 1860 decided the south to split the Union. South Carolina passed an ordinance of secession and prepared for war. Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas joined her, and a convention met at Montgomery in Alabama, elected Jefferson Davis president of the Confederated States of America, and adopted a constitution specifically upholding the institution of Negro slavery. Abraham Lincoln was, it chanced, a man entirely typical of the new people that had grown up after the War of Independence. His early years had been spent as a drifting particle in the general westward flow of the population. He was born in Kentucky, 1809, was taken to Indiana as a boy and later on to Illinois. Life was rough in the backwoods of Indiana in those days. The house was a mere log cabin in the wilderness, and his schooling was poor and casual. But his mother taught him to read early, and he became a voracious reader. At seventeen he was a big athletic youth, a great wrestler and runner. He worked for a time as clerk in a store, went into business as a storekeeper with a drunken partner, and contracted debts that he did not fully pay off for fifteen years. In 1834, when he was still only five-and-twenty, he was elected member of the House of Representatives for the state of Illinois. In Illinois particularly, the question of slavery flamed, because the great leader of the party for the extension of slavery in the National Congress was Senator Douglas of Illinois. Douglas was a man of great ability and prestige, and for some years Lincoln fought against him by speech and pamphlet, rising steadily to the position of his most formidable, and finally victorious antagonist. Their culminating struggle was the presidential campaign of 1860, and on the 4th of March, 1861, 
Lincoln was inaugurated president, with the southern states already in active secession from the rule of the federal government in Washington and committing acts of war. The Civil War in America was fought by improvised armies that grew steadily from a few score thousands to hundreds of thousands, until at last the federal forces exceeded a million men. It was fought over a vast area between New Mexico and the Eastern Sea. Washington and Richmond were the chief objectives. It is beyond our scope here to tell of the mounting energy of that epic struggle that rode to and fro across the hills and woods of Tennessee and Virginia and down the Mississippi. There was a terrible waste and killing of men. Thrust was followed by counter-thrust. Hope gave way to despondency and returned and was again disappointed. Sometimes Washington seemed within the Confederate grasp. Again, the Federal armies were driving towards Richmond. The Confederates, outnumbered and far poorer in resources, fought under a general of supreme ability, General Lee. The generalship of the Union was far inferior. Generals were dismissed, new generals appointed, until at last, under Sherman and Grant, came victory over the ragged and depleted South. In October 1864, a Federal army under Sherman broke through the Confederate left and marched down from Tennessee through Georgia to the coast, right across the Confederate country, and then turned up through the Carolinas, coming in upon the rear of the Confederate armies. Meanwhile, Grant held Lee before Richmond until Sherman closed on him. On April 9, 1865, Lee and his army surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, and within a month all the remaining secessionist armies had lain down their arms, and the Confederacy was at an end. This four-year struggle had meant an enormous physical and moral strain for the people of the United States. The principle of state autonomy was very dear to many minds, and the North seemed in effect to be forcing abolition upon the South. In the border states, brothers and cousins, even fathers and sons, would take opposite sides and find themselves in antagonistic armies. The North felt its cause a righteous one, but for great numbers of people it was not a full-bodied and unchallenged righteousness. But for Lincoln there was no doubt. He was a clear-minded man in the midst of much confusion. He stood for union. He stood for the white peace of America. He was opposed to slavery, but slavery he held to be a secondary issue. His primary purpose was that the United States should not be torn into two contrasted and jarring fragments. When, in the opening stages of the war, Congress and the Federal Generals embarked, Upon the precipitate emancipation, Lincoln opposed and mitigated their enthusiasm. He was for emancipation by stages and with compensation. It was only in January 1865 that the situation had ripened to a point when Congress could propose to abolish slavery forever by a constitutional amendment, and the war was already over before this amendment was ratified by the states. As the war dragged on through 1862 and 1863, the first passions and enthusiasms waned, and America learned all the phases of war, weariness, and war disgust. The President found himself with defeatists, traitors, dismissed generals, tortuous party politicians, an adopting and fatigued people behind him, and uninspired generals and depressed troops before him. His chief consolation must have been that Jefferson Davis at Richmond could be in little better case. The English government misbehaved and permitted the Confederate agents in England to launch and man three swift privateer ships, the Alabama is the best remembered of them, which chased the United States shipping from the seas. The French army in Mexico was trampling the Monroe Doctrine in the dirt. Came subtle proposals from Richmond to drop the war, leave the issues of the war for subsequent discussion, and turn, 
federal and confederate in alliance upon the French in Mexico. But Lincoln would not listen to such proposals unless the supremacy of the Union was maintained. The Americans might do such things as one people, but not as two. He held the United States together through long, very months of reverses and ineffective effort, through black phases of division and failing courage, and there is no record that he ever faltered from his purpose. There were times when there was nothing to be done, when he sat in the White House silent and motionless, a grim monument of resolve, times when he relaxed his mind by jesting and broad anecdotes. He saw the Union triumphant. He entered Richmond the day after its surrender and heard of Lee's capitulation. He returned to Washington and on April 11th made his last public address. His theme was reconciliation and the reconstruction of loyal government in the defeated states. On the evening of April 14th, he went to Ford's Theater in Washington, and as he sat looking at the stage, he was shot in the back of the head and killed by an actor named Booth, who had some sort of grievance against him and who had crept into the box unobserved. But Lincoln's work was done. The Union was saved. At the beginning of the war, there was no railway to the Pacific coast. After it, the railways spread like a swiftly growing plant, until now they have clutched and held and woven all the vast territory of the United States into one indissolute mental and material unity, the greatest real community, until the common folk of China have learned to read in the world. End of chapter 60「Short History of the World」by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 61 The Rise of Germany to Predominance in Europe We have told how after the convulsion of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic adventure, Europe settled down again for a time to an insecure peace and a sort of modernized revival of the political conditions of fifty years before. Until the middle of the century, the new facilities in the handling of steel and the railway and steamship produced no marked political consequences. But the social tension due to the development of urban industrialism grew. France remained a conspicuously uneasy country. The revolution of 1830 was followed by another in 1848. Then, Napoleon III, a nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, became first president, and then, in 1852, emperor. He set about rebuilding Paris, and changed it from a picturesque 17th-century insanitary city into the spacious Latinized city of marble it is today. He set about rebuilding France, and made it into a brilliant-looking, modernized imperialism. He displayed a disposition to revive that competitiveness of the great powers which had kept Europe busy with futile wars during the 17th and 18th centuries. The Tsar Nicholas I of Russia, 1825 to 1856, was also becoming aggressive and pressing southward upon the Turkish Empire with his eyes on Constantinople. After the turn of the century, Europe broke out into a fresh cycle of wars. They were chiefly balance of power and ascendancy wars. England, France, and Sardinia assailed Russia in the Crimean War in defense of Turkey. Prussia, with Italy as an ally, and Austria fought for the leadership of Germany. France liberated North Italy from Austria at the price of Savoy, and Italy gradually unified itself into one kingdom. Then Napoleon III was so ill-advised as to attempt adventures in Mexico during the American Civil War. He set up an Emperor Maximilian there, and abandoned him hastily to his fate. He was shot by the Mexicans, when the victorious federal government showed its teeth. In 1870 came a long pending struggle for predominance in Europe between France and Prussia, 
Prussia had long foreseen and prepared for this struggle, and France was rotten with financial corruption. Her defeat was swift and dramatic. The Germans invaded France in August. One great French army under the Emperor capitulated at Sedan in September, another surrendered in October at Metz, and in January 1871, Paris, after a siege and bombardment, fell into German hands. Peace was signed at Frankfurt, surrendering the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine to the Germans. Germany, excluding Austria, was unified as an empire, and the King of Prussia was added to the galaxy of European Caesars as the German Emperor. For the next 43 years, Germany was the leading power upon the European continent. There was a Russo-Turkish war in 1877-78, but thereafter, except for certain readjustments in the Balkans, European frontiers remained uneasily stable for 30 years. End of chapter 61Chapter 62 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 62 The New Overseas Empires of Steamship and Railway. The end of the 18th century was a period of disrupting empires and disillusioned expansionists. The long and tedious journey between Britain and Spain and their colonies in America prevented any real free coming and going between the homeland and the daughter lands, and so the colonies separated into new and distinct communities, with distinctive ideas and interests, and even modes of speech. As they grew, they strained more and more at the feeble and uncertain link of shipping that had joined them. Weak trading posts in the wilderness, like those of France and Canada, or trading establishments in great alien communities, like those of Britain in India, might well cling for bare existence to the nation which gave them support and a reason for their existence. That much, and no more, seemed to many thinkers in the early part of the nineteenth century to be the limit set to overseas rule. In 1820, the sketchy, great European empires outside of Europe that had figured so bravely in the maps of the middle 18th century, had shrunken to very small dimensions. Only the Russian sprawled as large as ever across Asia. The British Empire in 1815 consisted of the thinly populated coastal river and lake regions of Canada, and a great hinterland of wilderness in which the only settlements as yet were the fur trading stations of the Hudson Bay Company about a third of the Indian Peninsula, under the rule of the East India Company. The coast districts of the Cape of Good Hope, inhabited by blacks and rebellious-spirited Dutch settlers. A few trading stations on the coast of West Africa, the Rock of Gibraltar, the island of Malta, Jamaica, a few minor slave-labor possessions in the West Indies, British Guiana in South America, and on the other side of the world, two dumps for convicts at Botany Bay in Australia and in Tasmania. Spain retained Cuba and a few settlements in the Philippine Islands. Portugal had in Africa some vestiges of her ancient claims. Holland had various islands and possessions in the East Indies and Dutch Guyana, and Denmark an island or so in the West Indies. France had one or two West Indian islands and French Guiana. This seemed to be as much as the European powers needed, or were likely to acquire, of the rest of the world. Only the East India Company showed any spirit of expansion. While Europe was busy with the Napoleonic Wars, the East India Company, under a succession of governors-general, was playing much the same role in India that had been played before by Turkoman and such-like invaders from the north and after the Peace of Vienna it went on, levying its revenues, making wars, sending ambassadors to Asiatic powers. A quasi-independent state, however, with a marked disposition to send wealth westward. We cannot tell here in any detail how the British company made its way to supremacy 
sometimes as the ally of this power, sometimes as that, and finally as the conqueror of all. Its power spread to Assam, Sindh, Oat. The map of India began to take on the outlines, familiar to the English schoolboy of today, a patchwork of native states, embraced and held together by the great provinces under direct British rule. In 1859, following upon a serious mutiny of the native troops in India, this empire of the East India Company was annexed to the British crown. By an act entitled, An Act for the Better Government of India, the Governor-General became a viceroy representing the sovereign, and the place of the company was taken by a Secretary of State for India, responsible to the British Parliament. In 1877, Lord Beaconsfield, to complete the work, caused Queen Victoria to be proclaimed Empress of India. Upon these extraordinary lines, India and Britain are linked at the present time. India is still the empire of the Great Mogul, but the Great Mogul has been replaced by the Crown Republic of the Great Britain. India is an autocracy without an autocrat. Its rule combines the disadvantage of absolute monarchy with the impersonality and irresponsibility of democratic officialdom. The Indian, with a complaint to make, has no visible monarch to go to. His emperor is a golden symbol. He must circulate pamphlets in England or inspire a question in the British House of Commons. The more occupied Parliament is with British affairs, the less attention India will receive, and the more she will be at the mercy of her small group of higher officials. Apart from India, there was no great expansion of any European empire until the railways and the steamships were in effective action. A considerable school of political thinkers in Britain was disposed to regard overseas possessions as a source of weakness to the kingdom. The Australian settlements developed slowly until in 1842 the discovery of valuable copper mines and in 1851 of gold gave them a new importance. Improvements on transport were also making Australian wool an increasingly marketable commodity in Europe. Canada, too, was not remarkably progressive until 1849. It was troubled by dissensions between its French and British inhabitants. There were several serious revolts, and it was only in 1867 that the new constitution, creating a federal dominion of Canada, relieved its internal strains. It was the railway that altered the Canadian outlook. It enabled Canada, just as it enabled the United States, to expand westward, to market its corn and other produce in Europe, and in spite of its swift and extensive growth, to remain in language and sympathy and interests one community. The railway, the steamship and the telegraph cable were indeed changing all the conditions of colonial development. Before 1840, English settlements had already begun in New Zealand, and a New Zealand land company had been formed to exploit the possibilities of the island. In 1840, New Zealand also was added to the colonial possessions of the British Crown. Canada, as we have noted, was the first of the British possessions to respond richly to the new economic possibilities that the new methods of transport were opening. Presently, the republics of South America, and particularly the Argentine Republic, began to feel, in their cattle trade and coffee growing, the increased nearness of the European market. Hitherto, the chief commodities that had attracted the European powers into unsettled and barbaric regions had been gold or other metals, spices, ivory, or slaves. But in the latter quarter of the 19th century, the increase of the European populations was obliging their governments to look abroad for staple foods, and the growth of scientific industrialism was creating a demand for new raw materials, fats and greases of every kind, rubber, and other hitherto disregarded substances. It was plain that Great Britain and Holland and Portugal were reaping a great and growing commercial advantage from their very considerable control of tropical and subtropical products. 
after 1871, Germany, and presently France and later Italy, began to look for unannexed raw material areas, or for Oriental countries capable of profitable modernization. So began a fresh scramble all over the world, except in the American region, where the Monroe Doctrine now barred such adventures for politically unprotected lands. Close to Europe was the continent of Africa, full of vaguely known possibilities. In 1850 it was a continent of black mystery. Only Egypt and the coast were known. Here we have no space to tell the amazing story of the explorers and adventurers who first pierced the African darkness, and of the political agents, administrators, traders, settlers, and scientific men who followed in their track. Wonderful races of men, like the pygmies, strange beasts like the okapi, marvelous fruits and flowers and insects, terrible diseases, astounding scenery of forest and mountain, enormous inland seas and gigantic rivers and cascades were revealed. A whole new world. Even remains at Zimbabwe of some unrecorded and vanished civilization, the southward enterprise of an early people, were discovered. Into this new world came the Europeans, and found the rifle already there in the hands of the Arab slave traders, and Negro life in disorder. By 1900, in half a century, all Africa was mapped, explored, estimated, and divided between the European powers. Little heed was given to the welfare of the natives in this scramble. The Arab slaver was indeed curbed, rather than expelled, but the greed for rubber which was a wild product collected under compulsion by the natives in the Belgian Congo, agreed, exacerbated by the clash of inexperienced European administrators with the native population, led to horrible atrocities. No European power has perfectly clean hands in this matter. We cannot tell here in any detail how Great Britain got possession of Egypt in 1883 and remained there in spite of the fact that Egypt was technically a part of the Turkish Empire, nor how nearly this scramble led to war between France and Great Britain in 1898, when a certain colonel marchant, crossing Central Africa from the west coast, tried at Fashoda to seize the Upper Nile. Nor can we tell how the British government first led the Boers, or Dutch settlers, of the Orange River district and the Transvaal set up independent republics in the inland parts of South Africa, and then repented and annexed the Transvaal Republic in 1877, nor how the Transvaal Boers fought for freedom and won it after the Battle of Majuba Hill, 1881. Majuba Hill was made to rankle in the memory of the English people by a persistent press campaign. A war with both republics broke out in 1899, a three years' war enormously costly to the British people, which ended at last in the surrender of the two republics. Their period of subjugation was a brief one. In 1907, after the downfall of the imperialist government, which had conquered them, the liberals took the South African problem in hand, and these former republics became free and fairly willing associates with Cape Colony and Natal, in a confederation of all the states of South Africa, as one self-governing republic under the British crown. In a quarter of a century, the partition of Africa was completed. There remained, unannexed, three comparatively small countries, Liberia, a settlement of liberated Negro slaves on the west coast, Morocco, under a Muslim sultan, and Abyssinia, a barbaric country, with an ancient and peculiar form of Christianity, which had successfully maintained its independence against Italy at the Battle of Adowa in 1896. End of chapter 62
that any large number of people really accepted this headlong painting of the map of Africa in European colors as a permanent new settlement of the world's affairs. But it is the duty of the historian to record that it was so accepted. There was but a shallow historical background to the European mind in the 19th century, and no habit of penetrating criticism. The quite temporary advantages that the mechanical revolution in the West had given the Europeans over the rest of the old world were regarded by people, blankly ignorant of such events as the great Mongol conquests, as evidences of a permanent and assured European leadership of mankind. They had no sense of the transferability of science and its fruits. They did not realize that Chinamen and Indians could carry on the work of research as ably as Frenchmen or Englishmen. They believed that there was some innate intellectual drive in the West, and some innate indolence and conservatism in the East, that assured the Europeans a world predominance forever. The consequence of this infatuation was that the various European foreign offices set themselves not merely to scramble with the British for the savage and undeveloped regions of the world's surface, but also to carve up the populous and civilized countries of Asia, as though these people also were no more than raw material for exploitation. The inwardly precarious but outwardly splendid imperialism of the British ruling class in India, and the extensive and profitable possessions of the Dutch in the East Indies, filled the rival great powers with dreams of similar glories in Persia, in the disintegrating Ottoman Empire, and in further India, China, and Japan. In 1898, Germany seized Kiao Chao in China. Britain responded by seizing Bay Highway, and the next year the Russians took possession of Port Arthur. A flame of hatred for the Europeans swept through China. There were massacres of Europeans and Christian converts, and in 1900 an attack upon and siege of the European legations in Pekin. A combined force of Europeans made a punitive expedition to Pekin, rescued the legations, and stole an enormous amount of valuable property. The Russians then seized Manchuria, and in 1904 the British invaded Tibet. But now a new power appeared in the struggle of the great powers, Japan. Hitherto Japan had played but a small part in this history. Her secluded civilization has not contributed very largely to the general shaping of human destinies. She has received much, but she has given little. The Japanese proper are of the Mongolian race. Their civilization, their writing and their literary and artistic traditions are derived from the Chinese. Their history is an interesting and romantic one. They developed a feudal system and a system of chivalry in the earlier centuries of the Christian era. Their attacks upon Korea and China are an eastern equivalent of the English wars in France. Japan was first brought into contact with Europe in the 16th century. In 1542, some Portuguese reached it in a Chinese junk, and in 1549, a Jesuit missionary, Francis Javier, began his teaching there. For a time, Japan welcomed European intercourse, and the Christian missionaries made a great number of converts. A certain William Adams became the most trusted European advisor of the Japanese, and showed them how to build big ships. There were voyages in Japanese-built ships to India and Peru. Then arose complicated quarrels between the Spanish Dominicans, the Portuguese Jesuits, and the English and Dutch Protestants, each warning the Japanese against the political designs of the others. The Jesuits, in a phase of ascendancy, persecuted and insulted the Buddhists with great acronymy. In the end, the Japanese came to the conclusion that the Europeans were an intolerable nuisance, and that Catholic Christianity in particular was a mere cloak for the political dreams of the Pope and the Spanish monarchy, already in possession of the Philippine Islands. 
there was a great persecution of the Christians, and in 1638 Japan was absolutely closed to Europeans, and remained closed for over 200 years. During these two centuries, the Japanese were as completely cut off from the rest of the world as though they lived upon another planet. It was forbidden to build any ship larger than a mere coasting boat. No Japanese could go abroad, and no European enter the country. For two centuries Japan remained outside the main current of history. She lived on in a state of picturesque feudalism, in which about 5% of the population, the samurai or fighting men, and the nobles and their families, tyrannized without restraint over the rest of the population. Meanwhile, the great world outside went on to wider visions and new powers. Strange shipping became more frequent, passing the Japanese headlands. Sometimes ships were wrecked and sailors brought ashore. Through the Dutch settlement in the island of Deshima, their one link with the outer universe, came warnings that Japan was not keeping pace with the power of the Western world. In 1837, a ship sailed into Yido Bay, flying a strange flag of stripes and stars, and carrying some Japanese sailors she had picked up, far adrift in the Pacific. She was driven off by cannon shot. This flag presently reappeared on other ships. One in 1849 came to demand the liberation of 18 shipwrecked American sailors. Then, in 1853, came four American warships under Commodore Perry and refused to be driven away. He lay at anchor in forbidden waters and sent messages to the two rulers, who at that time shared the control of Japan. In 1854, he returned with ten ships, amazing ships propelled by steam and equipped with big guns, and he made proposals for trade and intercourse that the Japanese had no power to resist. He landed with a guard of 500 men to sign the treaty. Incredulous crowds watched this visitation from the outer world, marching through the streets. Russia, Holland, and Britain followed in the wake of America. A great nobleman whose estates commanded the Straits of Shimonoseki saw fit to fire on foreign vessels, and a bombardment by a fleet of British, French, Dutch, and American warships destroyed his batteries and scattered his swordsmen. Finally, an Allied squadron, 1865, at anchor off Kyoto, imposed a ratification of the treaties which opened Japan to the world. The humiliation of the Japanese by these events was intense. With astonishing energy and intelligence, they set themselves to bring their culture and organization to the level of the European powers. Never in all the history of mankind did a nation make such a stride as Japan then did. In 1866, she was a medieval people, a fantastic caricature of the extremist, romantic feudalism. In 1899, hers was a completely westernized people, on the level with the most advanced European powers. She completely dispelled the persuasion that Asia was in some irrecoverable way hopelessly behind Europe. She made all European progress seem sluggish by comparison. We cannot tell here in any detail of Japan's war with China in 1894-95. It demonstrated the extent of her westernization. She had an efficient, westernized army and a small but sound fleet. But the significance of her renaissance, though it was appreciated by Britain and the United States, who were already treating her as if she were a European state, was not understood by the other great powers engaged in the pursuit of new Indias in Asia. Russia was pushing down through Manchuria to Korea. France was already established far to the south in Tonkin and Annam. Germany was prowling hungrily on the lookout for some settlement. The three powers combined to prevent Japan reaping any fruits from the Chinese war. She was exhausted by the struggle, and they threatened her with war. Japan submitted for a time and gathered her forces. Within ten years she was ready for a struggle with Russia, which marks an epoch in the history of Asia, 
the close of the period of European arrogance. The Russian people were, of course, innocent and ignorant of this trouble that was being made for them halfway round the world, and the wiser Russian statesmen were against these foolish thrusts. But a gang of financial adventurers, including the Grand Dukes, his cousins, surrounded the Tsar. They had gambled deeply in the prospective looting of Manchuria and China, and they would suffer no withdrawal. So there began a transportation of great armies of Japanese soldiers across the sea to Port Arthur and Korea, and the sending of endless trainloads of Russian peasants along the Siberian railway to die in those distant battlefields. The Russians, badly led and dishonestly provided, were beaten on sea and land alike. The Russian Baltic fleet sailed round Africa to be utterly destroyed in the Straits of Tsushima. A revolutionary movement among the common people of Russia, infuriated by this remote and reasonless slaughter, obliged the Tsar to end the war in 1905. He returned the southern half of Sakhalin, which had been seized by Russia in 1875, evacuated Manchuria, resigned Korea to Japan. The European invasion of Asia was coming to an end, and the retraction of Europe's tentacles was beginning. End of chapter 63Chapter 64 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. The Slipperybox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 64 The British Empire in 1914. We may note here briefly the varied nature of the constituents of the British Empire in 1914, which the steamship and railway had brought together. It was and is a quite unique political combination. Nothing of the sort has ever existed before. First and central to the whole system was the Crown Republic of the United British Kingdom, including, against the will of a considerable part of the Irish people, Ireland. The majority of the British Parliament, made up of the three united parliaments of England and Wales, Scotland and Ireland, determines the headship, the quality and policy of the ministry, and determines it largely on considerations arising out of British domestic politics. It is this ministry which is the effective supreme government, with powers of peace and war over all the rest of the empire. Next in order of political importance of the British states were the Crown Republics of Australia, Canada, Newfoundland, the oldest British possession, 1583, New Zealand and South Africa, all practically independent and self-governing states in alliance with Great Britain, but each with a representative of the crown appointed by the government in office. Next, the Indian Empire, an extension of the empire of the Great Mogul with its dependent and protected states reaching now from Beluchistan to Burma and including Aden, in all of which empire the British crown and the India office under parliamentary control played the role of the original Turkoman dynasty. Then, the ambiguous possession of Egypt, still nominally a part of the Turkish Empire, and still retaining its own monarch, the Khedive, but under almost despotic British official rule. Then, the still more ambiguous Anglo-Egyptian Sudan province, occupied and administered jointly by the British and by the British-controlled Egyptian government. Then, a number of a partially self-governing communities, some British in origin and some not, with elected legislators and an appointed executive, such as Malta, Jamaica, the Bahamas and Bermuda. Then, the Crown Colonies, in which the rule of the British home government, through the colonial office, verged on autocracy, as in Ceylon, Trinidad and Fiji, where there was an appointed council, and Gibraltar and St. Helena, where there was a governor. Then, great areas of chiefly tropical lands, raw product areas, with politically weak and under-civilized native communities, which were nominally protectorates and administered either by a high commissioner set over native chiefs, as in Basutuland, 
or over a chartered company, as in Rhodesia. In some cases the foreign office, in some cases the colonial office, and in some cases the India office has been concerned in acquiring the possessions that fell into this last and least definite class of all, but for the most part the colonial office was now responsible for them. It will be manifest, therefore, that no single office and no single brain had ever comprehended the British Empire as a whole. It was a mixture of growth and accumulations entirely different from anything that has ever been called an empire before. It guaranteed a wide peace and security, that is why it was endured and sustained by many men of the subject races, in spite of official tyrannies and insufficiencies, and of much negligence on the part of the home public. Like the Athenian Empire, it was an overseas empire, its ways were seaways, and its common link was the British Navy. Like all empires, its cohesion was dependent physically upon a method of communication, the development of seamanship, shipbuilding and steamships, between the 16th and 19th centuries had made it a possible and convenient Pax, the Pax Britannica, and fresh developments of air or swift land transport might at any time make it inconvenient. End of chapter 64《ハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハ produced quite other effects upon the congested nations upon the continent of Europe. They found themselves confined within boundaries fixed during the horse and high road period of human life, and their expansion overseas had been very largely anticipated by Great Britain. Only Russia had any freedom to expand eastward, and she drew a great railway across Siberia until she entangled herself in a conflict with Japan. And pushed southeastwardly towards the borders of Persia and India to the annoyance of Britain. The rest of the European powers were in a state of intensifying congestion. In order to realize the full possibilities of the new apparatus of human life, they had to rearrange their affairs upon a broader basis, either by some sort of voluntary union or by a union imposed upon them by some. Predominant power. The tendency of modern thought was in the direction of the former alternative, but all the force of political tradition drove Europe towards the latter. The downfall of the empire of Napoleon III, the establishment of the new German Empire, pointed men's hopes and fears towards the idea of a Europe consolidated under German auspices. For thirty six years of uneasy peace, the polities of Europe centered upon that possibility. France, the steadfast rival of Germany for European ascendancy, since the division of the Empire of Charlemagne, sought to correct her own weakness by a close alliance with Russia, and Germany linked herself closely with the Austrian Empire. It had ceased to be the Holy Roman Empire in the days of Napoleon I, and less successfully, With the new kingdom of Italy. At first, Great Britain stood as usual, half in and half out of continental affairs. But she was gradually forced into a close association with the Franco Russian group by the aggressive development of great German navy. The grandiose imagination of the Emperor William II, 1888 to 1918, thrust Germany into premature overseas enterprise. That ultimately brought not only Great Britain, but Japan and the United States into their circle of her enemies. All these nations armed. Year after year, the proportion of national production devoted to the making of guns, equipment, battleships, and the like increased. Year after year, 
the balance of things seemed trembling towards war, and then war would be averted. At last it came. Germany and Austria struck at France and Russia and Serbia. With German armies marching through Belgium, Britain immediately came into the war on the side of Belgium, bringing in Japan as her ally, and very soon Turkey followed on the German side. Italy entered the war against Austria in 1915, and Bulgaria joined the Central Powers in the October of that year. In 1916, Romania, and in 1917, the United States and China were forced into war against Germany. It is not within the scope of this history to define the exact share of blame for this vast catastrophe. The more interesting question is not why the Great War was begun, but why the Great War was not anticipated and prevented. It is a far graver thing for mankind that scores of millions of people were too patriotic, stupid, or apathetic to prevent this disaster by a movement towards European unity upon frank and generous lines than that a small number of people may have been active in bringing it about. It is impossible within the space at our command here to trace the intricate details of the war. Within a few months it became apparent that the progress of modern technical science had changed the nature of warfare very profoundly. Physical science gives power, power over steel, over distance, over disease. Whether that power is used well or ill depends upon the moral and political intelligence of the world. The governments of Europe, inspired by antiquated policies of hate and suspicion, found themselves with unexampled powers, both of destruction and resistance in their hands. The war became a consuming fire round and about the world, causing losses both to victors and vanquished out of all proportion to the issues involved. The first phase of the war was a tremendous rush of the Germans upon Paris and an invasion of East Prussia by the Russians. Both attacks were held and turned. Then the power of the defensive developed. There was a rapid elaboration of trench warfare until for a time the opposing armies lay entrenched in long lines right across Europe, unable to make any advance without enormous losses. The armies were millions strong, and behind them entire populations were organized for the supply of food and munitions to the front. Then was a cessation of nearly every sort of productive activity except such as contributed to military operations. All the able-bodied manhood of Europe was drawn into the armies or navies or into the improvised factories that served them. There was an enormous replacement of men by women in industry. Probably more than half the people in the belligerent countries of Europe changed their employment altogether during this stupendous struggle. They were socially uprooted and transplanted. Education and normal scientific work were restricted or diverted to immediate military ends, and the distribution of news was crippled and corrupted by military control and propaganda activities. The phase of military deadlock passed slowly into one of aggression upon the combatant populations behind the fronts, by the destruction of food supplies and by attacks through the air. And also there was a steady improvement in the size and range of the guns employed and of such ingenious devices as poison gas shells and the small mobile forts known as tanks to break down the resistance of troops in the trenches. The air offensive was the most revolutionary of all the new methods. It carried warfare from two dimensions into three. Hitherto in the history of mankind, war had gone on only where the armies marched and met. Now it went on everywhere. First the Zeppelin, and then the bombing airplane carried war over and past the front to an ever-increasing area of civilian activities beyond. The old distinction maintained in civilized warfare between the civilian and combatant population disappeared. Everyone who grew food or who sewed a garment Everyone who felled a tree or repaired a house, every railway station and every warehouse was held to be fair game for destruction. 
The air offensive increased in range and terror with every month in the war. At last, great areas of Europe were in a state of siege and subject to nightly raids. Such exposed cities as London and Paris passed sleepless night after sleepless night while the bombs burst, the anti-aircraft guns maintained an intolerable racket, and the fire engines and ambulances rattled headlong through the darkened and deserted streets. The effects upon the minds and health of old people and young children were particularly distressing and destructive. Pestilence, that old follower of warfare, did not arrive until the very end of the fighting in 1918. For four years medical science staved off any general epidemic. Then came a great outbreak of influenza about the world which destroyed many millions of people. Famine also was staved off for some time. By the beginning of 1918, however, most of Europe was in a state of mitigated and regulated famine. The production of food throughout the world had fallen very greatly through the calling off of peasant mankind to the fronts, and the distribution of such food as was produced was impeded by the havoc wrought by the submarine, by the rupture of customary routes through the closing of frontiers, and by the disorganization of the transport system of the world. The various governments took possession of the dwindling food supplies, and with more or less success rationed their populations. By the fourth year, the whole world was suffering from shortages of clothing and housing, and of most of the normal gear of life, as well as of food. Business and economic life were profoundly disorganized. Everyone was worried, and most people were leading lives of unwanted discomfort. The actual warfare ceased in November 1918. After a supreme effort in the spring of 1918, that almost carried the Germans to Paris, the Central Powers collapsed. They had come to an end of their spirit and resources. End of chapter 65「The Revolution and Famine in Russia » But a good year and more before the collapse of the Central Powers, the half-Oriental monarchy of Russia, which had professed to be the continuation of the Byzantine Empire, had collapsed. The Tsardom had been showing signs of profound rottenness for some years before the war. The court was under the sway of a fantastic religious impostor, Rasputin, and the public administration, civil and military, was in a state of extreme inefficiency and corruption. At the outset of the war, there was a great flare of patriotic enthusiasm in Russia. A vast conscript army was called up for which there was neither adequate military equipment nor a proper supply of competent officers, and this great host, ill-supplied and badly handled, was hurled against the German and Austrian frontiers. There can be no doubt that the early appearance of Russian armies in East Prussia in September 1914 diverted the energies and attention of the Germans from their first victorious drive upon Paris. The sufferings and deaths of scores of thousands of ill-led Russian peasants saved France from complete overthrow in that momentous opening campaign, and made all Western Europe the debtors of that great and tragic people. But the strain of the war upon this sprawling, ill-organized empire was too heavy for its strength. The Russian common soldiers were sent into battle without guns to support them, without even rifle ammunition. They were wasted by their officers and generals in a delirium of militarist enthusiasm. For a time they seemed to be suffering mutely as the beasts suffer, but there is a limit to the endurance even of the most ignorant. A profound disgust for Tsardom was creeping through these armies of betrayed and wasted men. From the close of 1915 onward, Russia was a source of deepening anxiety to her Western allies. Throughout 1916, she remained largely on the defensive, and there were rumors of a separate peace with Germany. 
On December 29, 1916, the monk Rasputin was murdered at a dinner party in Petrograd, and a belated attempt was made to put the Tsardom in order. By March, things were moving rapidly. Food riots in Petrograd developed into a revolutionary insurrection. There was an attempted suppression of the Duma, the representative body. There were attempted arrests of liberal leaders, the formation of a provisional government under Prince Lvov, and an abdication, March 15th, by the Tsar. For a time it seemed that a moderate and controlled revolution might be possible, perhaps under a new Tsar. Then it became evident that the destruction of popular confidence in Russia had gone too far for any such adjustments. The Russian people were sick to death of the old order of things in Europe, of Tsars and wars and of great powers. It wanted relief, and that speedily, from unendurable miseries. The Allies had no understanding of Russian realities. Their diplomatists were ignorant of Russian, genteel persons, with their attention directed to the Russian court, rather than to Russia. They blundered steadily with the new situation. There was little goodwill among these diplomatists for republicanism, and a manifest disposition to embarrass the new government as much as possible. At the head of the Russian Republican government was an eloquent and picturesque leader, Kerensky, who found himself assailed by the forces of a profounder revolutionary movement, the Social Revolution, at home, and cold-shouldered by the Allied governments abroad. His allies would neither let him give the Russian peasants the land for which they craved, nor peace beyond their frontiers. The French and the British press pestered their exhausted ally for a fresh offensive, but when presently the Germans made a strong attack by sea and land upon Riga, the British Admiralty quailed before the prospect of a Baltic expedition in relief. The new Russian Republic had to fight unsupported. In spite of their naval predominance and the bitter protests of the great English admiral, Lord Fisher, 1841-1920, to it is to be noted that the British and their allies, except for some submarine attacks, left the Germans the complete mastery of the Baltic through all the war. The Russian masses, however, were resolute to end the war, at any cost. There had come into existence in Petrograd a body representing the workers and common soldiers, the Soviet, and this body clamored for an international conference of socialists at Stockholm. Food riots were occurring in Berlin at this time, war weariness in Austria and Germany was profound, and there can be little doubt, in the light of subsequent events, that such a conference would have precipitated a reasonable peace on democratic lines in 1917 and a German revolution. Kerensky implored his Western allies to allow this conference to take place, but, fearful of a worldwide outbreak of socialism and republicanism, they refused, in spite of the favorable response by a small majority of the British Labour Party. Without either moral or physical help from the allies, the unhappy, moderate Russian Republic still fought on and made a last, desperate offensive effort in July. It failed after some preliminary successes, and there came another great slaughtering of Russians. The limit of Russian endurance was reached. Mutinies broke out in the Russian armies, and particularly upon the northern front. And on November 7, 1917, Kerensky's government was overthrown, and power was seized by the Soviets, dominated by the Bolshevik socialists under Lenin, and pledged to make peace, regardless of the Western powers. On March 2, 1918, a separate peace between Russia and Germany was signed at Brest-Litovsk. It speedily became evident that these Bolshevik socialists were men of a very different quality from the rhetorical constitutionalists and revolutionaries of the Kerensky phase. They were fanatical Marxist communists. They believed that their accession to power in Russia was only the opening of a worldwide social revolution, and they set about changing the social and economic order with the thoroughness of perfect faith and absolute inexperience. The Western European and the American governments were themselves 
much too ill-informed and incapable to guide or help this extraordinary experiment, and the press set itself to discredit and the ruling classes to wreck these usurpers upon any terms and at any cost to themselves or to Russia. A propaganda of abominable and disgusting inventions went on unchecked in the press of the world. The Bolshevik leaders were represented as incredible monsters, glutted with blood and plunder and living lives of sensuality, before which the realities of the Tsarist court during the Rasputin regime paled to a white purity. Expeditions were launched at the exhausted country. Insurgents and raiders were encouraged, armed and subsidized, and no method of attack was too mean or too monstrous for the frightened enemies of the Bolshevik regime. In 1919, the Russian Bolsheviks, ruling a country already exhausted and disorganized by five years of intensive warfare, were fighting a British expedition at Archangel. Japanese invaders in eastern Siberia Romanians with French and Greek contingents in the south, the Russian Admiral Kolchak in Siberia, and General Deniken, supported by the French fleet in the Crimea. In July of that year, an Estonian army, under General Udenich, almost got to Petersburg. In 1920, the Poles, incited by the French, made a new attack on Russia, and a new reactionary raider, General Wrongler, took over the task of General Deniken, in invading and devastating his own country. In March 1921, the sailors at Kronstadt revolted. The Russian government under its president, Lenin, survived all these various attacks. It showed an amazing tenacity, and the common people of Russia sustained it unswervingly under conditions of extreme hardship. By the end of 1921, both Britain and Italy had made a sort of recognition of the communist rule. But if the Bolshevik government was successful in its struggle against foreign intervention and internal revolt, it was far less happy in its attempts to set up a new social order based upon communist ideas in Russia. The Russian peasant is a small, land-hungry proprietor, as far from communism in his thoughts and methods as a whale is from flying. The revolution gave him the land of the great landowners, but could not make him grow food for anything but negotiable money. And the revolution, among other things, had practically destroyed the value of money. Agricultural production, already greatly disordered by the collapse of the railways through war strain, shrank to a mere cultivation of food by the peasants for their own consumption. The towns starved. Hasty and ill-planned attempts to make over industrial production in accordance with communist ideas, were equally unsuccessful. By 1920, Russia presented the unprecedented spectacle of a modern civilization in complete collapse. Railways were rusting and passing out of use. Towns were falling into ruin. Everywhere there was an immense mortality. Yet the country still fought with its enemies at its gates. In 1921 came a drought and a great famine, among the peasant cultivators in the war-devastated southeast provinces, millions of people starved. But the question of the distresses and the possible recuperation of Russia brings us too close to current controversies to be discussed here. End of chapter 66。Chapter 67 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 67. The Political and Social Reconstruction of the World The scheme and scale upon which this history is planned do not permit us to enter into the complicated and acronymous disputes that center about the treaties, and particularly of the Treaty of Versailles, which concluded the Great War. We are beginning to realize that that conflict terrible and enormous as it was, ended nothing, began nothing, and settled nothing. It killed millions of people, it wasted and impoverished the world, it smashed Russia altogether. It was at best an acute and frightful reminder that we were living foolishly and confusedly without much plan or foresight 
in a dangerous and unsympathetic universe. The crudely organized egoisms and passions of national and imperial greed that carried mankind into that tragedy emerged from it sufficiently unimpaired to make some other similar disaster highly probable so soon as the world has a little recovered from its war exhaustion and fatigue. Wars and revolutions make nothing. Their utmost service to mankind is that, in a very rough and painful way, they destroy superannuated and obstructive things. The Great War lifted the threat of German imperialism from Europe and shattered the imperialism of Russia. It cleared away a number of monarchies, but a multitude of flags still waves in Europe, the frontiers still exasperate, great armies accumulate fresh stores of equipment. The peace conference at Versailles was a gathering very ill adapted to do more than carry out the conflicts and defeats of the war to their logical conclusions. The Germans, Austrians, Turks and Bulgarians were permitted no share in its deliberations, they were only to accept the decisions it dictated to them. From the point of view of human welfare, the choice of the place of meeting was particularly unfortunate. It was at Versailles in 1871 that, with every circumstance of triumphant vulgarity, the new German Empire had been proclaimed. The suggestion of a melodramatic reversal of that scene in the same Hall of Mirrors was overpowering. Whatever generosities had appeared in the opening phases of the Great War had long been exhausted. The populations of the victorious countries were acutely aware of their own losses and sufferings, and entirely regardless of the fact that the defeated had paid in the like manner. The war had arisen as a natural and inevitable consequence of the competitive nationalisms of Europe, and the absence of any federal adjustment of these competitive forces. War is the necessary logical consummation of independent sovereign nationalities living in too small an area with too powerful an armament. And if the Great War had not come in the form it did, it would have come in some similar form, just as it will certainly return upon a still more disastrous scale in twenty or thirty years' time, if no political unification anticipates and prevents it. States organized for war will make wars as surely as hens will lay eggs, but the feeling of these distressed and war-worn countries disregarded this fact, and the whole of the defeated peoples were treated as morally and materially responsible for all the damage, as they would no doubt have treated the victor peoples had the issue of war been different. The French and English thought the Germans were to blame, the Germans thought the Russians, French and English were to blame, and only an intelligent minority thought that there was anything to blame in the fragmentary political constitution of Europe. The Treaty of Versailles was intended to be exemplary and vindictive. It provided tremendous penalties for the vanquished, it sought to provide compensations for the wounded and suffering victors by imposing enormous debts upon nations already bankrupt, and its attempts to reconstitute international relations by the establishment of a League of Nations against war were manifestly insincere and inadequate. So far as Europe was concerned, it is doubtful if there would have been any attempt whatever to organize international relations for a permanent peace. The proposal of the League of Nations was brought into practical politics by the President of the United States of America, President Wilson. Its chief support was in America. So far, the United States, this new modern state, had developed no distinctive ideas of international relationship beyond the Monroe Doctrine, which protected the New World from European interference. Now suddenly, it was called upon for its mental contribution to the vast problem of the time. It had none. The natural disposition of the American people was towards a permanent world peace. With this, however, was linked a strong traditional distrust of old world polities, 
and a habit of isolation from old world entanglements. The Americans had hardly begun to think out an American solution of world problems when the submarine campaign of the Germans dragged them into the war on the side of the anti-German allies. President Wilson's scheme of a League of Nations was an attempt, at short notice, to create a distinctively American world project. It was a sketchy, inadequate, and dangerous scheme. In Europe, however, it was taken as a matured American point of view. The generality of mankind in 1918-19 was intensely weary of war and anxious at almost any sacrifice to erect barriers against its recurrence. But there was not a single government in the old world willing to waive one iota of its sovereign independence to attain any such end. The public utterances of President Wilson, leading up to the project of a World League of Nations, seemed for a time to appeal, right over the heads of the governments, to the peoples of the world. They were taken as expressing the ripe intentions of America, and the response was enormous. Unhappily, President Wilson had to deal with governments and not with peoples. He was a man capable of tremendous flashes of vision, and yet, when put to the test egoistical and limited, and the great wave of enthusiasm he evoked, passed and was wasted. Says Dr. Dillon in his book, The Peace Conference, Europe, when the President touched its shores, was as clay ready for the creative potter. Never before were the nations so eager to follow a Moses who would take them to the long-promised land, where wars are prohibited and blockades unknown. And to their thinking he was just that great leader. In France men bowed down before him with awe and affection. Labor leaders in Paris told me that they shed tears of joy in his presence, and that their comrades would go through fire and water to help him to realize his noble schemes. To the working classes in Italy his name was a heavenly clarion at the sound of which the earth would be renewed. The Germans regarded him and his doctrine as their sheet anchor of safety. The fearless Herr Mullen said, If President Wilson were to address the Germans and pronounce a severe sentence upon them, they would accept it with resignation and without a murmur and set to work at once. In German Austria his fame was that of a savior, and the mere mention of his name brought balm to the suffering and surcease of sorrow to the afflicted. Such were the overpowering expectations that President Wilson raised. How completely he disappointed them, and how weak and futile was the League of Nations he made, is too long and too distressful a story to tell here. He exaggerated in his person our common human tragedy. He was so very great in his dreams and so incapable of in his performance. America dissented from the acts of its president and would not join the League Europe accepted from him. There was a slow realization on the part of the American people that it had been rushed into something for which it was totally unprepared. There was a corresponding realization on the part of Europe that America had nothing ready to give to the old world in its extremity. Born prematurely and crippled at its birth, the League has become indeed, with its elaborate and unpractical constitution and its manifest limitations of power, a serious obstacle in the way of any effective reorganization of international relationships. The problem would be a clearer one if the League did not yet exist. Yet that worldwide blaze of enthusiasm that first welcomed the project, that readiness of men everywhere, round and about the earth, of men, that is, as distinguished from governments, for a world control of war, is a thing to be recorded with emphasis in any history. Behind the short-sighted governments that divide and mismanage human affairs, a real force for world unity and world order exists and grows. From 1918 onward, the world entered upon an age of conferences, of these, the conference at Washington called by President Harding, 1921, has been the most successful and suggestive. 
Notable, too, is the Genoa Conference, 1922, for the appearance of German and Russian delegates at its deliberations. We will not discuss this long procession of conferences and tentatives in any detail. It becomes more and more clearly manifest that the huge work of reconstruction has to be done by mankind, if a crescendo of such convulsions and world massacres as that of the Great War is to be averted. No such hasty improvisation as the League of Nations, no patched-up system of conferences between this group of states and that, which change nothing, with an air of settled everything, will meet the complex political needs of the new age that lies before us. A systematic development and a systematic application of the sciences of human relationship, of personal and group psychology, of financial and economic science and of education, sciences still only in their infancy, is required. Narrow and obsolete, dead and dying moral and political ideas have to be replaced by a clearer and a simpler conception of the common origins and destinies of our kind. But if the dangers, confusions, and disasters that crowd upon man in these days are enormous beyond any experience of the past, it is because science has brought him such powers as he never had before. And the scientific method of fearless thought, exhaustively lucid statement, and exhaustively criticized planning, which has given him these as yet uncontrollable powers, gives him also the hope of controlling these powers. Man is still only adolescent. His troubles are not the troubles of senility and exhaustion, but of increasing and still undisciplined strength. When we look at all history as one process, as we have been doing in this book, when we see the steadfast upward struggle of life towards vision and control, then we see, in their true proportions, the hopes and dangers of the present time. As yet we are hardly in the earliest dawn of human greatness. But in the beauty of flower and sunset, in the happy and perfect moments of young animals, and in the delight of ten thousand various landscapes, we have some intimations of what life can do for us. And in some few works of plastic and pictorial art, in some great music, in a few noble buildings and happy gardens, we have an intimation of what the human will can do with material possibilities. We have dreams. We have at present undisciplined but ever-increasing power. Can we doubt that presently our race will more than realize our boldest imaginations, that it will achieve unity and peace, that it will live, the children of our blood and lives will live, in a world made more splendid, and lovely than any palace or garden that we know, going on from strength to strength in an ever-widening circle of adventure and achievement. What man has done, the little triumphs of his present state, and all this history we have told, form but the prelude to the things that man has got to do. End of chapter 67《シャプター68》シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68シャプター68アトトメス III、アメノフィス III、アンレムセス II、were three or four centuries away. Weak monarchs of the 21st dynasty were ruling in the Nile Valley. Israel was united under her early kings. Saul or David or possibly even Solomon may have been reigning. Sargon I, 2750 BC, of the Akkadian Shumerian Empire. Was a remote memory in Babylonian history, more remote than is Constantine the Great from the world of the present day. Hammurabi had been dead a thousand years. The Assyrians were already dominating the less military Babylonians. In 1100 BC, Tiglas Pileser, 
the first had taken Babylon, but there was no permanent conquest. Assyria and Babylonia were still separate empires. In China, the new Chou dynasty was flourishing. Stonehenge in England was already some hundreds of years old. The next two centuries saw a renaissance of Egypt under the 22nd dynasty, the splitting up of the brief little Hebrew kingdom of Solomon, the spreading of the Greeks in the Balkans, South Italy and Asia Minor, and the days of Etruscan predominance in Central Italy. We begin our list of ascertainable dates with B.C. 800, the building of Carthage, 790, the Ethiopian conquest of Egypt, founding of the 25th dynasty, 776, First Olympiad, 753, Rome, built, 745, Tiglath-Pileser III, conquered Babylonia and founded the new Assyrian Empire, 722, Sargon II armed the Assyrians with iron weapons, 721, he deported the Israelites, 680, Esarhaddon took Thebes in Egypt, overthrowing the Ethiopian 25th dynasty. 664. Psammeticus I restored the freedom of Egypt and founded the 26th dynasty. 610. 608. Necho of Egypt defeated Josiah, king of Judah, at the Battle of Megiddo. 606. Capture of Nineveh by the Chaldeans and Medes foundation of the Chaldean Empire. 604. Nico pushed to the Euphrates and was overthrown by Nebuchadnezzar II. Nebuchadnezzar carried off the Jews to Babylon. 550. Kyrus the Persian succeeded Kixares the Mede. Kyrus conquered Croesus. Buddha lived about this time. So also did Confucius and Lao Tse. 539. Kyrus took Babylon and founded the Persian Empire. 521. Darius I, the son of Histaspes, ruled from the Hellespont to the Indus, his expedition to Scythia. 490. Battle of Marathon. 480. Battles of Thermopylae and Salamis. 479. The battles of Plataea and Mycale completed the repulse of Persia. 474. Etruscan fleet destroyed by the Sicilian Greeks. 431. Peloponnesian War began to 404. 401. Retreat of the Ten Thousand. 359. Philip became King of Macedonia. 338. Battle of Chironia. 336. Macedonian troops crossed into Asia. Philip murdered. 334. Battle of the Granicus. 333. Battle of Issus. 331. Battle of Arbela. 330. Darius III killed. 323. Death of Alexander the Great. 321. Rise of Chandragupta in the Punjab. The Romans completely beaten by the Samnites at the Battle of Codine Forks. 281. Pyrrhus invaded Italy. 280. Battle of Heraclea. 279. Battle of Osculum. 278. Gauls raided into Asia Minor and settled in Galatia. 275. Pyrrhus left Italy. 264. First Punic War. Ashoka began to reign in Behar to 227. 260. Battle of Muli. 256. Battle of Echnomus. 246. Shi Huang Ti became king of Tsin. 220. Shi Huang Ti became emperor of China. 214. Great Wall of China began. 210. Death of Shi Huang Ti. 202. Battle of Zama. 146. Carthage destroyed. 133. Attilus bequeathed Pergamum to Rome. 102. Marius drove back Germans. 
100, Triumph of Marius, Chinese conquering the Tarim Valley. 89. All Italians become Roman citizens. 73. The revolt of the slaves under Spartacus. 71. Defeat and end of Spartacus. 66. Pompey led Roman troops to the Caspian and Euphrates. He encountered the Alani. 48. Julius Caesar defeated Pompey at Pharsalos. 44. Julius Caesar assassinated. 27. Augustus Caesar princeps until 14 AD. 4. True date of birth of Jesus of Nazareth. AD. Christian era began. 14. Augustus died, Tiberius emperor. 30. Jesus of Nazareth crucified. 41. Claudius, the first emperor of the legions, made emperor by Praetorian guard after murder of Caligula. 68. Suicide of Nero, Galba, Otto, Vitellus, emperors in succession. 69. Vespasian. 102. Panchao on the Caspian Sea. 117. Hadrian succeeded Trajan, Roman Empire as its greatest extent. 138. The Indo-Scythians at this time were destroying the last traces of Hellenic rule in India. 161. Marcus Aurelius succeeded Antonimus Pius. 164. Great plague began and lasted to the death of M. Aurelius. 180. This also devastated all Asia. Nearly a century of war and disorder began in the Roman Empire. 220. End of the Han Dynasty, beginning of 400 years of division in China. 227. Ardashir I, first Sassanid Shah, put an end to Arksakaid line in Persia. 242. Mani began his teaching. 247. Goth crossed Danube in a great raid. 251. Great victory of Goth, Emperor Decius killed. 260. Sapor I, the second Sassanid Shah, took Antioch, captured the Emperor Valerian, and was cut up on his return from Asia Minor by Odenasus of Palmyra. 277. Mani crucified in Persia. 284. Diocletian became emperor. 303. Diocletian persecuted the Christians. 311. Galerius abandoned the persecution of the Christians. 312. Constantine the Great became emperor. 323. Constantine presided over the Council of Nicaea. 337. Constantine baptized on his deathbed. 361 to 63. Julian the Apostate attempted to substitute Mithraism for Christianity. 392. Theodosius the Great, Emperor of East and West. 395. Theodosius the Great died. Honorius and Arcadius redivided the empire with Stilico and Alaric as their masters and protectors. 410. The Visigoths under Alaric captured Rome. 425. Vandals settling in south of Spain, Huns in Pannonia, Goths in Dalmatia, Visigoths and Suevi in Portugal and North Spain, English invading Britain. 439. Vandals took Carthage. 451. Attila raided Gaul and was defeated by Franks, Alemanni and Romans at Troyes. 453. Death of Attila. 455. Vandals sacked Rome. 470. Odoacer, king of a medley of Teutonic tribes, informed Constantinople that there was no emperor in the West. End of the Western Empire. 493. Theodoric the Ostrogoth conquered Italy and became king of Italy, but was nominally subject to Constantinople. Gothic kings in Italy, Goths settled on special confiscated lands as a garrison. 527. Justinian Emperor. 529. Justinian closed the schools at Athens, which had flourished nearly a thousand years. Belisarius, 
Justinian's general took Naples. 531. the I began to reign. 543. Great plague in Constantinople. 553. Goth expelled from Italy by Justinian. Justinian died. The Lombards conquered most of North Italy, leaving Ravenna and Rome Byzantine. 570. Muhammad born. 579. Kosros I died. The Lombards dominant in Italy. 590. Plague raged in Rome. Kosros II began to reign. 610. Heraclius began to reign. 619. Kosros II held Egypt, Jerusalem, Damascus, and armies on Hellespont. Tang dynasty began in China. 622. The Hegira. 627. Great Persian defeat at Nineveh by Heraclius. Taizung became emperor of China. 628. Kavad II murdered and succeeded his father Crossroes II. Muhammad wrote letters to all the rulers of the earth. 629. Muhammad returned to Mecca. 632. Muhammad died, Abu Bakr Caliph. 634. Battle of the Yarmouk, Muslims took Syria, Omar, second caliph. 635. Taizung received Nestorian missionaries. 637. Battle of Cadicia. 638. Jerusalem surrendered to the caliph Omar. 642. Heraclius died. 643. Ottoman, third caliph. 655. Defeat of the Byzantine fleet by the Muslims. 668. The Caliph Moavia attacked Constantinople by sea. 687. Pepin of Herstal, mayor of the palace, reunited Austrasia and Neustria. 711. Muslim army invaded Spain from Africa. 715. The domains of the Caliph Valid I extended from the Pyrenees to China. 717 to 718. Suleiman, son and successor of Valid, failed to take Constantinople. 732. Charles Martel defeated the Muslims near Poitiers. 751. Pepin crowned king of the French. 768. Pepin died. 771. Charlemagne, sole king. 774. Charlemagne conquered Lombardy. 786. Harun al-Rashid, Abbasid, Caliph in Baghdad, to 809. 795. Leo III became Pope, to 816. 800. Leo crowned Charlemagne, Emperor of the West. 802. Egbert, formerly an English refugee at the court of Charlemagne, established himself as King of Wessex. 810. Kram of Bulgaria defeated and killed the Emperor Nicephorus. 814. Charlemagne died. 828. Egbert became first King of England. 843. Louis the Pious died, and the Carlovingian Empire went to pieces. Until 962, there was no regular succession of Holy Roman Emperors, though the title appeared intermittently. 850. About this time, Rurik, a Northman, became ruler of Novgorod and Kiev. 852. Boris I, Christian king of Bulgaria, to 884. 865. The fleet of the Russians, Northmen, threatened Constantinople. 904. Russian, Northmen fleet off Constantinople. 912. Rolf the Ganger established himself in Normandy. 919. Henry the Fowler elected King of Germany. 936. Otto I became King of Germany in succession to his father, Henry the Fowler. 941. Russian fleet again threatened Constantinople. 962. Otto I, King of Germany, crowned Emperor, first Saxon Emperor by John the Twelves. 
987, Hugh Capet became King of France, end of the Carlovingian line of French kings. 1016, Canute became King of England, Denmark and Norway. 1043, Russian fleet threatened Constantinople. 1066, Conquest of England by William, Duke of Normandy. 1071, Revival of Islam under the Seljuk Turks, Battle of Melisgird. 1073, Hildebrand became Pope, Gregory VII, to 1085. 1084, Robert Giscard, the Norman, sacked Rome. 1087 to 99, Urban II, Pope. 1095, Urban II at Clermont summoned the First Crusade. 1096, Massacre of the People's Crusade. 1099, Godfrey of Bouillon captured Jerusalem. 1147, the Second Crusade. 1169, Saladin, Sultan of Egypt. 1176, Frederick Barbarossa acknowledged supremacy of the Pope, Alexander III, at Venice. 1187, Saladin captured Jerusalem. 1189, the Third Crusade. 1198, Innocent III, Pope, to 1216. Frederick II, aged four, King of Sicily, became his ward. 1202, the Fourth Crusade attacked the Eastern Empire. 1204, capture of Constantinople by the Latins. 1214, Chengiz Khan took Pekin. 1226, St. Francis of Assisi died, the Franciscans. 1227, Chengiz Khan died. Khan from the Caspian to the Pacific, and was succeeded by Ogdai Khan. 1228. Frederick II embarked upon the Sixth Crusade and acquired Jerusalem. 1240. Mongols destroyed Kiev, Russia tributary to the Mongols. 1241. Mongol victory in Leignitz in Silesia. 1250. Frederick II, the last Hohenstaufen emperor, died, German interregnum until 1273. 1251. Mangu Khan became Great Khan, Kublai Khan governor of China. 1258. Hulagu Khan took and destroyed Baghdad. 1260. Kublai Khan became Great Khan. 1261. The Greeks recaptured Constantinople from the Latins. 1273. Rudolf of Habsburg elected emperor. The Swiss formed their everlasting league. 1280. Kublai Khan founded the Yuan dynasty in China. 1292. Death of Kublai Khan. 1293. Roger Bacon, the prophet of experimental science, died. 1348. The Great Plague, the Black Death. 1360. In China, the Mongol Yuan dynasty fell and was succeeded by the Ming dynasty to 1644. 1377, Pope Gregory XI returned to Rome. 1378, the Great Schism, Urban VI in Rome, Clement VII at Avignon. 1398, Hus preached Wycliffism at Prague. 1414-1418, the Council of Constance, Hus burnt, 1415. 1417, the Great Schism ended. 1453, Ottoman Turks under Muhammad II took Constantinople. 1480, Ivan III, Grand Duke of Moscow, threw off the Mongol allegiance. 1481, death of the Sultan Muhammad II while preparing for the conquest of Italy. 1486, Diaz rounded the Cape of Good Hope. 1492. Columbus crossed the Atlantic to America. 1498. Maximilian I became emperor. 1498. Vasco da Gama sailed round the Cape to India. 1499. Switzerland became an independent republic. 1500. Charles V born. 1509. Henry VIII's King of England. 1513, Leo X, Pope. 1515, Francis I, King of France. 1520, 
Suleiman the Magnificent, Sultan, to 1566, who ruled from Baghdad to Hungary, Charles V's Emperor. 1525. Babur won the Battle of Panipat, captured Delhi, and founded the Mogul Empire. 1527. The German troops in Italy, under the Constable of Bourbon, took and pillaged Rome. 1529. Suleiman besieged Vienna. 1530. Charles V crowned by the Pope. Henry VIII began his quarrel with the papacy. 1539. The Society of Jesus founded. 1546. Martin Luther died. 1547. Ivan IV, the Terrible, took the title of Tsar of Russia. 1556. Charles V abdicated. Akbar, Great Mogul, to 1605. Ignatius of Loyola died. 1558. Death of Charles V. 1566. Suleiman the Magnificent died. 1603. James I, King of England and Scotland. 1620. Mayflower Expedition founded New Plymouth. First Negro slaves landed at Jamestown. 1625. Charles I of England. 1626. Sir Francis Bacon, Lord Verulam, died. 1643. Louis XIV began his reign of 72 years. 1644. The Manchus ended the Ming dynasty. 1648. Treaty of Westphalia. Thereby Holland and Switzerland were recognized as free republics, and Prussia became important. The treaty gave a complete victory neither to the imperial crown nor to the princes. War of the Fronde. It ended in the complete victory of the French crown. 1649. Execution of Charles I of England. 1658. Aurungzeb Great Mogul, Cromwell died. 1660. Charles II of England. 1674. Nuve Amsterdam finally became British by treaty and was renamed New York. 1683. The last Turkish attack on Vienna, defeated by John III of Poland. 1689. Peter the Great of Russia to 1725. 1701. Frederick I, first king of Prussia. 1707. Death of Aurangzeb, the empire of the Great Mogul disintegrated. 1713. Frederick the Great of Prussia born. 1715. Louis XV of France. 1755 to 63. Britain and France struggled for America and India. France in alliance with Austria and Russia against Prussia and Britain, 1756 to 63, the Seven Years' War. 1759, the British General Wolfe took Quebec. 1760, George III of Britain. 1763, Peace of Paris, Canada ceded to Britain, British dominant in India. 1769, Napoleon Bonaparte born. 1774, Louis XVI began his reign. 1776, Declaration of Independence by the United States of America. 1783, Treaty of Peace between Britain and the new United States of America. 1787, The Constitutional Convention of Philadelphia set up the federal government of the United States. France discovered to be bankrupt. 1788, First Federal Congress of the United States at New York. 1789. The French States General assembled, storming of the Bastille. 1791. Flight to Varennes. 1792. France declared war on Austria. Prussia declared war on France. Battle of Valmy. France became a republic. 1793. Louis XVI beheaded. 1794. Execution of Robespierre and end of the Jacobin Republic. 1795. The Directory. Bonaparte suppressed the revolt and went to Italy as commander-in-chief. 1798. Bonaparte went to Egypt, Battle of the Nile. 1799. Bonaparte returned to France. He became first consul with enormous powers. 1804. Bonaparte became emperor. 
Francis II took the title of Emperor of Austria in 1805, and in 1806 he dropped the title of Holy Roman Emperor. So the Holy Roman Empire came to an end. 1806. Prussia overthrown at Jena. 1808. Napoleon made his brother Joseph King of Spain. 1810. Spanish America became Republican. 1812. Napoleon's retreat from Moscow. 1814. Abdication of Napoleon, Louis XVIII. 1824. Charles X of France. 1825. Nicholas I of Russia. First railway stocked onto Darlington. 1827. Battle of Navarino. 1829. Greece independent. 1830. A year of disturbance. Louis Philippe ousted Charles X. Belgium broke away from Holland. Leopold of Saxe Coburg Gotha became king of this new country, Belgium. Russian Poland revolted ineffectually. 1835. The word socialism first used. 1839. Queen Victoria. 1840. Queen Victoria married Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg Gotha. 1852. Napoleon III, Emperor of the French. 1854 to 56. Crimean War. 1856. Alexander II of Russia. 1861. Victor Emmanuel, first King of Italy. Abraham Lincoln became President, USA. The American Civil War began. 1865. Surrender of Appomattox Courthouse. Japan opened to the world. 1870. Napoleon III declared war against Prussia. 1871. Paris surrendered in January. The King of Prussia became German Emperor. The Peace of Frankfurt. 1878. The Treaty of Berlin. The armed peace of 46 years began in Western Europe. 1888. Frederick II, March, William II, June, German Emperors. 1912. China became a republic. 1914. The Great War in Europe began. 1917. The two Russian revolutions, establishment of the Bolshevik regime in Russia. 1918. The Armistice. 1920. First meeting of the League of Nations, from which Germany, Austria, Russia, and Turkey were excluded, and at which the United States was not represented. 1921. The Greeks, in complete disregard of the League of Nations, make war upon the Turks. 1922. Great defeat of the Greeks in Asia Minor by the Turks. End of chronological table. This is also the end of of the book A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells. This book was read to you by Christina in Riga, Latvia, April 2020. Thank you for listening.